No Ordinary Joes, the extraordinary true story of four submariners in war and love and life, by Larry Colton, narrated by Robert Fass, copyright 2010 by Larry Colton. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Crown Publishers, an imprint of the Crown Publishing Group, a division of Random House Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2010 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. Any man who may be asked what he did to make his life worthwhile can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction, I served in the U.S. Navy. President John F. Kennedy I saw the submariners, the way they stood aloof and silent, watching their pig boat with loving eyes, they are alone in the Navy. I admired the PT boys, and I often wondered how the aviators had the courage to go out every day, and I forgave their boasting. But the submariners, in the entire fleet, they stand apart. James Missioner, Tales of the South Pacific Commander, Submarine Force, United States Pacific Fleet 30th June, 1944 my dear Mrs. Palmer, the Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet has the honor to award the submarine combat insignia and to commend in absentia Robert Wiley Palmer, Yeoman First Class, for service set forth in the following. Citation. The USS Grenadier on an offensive war patrol in restricted waters, heavily patrolled by the enemy, failed to return as scheduled. It is not known how many successful attacks the Grenadier made on this patrol, but as she has had a splendid record since the early days of the war, it is believed that she was engaged in delivering the same relentless attacks against the enemy up until the time she was reported missing. As Yeoman First Class of the USS Grenadier, Robert Wiley Palmer's performance of duty materially contributed to the success of this vessel against the enemy, the Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet forwards this commendation in recognition of his splendid performance of duty, which was in keeping with the highest traditions of the Naval Service. Please accept my deepest sympathy in your great loss, which I assure you I also consider a great loss to the Naval Service. Most sincerely, C. A. Lockwood, Jr., Vice Admiral, U.S. Navy. Prologue. The waters felt unsafe to Bob Palmer. Too shallow, too close to land, too risky given the ship's unreliable torpedoes. But who was he, a twenty-one-year-old, to question the strategy of his submarine captain, a graduate of the Naval Academy and respected by every man on the ship? Palmer worked hard as the sub's yeoman, but he was a high school dropout, and he wasn't privy to the radio messages the captain received. It was early evening, April 20th, 1943, and the USS Grenadier was nearing the end of its sixth war patrol. Bob longed to get back to port in Fremantle, Australia. He was tired of the confinement, the foul smell of diesel fuel, and the constant stress of running deep in enemy waters. Back in Fremantle, there'd be large pints of emu ale waiting in the bar at the Ocean Beach Hotel as well as beautiful young Aussie women enamored of American sailors. Yes, he was recently married to his high school sweetheart and loved her dearly. But this was war, a war on the other side of the world, and every time he and his crewmates left port, there was the real possibility they'd be blown to bits. As the Grenadier ran full speed on the surface through the Java Sea and the narrow Strait of Malacca between Malaysia and Sumatra, the lookout spotted two worthy targets, a pair of large Japanese freighters silhouetted on the horizon. The sea was calm, the sky bright from a full moon. Surprisingly, the vessels appeared to be unescorted, an opportunity almost too good to be true. The Japanese had recently taken Rangoon, and the Japanese ships plying the important supply route between Burma and Singapore were usually well guarded, but not these two. The Grenadier's captain, Missouri-born James Fitzgerald, a ballsy former boxing champ at Annapolis, 
was eager to confront the enemy, and he had decided to ignore warnings that these waters were much too easily guarded by Japanese planes from nearby bases for his ship to be running on the surface. A month earlier, a sub had been sunk, taking 65 men down with it. But Fitzgerald wanted a kill before heading back to port. At this point in the war, with the Japanese racking up victory after victory in the Pacific, American naval forces were desperate for any small victory. Fitzgerald was one of a new breed of captain who had been hurried into battle. The top level of Navy leadership was now encouraging these newer graduates of the Naval Academy to go in harm's way and take the war to the enemy. His approach was more aggressive than that of the older and more conservative subcommanders in charge at the start of the war, who believed the purpose of submarines was to scout for the Navy's surface fleet rather than to attack. From long range and on the surface, Fitzgerald considered firing torpedoes, but at this stage of the war the available torpedoes were notoriously ineffective, either running too deep or failing to explode on contact. Instead, he closed to 2,500 yards. The freighters discovered the ship's presence, possibly by radar, and turned searchlights in its direction. Fitzgerald ordered the men manning the three-inch deck gun to commence firing. Immediately, the two freighters returned fire, neither side scoring a hit. Author's Note In researching this event, I found numerous conflicting reports of exactly what happened regarding the firing of torpedoes. In the end, I relied on Captain Fitzgerald's write-up. Knowing the grenadier had been spotted, Fitzgerald quickly turned direction, electing to make a surface end around, which would put the sub in front of the enemy in position to submerge and attack. But while the grenadier moved twice as fast on the surface than it did when submerged, it would take the grenadier all night, twelve hours, to accomplish this maneuver. The crew, eight officers and sixty-eight enlisted men, stood down from their battle stations. Bob sat down at a table to write a letter to his wife, Barbara. He would post the letter as soon as the ship returned to Fremantle. Barbara was living in San Francisco, where they had gotten married a week after Pearl Harbor, six days before he'd shipped off to war. She'd gotten pregnant during those six days, but the excitement he'd felt when he'd gotten the news was soon offset by sadness when she lost the baby. He still had a year to go on his duty. Seated at the table with Palmer were three other men just as anxious to get back to port. Tim McCoy from Dallas, Texas, Chuck Vervalen from Dundee, New York, and Gordy Cox from Yakima, Washington. Tim and Chuck had met the women they thought were the loves of their young lives on their last leave in Fremantle, and both talked of marrying these young Aussies and taking them back to America after the war. Tim's girl was the reigning Miss Perth. Gordy, the fourth man at the table, had also met a girl, but he was the shy type and wasn't sure she liked him as much. Still, he hoped. He'd even written his mom about her. He'd never had a girlfriend growing up. As the grenadier made its long circle, Tim and Gordy had time to talk. The two sailors, neither yet twenty-one, were total opposites. Tim was extroverted, cocky, and full of Texas bravado. Gordy was slightly built, quiet, and not confident in his ability to learn the complex set of submarine skills necessary to advance beyond his rank of seaman first class. Despite the close confines of the sub and their shared experience in battle, which included being scared shitless, they barely knew each other. Gordy's initial impression was that Tim was a little too full of himself. Chuck got up from the table and walked to his bunk, where he pulled a picture of Gwen, his nineteen-year-old girlfriend, out from under his pillow. He'd met her strolling through an arcade in Perth a few months earlier. Two nights before the grenadier had shipped out on this mission, Gwen had given him a St. Christopher's medal for good luck and protection. He'd promised he'd never take it off. She promised she'd wait for him. During their last night together, he confessed that he had an uneasy feeling about this patrol, much more than before the other four he'd been on. She asked why. Because for the first time in my life, I have somebody I really care about, he answered. Throughout the night, the grenadier sped along the ocean's surface at its top speed, eighteen knots. Just before daylight, it neared its attack position. 
As it closed on its targets, Fitzgerald ordered it to submerge and for everyone to man their battle stations. But the freighters had unexpectedly changed direction, and Fitzgerald watched through his periscope as they zigzagged out of sight, leaving only smoke plumes visible on the horizon. More eager now than ever for a kill, Fitzgerald ordered the Grenadier back to the surface for a rapid pursuit, disregarding standard naval operating procedure, which advised subs to patrol on the surface only at night. The sun was now up, and so was a Japanese fighter plane sent to look for the Grenadier. For Bob Palmer, Gordy Cox, Tim McCoy, Chuck Vervalen, and the rest of the crew, the war was about to take a terrible turn. I first stumbled across this story when a cousin of Barbara Palmer's gave me a twenty-page story Barbara's husband Bob had written about his life. It was an earnest tale of war and survival, but that wasn't the part that sucked me in. The passionate love story Bob had written, he was eighty years old, brought tears to my eyes. A month later I flew from Portland, Oregon to the couple's home on the Maryland shore. Their love was even more evident in person. As Bob was telling me about all Barbara did for him, unapologetic tears rolled down his cheeks and the lump in his throat was as big as a fist. For me, that was the beginning of a quest to meet the surviving members of the Grenadier's crew. Bob, Gordy, Tim, and Chuck all had clear minds and acute recall of things that had happened sixty years earlier. More than that, they shared a kind of ordinariness. They were all enlisted men, they hadn't been to prep schools or fancy academies. They had come of age, like others on their ship, during the Great Depression, their childhoods hardscrabble and austere. Even before the crucible of war, these guys were tough-ass survivors. Following the war, they returned to an America far different from the one they'd left five years earlier, and they were ill-equipped to deal with it. Over the next several decades, for the most part, they went quietly about their business but they all had troubles in their relationships with women and later with their sons. They all admitted to having drunk too much. And these ordinary men all had great, extraordinary stories to tell. It wasn't just their heroic endurance in terrible captivity that intrigued me. The more I got to know them, the more I realized that the qualities that enabled these four sailors to survive unimaginable cruelties in war were the same ones that got them into trouble later in life. That's what made them so much more than abstract embodiments of the so-called greatest generation, and so real, men whose lives describe the lifetime burden of war. Part 1. Surviving the Depression 1. Chuck Vervalen of Dundee, New York it had been a wet spring in the western foothills of the Catskill Mountains in 1928, and the rivers ran dangerously high. Arthur Vervalen told his wife not to let the kids anywhere near the water. People from those parts knew not to mess with the river. Chuck, seven years old, heard his father's warning. But when his thirteen-year-old sister Beulah set out for the swimming hole, he tagged along anyway. His concern was not the danger only that they might get the belt when they got home. In Chuck's eyes, Beulah could do no wrong. All the Vervalen girls were pretty, but she was the prettiest, with green eyes and chestnut-brown hair that fell in ringlets to the middle of her back. She watched over him and took him into town to buy candy, never making him feel like a pest. He loved the way she sometimes carried him on her hip or let him lick the bowl when she made cookies. She also took him with her whenever she ventured down to the swimming hole at the Unadilla River. She was the best swimmer in the family. At the river, Beulah told Chuck and a couple of friends to wait on the bank while she tested the water. Her plan was to swim out to the sandbar in the middle where they usually sunned themselves, and if it was safe, she would come back and escort Chuck across. She'd done it dozens of times. Halfway across, she began to flounder the current pulling her downstream away from the sandbar and the bank. Flailing her arms, she yelled for help. A man standing nearby heard her scream and dove in after her. But the current was too strong and he turned and struggled back to shore. Beulah disappeared under the water. Chuck was still standing on the bank an hour later 
when several men carried his sister's body on a board across the field. He watched them load her into the back of a truck and disappear down the road. Three days later, he was sitting in a pew at the front of the Congressional Church, Beulah's pansy-covered casket nearby. Next to him, his mother and sisters wept, and his father fixed his cold glare straight ahead. The Vervalens were a close family, all the kids helping with the chores, but there was also an abusive edge to family life, even before Beulah drowned, mainly because of Arthur. An imposing 300-pound Dutchman who liked to drink, he often took his belt to the kids, including the girls. Sometimes there seemed to be no reason for his outbursts. Chuck, the oldest son, caught the greatest share of his wrath. Arthur and his wife Florence scratched out a living on a 140-acre farm on the outskirts of Sydney, New York, with a couple of workhorses, a milking cow, pigs, chickens, vegetables, and an orchard with apples and pears. To help make ends meet, Arthur, an eighth-grade dropout, took an occasional job in town. Florence, an Irish redhead, worked from dawn to dusk, fixing meals, washing clothes, milking the cow, and feeding the pigs. Being pregnant, which she always seemed to be, didn't slow her down. After each birth, she'd be back at work the next day, picking potatoes and cleaning the barn. Like her husband, she'd dropped out of school before the ninth grade, but she loved the written word, and she read to her children every night, including the poetry of Longfellow. She sometimes wrote poetry herself, but rarely shared it. Arthur thought it a waste of her time. She also read the Bible a lot, especially after two babies were stillborn. She found comfort in the scriptures. As the Depression spread across the country, the Vervalens were unable to sell their milk, buy feed for their animals, or keep up with their taxes. They lost the farm in 1930 and moved 50 miles west to Binghamton. Some of their friends and neighbors suspected the move had as much to do with what had happened to Beulah that muggy day in June 1928 as it did with the Depression. Arthur couldn't stand looking at the river anymore. He never talked about it, but the kids knew that down deep he blamed his wife. If she'd heeded his warning, Beulah would still be alive. After the move to Binghamton, Chuck missed the farm, especially the horses and riding on the tractor. There were now ten kids in the family, and times were tough. Even so, Chuck was energetic and quick to adjust. His mom signed him up for Boy Scouts, and he set his sights on making it all the way to Eagle Scout, earning half the necessary badges in his first two years. His other passion was baseball, and he and his friends cleared a makeshift diamond out of a farmer's pasture. They had only one ball and bat among them, the bat held together by screws and electrical tape. He was also popular, in large part because he always took the dare. When a pal challenged him to shoot a rubber band at the backside of his teacher, Mrs. Sabercool, he did it and got caught. The principal took the belt to him. Even when he wasn't at fault, he was one of those kids that trouble seemed to find. If somebody threw a snowball and hit a passerby, Chuck got blamed. When a buddy threw a rock through a neighbor's window during a game of cowboys and Indians, Chuck got the belt. In 1935, when Chuck was 14, the Vervalens moved again, this time to a tenant farm just outside of Dundee, New York, in the Finger Lakes area, population 1,000. Dundee was only five miles from Seneca Lake, where summer yacht folks in fancy slacks vacationed, but to Chuck, the lake seemed as distant as New York City. The family had moved to Dundee from Binghamton when natural gas was discovered in the area, and Arthur got hired to head the purification plant, making him one of the lucky ones to have a job in the depth of the Depression. But his luck was short-lived. A co-worker turned him in for drinking on the job, and he got fired. After that, Arthur worked a series of jobs for the Works Progress Administration, WPA, the largest New Deal agency, which employed millions across America during the Depression to work on buildings, roads, and other projects. Sometimes he'd go off to Binghamton or Elmira for weeks or even months at a time, sending part of what little money he made back home. Chuck wasn't up on politics, but he heard his mother give thanks many times to President Roosevelt and his New Deal. To Chuck, it was his mother who held the family together. Although she was usually soft-spoken and gentle, 
she was resolute and sometimes showed a glimpse of a fiery Irish temperament. She never took a day off from caring for her family, even when she was sick. Chuck loved the way she read to him and his siblings, especially the westerns of Zane Grey. It provided an escape from the hard times and his father's absences. He also appreciated the way she could stretch the little food they had, whether it was by making a big pot of soup out of milkweed or baking bread out of the buckwheat that grew on their property. She was adept at improvising, as when she brewed a home remedy for cuts from the leaves of plants that grew along the road. Chuck did what he could to help. He especially liked going out to hunt or fish for food. He'd learned to shoot at an early age and had a 16-gauge shotgun to go with his 22. he He'd killed a lot of different animals for dinner, squirrels, woodchucks, rabbits, and even raccoons. He scrounged for whatever jobs he could find, such as selling magazines, but many nights he went to bed without anything to eat, or at best a bowl of beans and a little cornbread the neighbors had brought over. In school he'd get so hungry he couldn't concentrate. Another job he had was picking berries. The Dundee area liked to think of itself as the berry capital of the world, with thousands of acres of blackberries, raspberries, and thimbleberries, and Chuck thought of himself as one of the best pickers around. He was a wiry five feet six inches, 120 pounds, and tireless, even on the hottest, muggiest days. On good days he made a buck, turning all his earnings over to his mom. Working so many jobs meant he had to quit the Boy Scouts. It was a hard decision. He loved earning his merit badges. He had thirty-four of them. But he knew he'd never make it all the way to Eagle Scout because he didn't have the time, and he knew he could never pass the life-saving test. He could swim, but not well enough to haul somebody to safety. One day, just after he'd turned fifteen, Chuck was walking home with his dog at dusk, feeling pretty proud of himself, his twenty-two rifle in one hand, two dead rabbits in the other. He knew his mom would make a good meal out of the rabbits, hopefully a stew. It had been a week since the family had had any meat on the table. Chuck walked down the quiet main street of Dundee, passing the hardware store and lunch counter where two of his sisters worked. Down a side street, he saw a commotion at a WPA worksite where construction workers were digging a water line. He figured his father most likely would be there. Approaching the small crowd gathered around the WPA worksite, he heard his father's muffled voice. A friend of his father's pointed toward a ditch, four feet deep and two feet across. Chuck moved closer, peering down into the ditch. Mounds of freshly hoed dirt were piled to the side, and down inside the ditch, covered in dirt and wedged in too tight to move, was his dad, all three hundred pounds of him. From the look of it, he had been drinking, had tried to jump over the ditch and hadn't made it. In trying to extricate himself, he'd gotten so twisted around that it looked like it would take a major excavation effort to free him. Embarrassed, Chuck backed away from the crowd. At dinner that night, everyone ate rabbit, except Arthur, who didn't get out of the ditch until after midnight. The family moved again in 1936, this time into town, with the ten kids squeezed together in two small bedrooms. The house was a big black box with chipped paint, no front yard, and a rotting outhouse out back. But the house didn't embarrass Chuck as much as his clothes did. Although none of the boys at school dressed like Ivy Leaguers, Chuck would wear the same shirt three or four days in a row, or until his mother did the laundry again. His only pair of shoes had holes in the soles, and he stuffed cardboard in them to keep his feet dry. He got teased about his clothes, and he fought back. Fist fighting was a popular sport with the boys in Dundee, a town with not much to offer in the way of entertainment. Chuck was smaller than most boys his age, but he had a reputation as a scrapper, somebody who didn't go around picking fights, but who wouldn't back down. Chuck wasn't much of a student. Reading came hard for him, and he'd been held back a grade when he was nine. He frequently skipped school, usually to go fishing or hunting. But he was still popular, mainly because of his sense of humor and the pranks he pulled, hoisting an outhouse up a telephone pole, setting two skunks loose in a school restroom, coaxing a cow into the school and tying its tail to the school bell, 
dousing so much moonshine on another kid in class that the boy smelled like the town drunk, a smell Chuck knew well. Trouble was, he never learned the art of stealth. He had, however, learned the art of being generous. On Christmas Eve, 1938, Chuck, now seventeen, and his sister Inez sat at the kitchen table using newspaper and yarn to wrap their presents to the family. Like every other Christmas at the Vervalens, this would be a lean one. But unlike the other kids in the family, Chuck and Inez at least had presents to wrap. Inez had saved a few dollars from her job at the library, and Chuck had squirreled away money from his paper route. He'd bought each of his sisters a small dispenser of talc and a California orange. Wrapping his gifts, he daydreamed, as he often did. He thought about traveling. He'd never been to New York City, let alone California, and except for the time he'd made it to Ithaca traveling with the town baseball team, 15 miles from Dundee was the farthest he'd been from home. Baseball was one of his escapes. Chuck had developed into a good third baseman, lettering on the varsity his sophomore year, one of only two kids from the team to be picked to play with the older guys on the town team. It had taken him months to save up enough to buy a glove. Sometimes he'd leave the house at seven in the morning to walk to an afternoon game in the next county. He still wasn't very big, five feet six inches, 135 pounds, but he'd gotten strong from a summer job lifting 70-pound bags of cement. He took special pride in having a good arm. He fantasized about getting a tryout with a pro team, but his real dream, and he thought about it every day, was to be a harness race driver and maybe even own his own pacer or trotter. Harness racing was a popular sport in New York, and his plan for the coming summer was to travel the racing circuit and hang around the tracks and stables, maybe getting hired to help with the horses. His father, on the other hand, told him he should start thinking about joining the service when he turned 18. As he continued to wrap his gifts, his mind drifted to girls, especially one named Irene Damien. Not only was she really cute, she liked him, too. They passed notes back and forth in class, flirting like crazy. But there was a problem. Her parents had forbade her to go out with him. They thought he was too unruly. Undeterred, he had persuaded his friend Ernie, who was pleasant and polite, to go to Irene's house, make nice with her parents, and then escort her to the movie theater, where Chuck would be waiting. Ernie would hang around until the end of the date, then escort Irene back home, her parents never suspecting. The plan worked repeatedly, but other than a couple of harmless games of spin the bottle, Chuck never got past first base. But that was okay. The good girls of Dundee knew their boundaries, and the boys accepted them. On Christmas morning, all of Chuck's sisters beamed as they opened their gifts. The last to open her gift from Chuck was Inez. Peeling away the wrapping paper, she gasped. It was a doll he'd rescued from the doll graveyard, repainting its face and body and dressing it in a salvaged flowered cloth napkin. Inez reached out to hug her brother. He shied away. Boys, he'd learned, weren't supposed to show affection. Sitting on the hard wooden slats of the boxcar, Chuck was beginning to wonder if riding the rails across country was such a good idea. The hobo sitting across from him spit another chaw of tobacco on the floor. Chuck tried not to notice. He felt his stomach churn, not from the puddle of spit, but from not having eaten in two days. The train rolled into Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was September 1939, and German armies had just invaded Poland. Great Britain and France had declared war. According to Chuck's dad, America would also be in it soon. Chuck had dropped out of school after his junior year to make money. Not that he needed it to take his sweetheart Irene to the movies. She'd moved a hundred miles away. Despite letters back and forth, it might as well have been a million miles. Riding the rails had seemed like a good idea when he and his new buddy Preston Dumar decided to hitch a ride to Seattle. He'd met Preston while working with the trotters and pacers at a county fair in Dundee, and when Preston invited him to his home in Erie, Pennsylvania, Chuck jumped at the chance, making the trip in the horse trailer with the animals, sulkies, and hay. Soon after he got to Erie, Preston claimed there was lots of work picking apples and pears out in Washington State, 
So Chuck signed on for that trip, too. It sounded like a great adventure. Not only would he get to see the country, he might just be able to save up enough in a couple of years to buy a horse to race himself. As he'd hoped, Chuck had become known around the tracks, taking whatever odd jobs he could find. He cleaned stalls, shined the sulkies, washed the horses, bandaged their legs, and exercised them in their morning workouts. Some days he got paid fifty cents. Some days he got nothing. At night he slept in the stalls with the horses. He had notions of becoming a driver, a job in which size, weight, and age were not restrictive factors. What counted was a driver's skill and courage to guide the horse and sulky in the tight quarters of a high-speed race, and he knew he could do it. It appealed to him that some drivers were also trainers, and some even became owners. He wanted to be all three. As the train stopped in Fort Wayne, Chuck considered getting off and heading back to New York. Preston had failed to mention the hobos and the spit and the wind rattling through the boxcar, or the hunger. They'd left Erie with no food and twenty-five cents between them. This wasn't Chuck's first extended trip from home. When he turned seventeen, he'd been hired by the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, the New Deal Public Works Program providing employment and training for men in projects related to conservation and natural resources. He'd spent the winter and spring working on a crew at Watkins Glen State Park, helping to haul rocks, build a retaining wall, and trim bushes. Out of his $33 monthly paycheck, $20 went home to his mom. Having money in his pocket and a guaranteed three square meals a day suited him. He even liked the Army-style regimen. Now, the way Preston told it, he'd make even better wages picking apples, and there was some good horse racing out west, too. As they hopped off the train, a hobo warned them to watch out for the yard cop. It was too late. The cop had already spotted them. After a quick lecture on how stupid and dangerous it was for them to be riding the rails, he gave them a choice. They could spend two days in the dingy little jail on the yard with rats and hobos, or they could catch the next freight back east. Ten minutes later, they were on a train heading east. Chuck was thrilled to be going home. Chuck slipped his pipe into his pocket, grabbed his tattered suitcase, and stepped off the train at the Buffalo Station. He was a baby-faced eighteen and a high school dropout. He was also freshly enlisted in the Navy and on his way to boot camp. The pipe was meant to make him look older. It was October 1940. President Roosevelt was running for an unprecedented third term against Republican Wendell Wilkie and had just delivered on his promise of military aid to Winston Churchill, sending fifty used American destroyers, many that had served in World War I, to help replace the alarming number of British ships sunk by German U-boats. The President had pledged to make the United States the great arsenal of democracy in the fight against Hitler. At the same time, he'd imposed an embargo on oil and steel to Japan in response to its aggression against China, as well as its entering into the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy and its moving troops into Indochina to build air bases for possible attacks. At home, the first peacetime conscription in the nation's history took place in 1940. Over 16 million men, ages 21 to 36, signed up. The standards weren't high. An inductee had to be at least five feet tall and 105 pounds, had to have at least half his teeth, and could not have flat feet, a hernia, or venereal disease. Nevertheless, almost 50% of the applicants were rejected, and hundreds of thousands of others were turned down because they could not read or write. Chuck hadn't enlisted out of patriotic duty or the wish to be a hero. His father had convinced him that America would be pulled into the conflict, and the sooner Chuck enlisted, the better his chances of getting a good assignment. His father said that the military would make a man out of him, and that it would be a good career. That made sense to Chuck, but what appealed to him even more was the money. His only hope of buying a horse was the steady paycheck the military offered, and the idea of eating three square meals every day, three hots and a cot, as the saying went, seemed like a luxury. In the two weeks prior to enlisting, he'd eaten beans and cornbread every night, and nothing at all during the day. Leaving the depot, he headed for a hotel in downtown Buffalo, where he would stay for three days while he was being processed before boot camp in Newport, Rhode Island. 
He checked his wallet to make sure his money was still there. Before leaving home, he'd sold his shotgun and several chickens he'd raised in the backyard. The fourteen dollars he'd gotten in exchange was his total net worth. Originally, he had tried to list in the Marines. More than anything, he liked the uniforms, especially the ones with the red stripes down the blue pants. But he was only five feet seven inches and 135 pounds, and the sergeant said he wasn't big enough to be a Marine. Go down the street and try the Navy, the sergeant suggested. Chuck passed the physical, and a couple of days later, a Navy recruiter came to his house to tell him he had been accepted and would be called up in six months, maybe a year. The call came the next week. Entering the hotel lobby in Buffalo, he noticed three young recruits sitting in a corner, passing around a bottle of wine in a brown paper bag. They seemed much older. Chuck pulled his pipe from his pocket and headed to the desk to check in. He didn't regret his decision to enlist, but he was nervous. Despite his mischievous ways in high school, he didn't drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes, and he was still a virgin. Smoking a pipe was just about the boldest thing he'd done until then. The recruits in the corner motioned to him, offering him a swig of wine. Sure, why not, he said. 2. Bob Palmer of Medford, Oregon It was a Sunday morning in the summer of 1927, and eight-year-old Bob Palmer was playing with his new wagon in front of his grandparents' house in Ashland, Oregon trying his best not to make too much noise. His grandfather, a deeply devoted Methodist, had warned him once already, Don't make me come out here again. But it was hard to play quietly. His father had made the wagon for his birthday out of wood carved from a southern Oregon pine, and Bob was excited. He'd spent the last two summers living at a construction site in the southern Cascades with his dad, Martin Palmer, a stern, taciturn man who worked on a crew building the road around the rim of Crater Lake. They lived in a stone cabin surrounded by sturdy mountain hemlocks and Shasta red firs. During the winters, snow piled up as high as the windows. Bob occupied his days during the summer picking wild berries, fishing for native trout, and hiking the rim of the lake. When his dad would allow it, he'd hang out in the shed, watching the men work on the equipment. It was a magical setting, but Bob felt isolated from kids his age. His brother Darrell was four years older and rarely had the time of day for him, except to use him as a punching bag. At night, Bob often stayed alone in the cabin, with no books or radio, while his dad played poker with the crew. Discipline came from a leather belt. He liked coming down out of the mountains to town. On this day, his grandmother had promised to serve him apple pie and homemade ice cream later, and to read to him. He liked the attention she lavished on him. His grandfather reappeared on the front porch and glared at him. Bob watched him walk to the shed at the side of the house and disappear inside, then reemerge carrying a big sledgehammer. He motioned for Bob to get out of the wagon. Then, with one mighty swing, he brought the head of the big hammer smashing down, shattering the wagon into a hundred pieces. Bob stared up at him, his tear-filled eyes pleading for an explanation. There'll be no noise on the Sabbath, was all that his grandfather said. Ten-year-old Bob Palmer sat in a chair at the foot of his mother's four-poster mahogany bed in their small clappered home in Medford, a town of five thousand in southern Oregon, twenty-nine miles from the California border. Her skin was gray, her eyes barely open. He touched her hand, and she felt cold. Please don't die, Mama, he whispered. She struggled to speak, but the words wouldn't come. His father got up and closed the shades. It was hard for Bob to see his mom like this. She'd always been the backbone of the family the steadying, nurturing force during these hard times. His father hadn't said much about what was wrong, only that she'd had her appendix taken out and something had gone wrong, possibly an infection from a dirty instrument the doctor used. To Bob it seemed that his father was madder at the doctor for chopping off his mom's hair than for any medical mistake. His mother had not cut her hair for years in adherence to church rules, and it fell below her waist. 
But as she lay on her bed, twisting and turning in pain, she had become entangled in her hair, so the doctor cut it, incurring the wrath of Bob's father. Keeping vigil at his mom's bedside, Bob and his brother were not allowed to leave her side. Her breathing was labored. Finally, she summoned Bob's father. He leaned in close to her, and in a voice barely above a whisper, yet loud enough for Bob to hear, she spoke. Don't beat the kids. Those were her last words. For four unsettling days, Bob and his brother were made to sit next to her body, surrounded by grieving family, first while she lay on her deathbed, then when she was transferred to a cheap gray casket. They watched their father take the hair the doctor had cut and clip it back on. In the weeks following the funeral, Bob saw her cold, ashen face reflected in store windows, mirrors, and lakes. He couldn't escape it. Bob stood in the corner, his punishment for not cleaning the pine cones off the porch as ordered. Cora, his new stepmother, glared at him, and he braced himself for the next verbal barrage. She and Bob's father had met when she was the cook for the Crater Lake crew, and they'd married less than a year after the funeral. She was always belittling Bob, always making him feel unwanted. His father did little to ease his discomfort. You're stupid, Cora yelled. Stupid and lazy. Bob tried to block out the words. He didn't think he was dumb. But maybe she was right. He struggled in school, disengaged, out of step, behind in his reading. Kids teased him. He looked at Cora her hair in a bun so tight that it pinched her face. He resented his father for marrying her. He resented her for not being his mother. Most days he avoided her as much as possible. His mind was made up. As soon as he'd served his penance in the corner, he would take off. The family was spending another summer in the stone cabin near Crater Lake. Now fourteen, Bob was supposed to move down to the Rogue River Valley to go to Medford High next year, and he was dreading it because the plan was for Cora to go with him while his dad would stay at Crater Lake. When Bob questioned the move, his father ignored him. Bob would go off into the woods for hours at a time without his father knowing or caring where he was, and that was what he was going to do now, disappear into the woods. He picked up his hand-cranked Victrola and loaded it into a large canvas bag with straps, then hoisted it on his back. He had used the bag the previous summer for carrying large bottles of water up and down steep trails to players from the Chicago Cardinals' pro football team. The Cardinals had come to Oregon for preseason training, and as part of their regimen they cleared mountain trails, hauling large buckets of rocks. By carrying water to the men, Bob had earned enough to buy the Victrola. Listening to music was his favorite way to pass the time alone in his room. Setting off down a trail, his Victrola strapped to his back and a fishing pole in his hand, he felt relief. He loved Crater Lake's dramatic cliffs and deep blue waters. Some days he hiked to the rim and sat on the edge for hours, watching the sunlight shimmer off the transparent water and the eagles riding the thermal breezes. He also loved to fish, hiking into Lightning Springs or Annie Creek, tributaries of the mighty Rogue River. He often caught twenty rainbows or Dolly Vardens a day using mealyworms for bait and selling his catch to the tourists for a nickel a fish. He didn't get an allowance, so whatever money he had was the result of his own initiative. Frequently he hung out near the new tourist center and lodge, and he learned to get the black bears to come and eat right out of his hand, while the tourists, the men dressed in white suits and the women in full-length dresses, stood beside their Hudsons and took pictures of their very own Huckleberry Finn. Sometimes they paid him a nickel. He kept his savings in a tin can, using some of the money to buy a new pair of shoes every year. On this day his destination was a small cave hidden off the trail. He came there often, his secret place of solitude. Slowly he unpacked his Victrola and set it on the ground. Then he pulled out a record by his favorite recording artist, torch singer Ruth Etting, and placed it on the turntable. He cranked up the phonograph and, sitting alone in a cave deep in the woods, sang along to the record. He returned home just before dusk without anybody noticing he'd been gone. 
Bob headed out the back door of Beck's Bakery toward the truck, ready to make the afternoon deliveries around Medford with his buddy Fred Beck, the son of the owner. It was early spring 1937, Bob's junior year at Medford High. He was now living in town with Cora, their relationship unimproved. His grades were barely passing, and he didn't play sports or take part in school activities. He received no encouragement or help at home with his schoolwork from Cora. His dad, a fifth-grade dropout, was unconvinced of the value of an education, and anyway, he was still working up at Crater Lake. Bob had started hanging around the bakery after school, hoping to score day-old doughnuts and pastries. Cora rarely fixed him breakfast or lunch, and many days he hadn't eaten anything by the time he left school. When Fred asked if he'd like to drive along with him on his routes, Bob accepted. It wasn't a paying position, but snacks were guaranteed. He and Fred didn't socialize away from the truck, but it was something to do, a way to avoid going home. As Fred started up the engine, Bob got back out. Wait, he said. I'll be right back. He returned with a hose and began washing down the dirty truck, which was covered with a layer of black soot emitted by the thousands of smudge pots in the nearby orchards. The Rogue Valley's major product was pears, Bartlett, Bosque, and Camise, and in the early springtime when temperatures dipped too low, smudge crews went into the orchards at 4 a.m. to hand light pots of oil to heat the air around the trees to keep the pear buds from freezing. Bob worked on one of the crews, regularly getting up at 3 a.m. to go to work. He often came home with red eyes and a hacking cough looking like a coal miner, but he always cleaned up before heading to school. He was fastidious about cleanliness and grooming. On weekends, he worked part-time at Spencer's Clothing, even doing a little modeling at big sale events in exchange for shirts and pants. As the truck headed into downtown Medford, Fred turned on the headlights. With almost no wind, the dense, suffocating black smoke of the smudge pots had blanketed the town, turning the afternoon into night and leaving a dark film on the streets and sidewalks. Riding in the bakery truck, Bob and Fred were silent. There was something about Bob that Fred couldn't quite put his finger on. He didn't know anything about Bob's home life, other than that the family was poor and Bob didn't like his stepmother. But he sensed that Bob was lonely, and suspected that he rode along with him more for the companionship than the jelly doughnuts. That was okay with him. He enjoyed the company, too, especially on the days when they rode to Roseburg or Klamath Falls, trips that took several hours. As much as Bob missed the clear, crisp air of the mountains, and as much as he disliked living with Cora, Medford High offered something the wilderness didn't. Girls. Bob had developed a flirty way with the opposite sex. He had thick, dark hair, blue eyes, big dimples, and a lean frame. He took pride in dressing well. He usually wore a coat and tie or a sweater to school, and he was a good dancer. He was also polite and had a natural charm and a way with words. The girls took notice. Now, across the crowded dance floor of the Dreamland Ballroom, Bob watched a girl dance riveted on her every move. He liked her looks, five feet two inches, light brown hair, blue eyes, and a great body. He asked about her and learned that her name was Barbara Kohler and that she was a junior at nearby Central Point High, five miles north of Medford. She was popular, a good student, and active in choir, plays, yearbook staff, student government, and cheerleading. The previous summer she'd been crowned Miss Southern Oregon, and he remembered seeing her picture in the newspaper. Not shy about approaching girls, he waited for the five-piece orchestra to play a slow song and then made his move. She accepted, and beneath the large crystal ball shimmering overhead, they danced slow and close to stardust. She liked the way he moved and the way he looked so stylish in his sport coat and tie and nicely shined shoes. They danced the next dance, and all the rest of the dances that night. Bob made a point of holding Barbara extra tight during I Don't Know Why I Love You Like I Do. When the dance was over, he walked her outside to the parking lot. 
she'd driven there in her father's 37 Ford with her cousin Margie. Standing next to the driver's door, he reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a small flask of gin. He took a swig, then offered one to her. He wasn't sure how she'd respond. Maybe she came from a religious family and wouldn't approve. Barbara remembered what her father had told her, that she shouldn't drink, but if she did, she should make sure to drink only bonded whiskey, the good stuff that had been aged at least four years. She didn't know if this was the good stuff, but she took a big swig anyway and then passed the flask back. Bob smiled. He couldn't wait to see her again. Sitting across from Barbara's parents in their living room, Bob felt as if he were on trial. He'd met the Kohlers several times when he'd come to pick up Barbara for a date, but this was the first time he'd sat down to talk with them. He desperately wanted to make a good impression. Barbara was an only child. He knew that her parents doted on her and that she would do just about anything not to disappoint them. Like many families in the Rogue Valley, the Kohlers had been hit hard by the Depression. Barbara had spent her early years living in a two-story farmhouse in the apple and pear orchards outside Central Point. It was a rural bucolic setting. The family had hogs, chickens, and cows, and from her upstairs bedroom window she could see Mount McLaughlin. In the summers she played on the banks of nearby Bear Creek and pushed her cousin Margie in the swing her dad had hung from the big oak tree in their front yard. But when the Depression hit, the family lost the farm and moved into a small house in town. That's when Mr. Kohler went to work for Greyhound. Mr. Kohler asked Bob what his plans were after high school. Bob thought for a moment. He'd already worked at a number of jobs, but all of them were seasonal and none of them interested him as a career. His newest job was delivering jugs of milk in the morning for Hansen's Dairy with his friend Swede. He was now living in Swede's unheated garage, sleeping on a cot next to Swede's 31 Chevy. Anything was better than the verbal abuse from Cora. I'm not sure of my plans, he said. Judging from Mr. Kohler's scowl, that wasn't the right answer and Bob didn't dare tell him that he'd just been suspended from school for a semester and there was a chance he might not even graduate. A couple of weeks earlier, he'd ducked into one of the boys' restrooms between classes to take a few quick nips from his flask of gin, only to have the principal walk in and bust him. The worst part of it wasn't getting tossed out of school. It was incurring Cora's wrath. The idea of joining the service had occurred to him, Across the ocean, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was ceding Czechoslovakia to Hitler and declaring that he had secured peace in our time. A Gallup poll showed that most Americans approved of this act of appeasement. Maybe this would be a good time to join. But Bob wasn't yet eighteen, and as much as Cora seemed to want him out of her way, she'd made it clear that she wouldn't sign the necessary release form. "'What sports do you play?' asked Mr. Kohler. "'None, sir.' I have to work after school. He had the feeling this wasn't going well. The more questions Mr. Kohler asked, the more intimidated Bob felt by his stern demeanor. Mr. Kohler had just gotten home from work and was still dressed in his greyhound uniform, not a stitch out of place, like a commandant in the Inquisition room. Even his white gloves were spotless. Mrs. Kohler, who'd recently started work as a secretary for a cousin's fruit-packing company, seemed kinder. She even seemed to like him. The months that Bob and Barbara had been dating had been the happiest of his young life. He loved Barbara's sunny, outgoing personality, the opposite of the dark cloud he faced at home. He hadn't told her yet that he loved her, but he was sure he did, and she'd made it clear that she thought he was awfully cute. They'd already been intimate, starting with necking out on Old Stage Road, then going all the way for the first time in the back seat of her father's car late one night, parked under the oak trees across the street from the Baptist church. By the time they left Barbara's house, Bob had the distinct feeling that Mr. Kohler didn't think he was good enough for his daughter. As crazy as she was for Bob, Barbara broke off their relationship a few days later. She told him it was because he wasn't around enough, always going off to Crater Lake for days at a time to help his dad on the road crew, but Bob knew the real reason. This was 1938, and in the Rogue River Valley, 
nice seventeen-year-old girls didn't go against their father's wishes. Bob stepped off the bus into the depot in Eugene, carrying his tattered valise. He set out on foot for the University of Oregon campus. It was the spring of 1939, and he'd traveled north from Medford to pay Barbara, now a freshman, a surprise visit. He was still in high school, scheduled to graduate a year behind his class because of his suspension. Bob and Barbara hadn't dated for almost a year, and both were seeing other people, but Bob hadn't given up. He'd written her a dozen letters, and although she'd responded only a couple of times, he held out hope that it was possible to rekindle the passion they'd once had. Nearing the boarding house where Barbara lived, he wasn't sure if she'd even be there. He knew it was a bold move to pop in on her unannounced, but he was counting on the surprise factor, that she'd be so happy to see him that they'd have a romantic weekend together and he'd be back in the saddle. In one of her letters she'd mentioned that she felt a tinge of homesickness, so he'd brought a small box of her favorite pears. Lately he'd been thinking a lot about all the good times they'd had together, especially the dances at the Dreamland Ballroom, where they had effortlessly glided across the floor as if they'd been practicing together for years. To him she was prettier and more graceful than Ginger Rogers, who regularly appeared on stage at the Criterion in Medford with her group the Redheads. At the boarding house, Bob sat nervously in the waiting room while someone went to find her. He worried that now that she was a college girl, she wouldn't have time for a guy who was still in high school. Maybe he wasn't sophisticated enough. Maybe he wasn't as smart as the college boys she'd been seeing. He glanced up and saw her descending the stairs. She was every bit as pretty as he remembered, even more so. She moved toward him, a quizzical look on her face. It wasn't the big smile he'd hoped for. What are you doing here? she asked. I just thought I'd come up and see you, he answered. Two girls entered the room, and Barbara didn't introduce him. This is a nice house, he said awkwardly. Yes, it is, she responded. He'd caught her totally off guard. Her first reaction was that she wished he wasn't there. She was in college now taking literature and history classes, going to fraternity parties. Now that she'd met people from places such as Seattle and Portland, to her Bob seemed so unpolished. She had purposely not answered most of his letters, not wanting to encourage him. And a college girl wasn't supposed to date a high school boy, even if he was older than she was. She was dating guys who talked about going into business or law. In Bob's last letter, he'd talked about enlisting in the service when and if he graduated. Bob, I have other plans, she told him. I don't suppose I could talk you out of them, he ventured. She shook her head. He didn't need her to explain any further. He turned toward the door. I'm sorry I bothered you, he apologized. Maybe we can see each other this summer when I come home, she offered weakly. That'd be nice, he replied. He caught the first bus back to Medford. Watching the pastoral scenery roll by, he felt a hollow pit in his stomach. By the time the bus reached Medford, he'd made up his mind. As soon as school was out, maybe sooner, he would leave town and join the Navy. 3. Tim McCoy of Dalhart, Texas The minute Tim McCoy walked through the front door, he knew something was wrong. He'd been playing across the street at his Aunt Bee's house, his refuge when things at home weren't right. In the past three years, he'd spent as much time at Aunt Bee's as he had at home, staying there for months at a time when his mother was in the hospital. Maybe that's why his father, Harold McCoy, wore a scowl. Maybe his mom needed to be sent away again for more treatment. Tim was only eight, but he'd already learned to recognize the signs, She'd mope around, not getting dressed all day, sleeping a lot, crying, barely able to take care of the house. Then Dad would bundle her into the Model T and drive the 85 miles from their home in Dalhart down to Amarillo, where she'd stay until she was well enough to come home. It was hard for Tim not to have his mom around and to not know for sure what was wrong with her. He'd come to rely on his dad, a salesman at Rhodes & Wilson, the local furniture store, and Aunt Bee, 
an ex-school teacher who had a great touch with kids. Or maybe his father was just upset at him for leaving his marbles and tops on the floor. If that was the case, he'd most likely be getting the razor strap. Not that his dad was mean, he just believed in firm discipline. At six feet one inch and 225 pounds, with broad shoulders and powerful arms, Harold McCoy was an imposing man. But Tim was a tough little guy, and rarely flinched when punished. Besides, his father was his hero, an honest, hard-working man who had a sense of humor and could build or fix just about anything. He glanced at his dad. Normally a man with a positive outlook, on this day Harold glared straight ahead, not saying a word, his suit jacket slung over the back of a chair. He nodded toward the window. Tim and his mother looked outside. The sky was an ominous black, thick with grit and dirt swirling off the prairie in every direction. Maybe they were in for another black duster, a powerful windstorm that whipped up such massive clouds of fine silt and soil that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. After a black duster, sand would be piled as high as the eaves on houses, and fence posts would be buried. These storms had all but denuded the land, the worst of them blowing topsoil as far away as Washington, D.C., and onto ships in the Atlantic Ocean. Got the bad news today, he announced. Tim's mom, Capitola Boatwright McCoy, known to everyone as Cappy, sighed. One of ten children of Irish-German ancestry raised on a farm in Comanche, Texas, she was a small woman, five feet one inch, 115 pounds, who relied heavily on her Baptist faith. Whatever it is, she said, the Lord will take care of us. Tim studied his parents. He'd heard that farmers in the area were abandoning their property, that businesses in town were failing, and that friends of his parents had been forced to stand in bread lines. But the Depression was still a vague concept. He was an outgoing kid who spent his time playing with his friends, spinning tops, and pitching washers against the side of the house. His mom's illness weighed on him sometimes, but other than that, all seemed well. They're closing the store, his father said. His mother asked when. Tomorrow. I'll be lucky if I get paid for this week. I'm out of work. Tim peered out the window of Aunt B's living room, hoping to see his father's car. He hadn't seen either of his parents in weeks. His mom had been hospitalized again, and his dad had been out of town, working for a dollar a day for the WPA, helping to build a farm-to-market road from Brownfield to Lubbock. Supposedly his mom was being released, and both his parents would be home soon. But Tim had learned that things didn't always go the way he wanted. It was 1934, and the Depression had landed hard on Dalhart, population 4,500. For years the people in Dalhart had taken great pride in their community. Settled under the Homestead Act, which had given farmers and ranchers large tracts of marginal land that could not be irrigated, the town had experienced a long run of prosperity. But now, after years of bad agricultural practices, the farms were in trouble, worsened by the drought and the black dusters. Livestock were dead or dying, and the crops withered. On the rare occasions when it rained, the runoff removed what little topsoil was left, slicing out gorges forty feet deep. Families were leaving in droves. Dalhart was doing its best to fight back. Wealthy local rancher Uncle Dick Coon had become legendary for his generous treatment of suffering farmers and cowboys, giving them money to survive. Some of these had formed the Last Man Club, vowing to remain under any circumstances. Harold McCoy, a staunch New Deal Democrat, had joined the club, but as the depression deepened, his resolve weakened. He would go where he could find work. Tim spotted his dad's Model T coming up the street. He raced out the door to greet it, but there was no passenger. The doctor had decreed that Tim's mom wasn't ready to come home yet. Tim's heart sank. He didn't know that his mother had almost died while delivering him, and then fallen into a deep depression from which she'd never fully recovered her condition compounded by his father's desire to have more children. All Tim knew was that he wanted his mom home. Dr. George W. Truitt, a visiting preacher from Dallas, stood at the pulpit, pointing a finger at the congregation of Lubbock's First Baptist Church gathered under a large tent. 
Tim had the feeling the creature was pointing directly at him. He and his parents had moved to Lubbock from Dalhart after his mom was released and his father's job with the WPA ended. Alcohol is the force of evil, thundered Truett. Do not succumb to its insidious temptation. Amen, echoed the congregation. Sitting next to his mom and dad, Tim, now nine, nodded in agreement. Neither his mom nor his dad had ever tasted a drop of alcohol, and he was certain that he never would either. Today was the last day of the week-long revival, the day Tim was to be baptized, and who better to do it than George W. Truett, the most famous evangelical preacher in Texas, if not the whole South. To his followers he had the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was an early model Billy Graham, learned and charismatic. He preached that true greatness consisted not of great wealth or shining social qualities or vast amounts of study, but in using all of one's talents in unselfish ministry to others. To Tim, Truett was more impressive than even Babe Ruth. As with many Lubbock families of the time, the Baptist Church was at the center of the McCoy family's life, not only spiritually, but socially as well. At home, every meal began with a prayer, and every day ended with quotes from the scriptures. Tim's mother's mental health had improved since they'd moved to Lubbock. It helped that she didn't have to stand in bread lines. Harold had found a new job as a salesman for Great Plains Furniture, working ten hours a day, six days a week, for eighteen dollars a week. On their way home from Tim's baptism, the family passed a gathering of non-believers. Tim would hear nothing of their cynicism. He liked going to church and living in Lubbock. He had become active in the Boy Scouts and loved the jamborees and campouts. He'd also made a best friend, Byron Varner, whose parents owned the Main Street Cafe downtown and lived in an apartment above it. Tim spent a lot of time there, eating hamburgers and playing with Byron in the alley behind the cafe. Byron was a year older, but he admired Tim's never-back-down personality and the way he was always the first one to climb the high dive at the city pool and take the leap. Back home, Tim's mom prepared Sunday dinner, always served at noon, and he retreated to his room to look at his new trombone, a birthday present his parents had purchased on the installment plan, three payments of two dollars each. He loved his new instrument. His goal was to get to play in the band when he reached high school. Fingering the valves of the trombone, he heard his parents arguing. They weren't yelling, but their voices were tense. I can't go through it again, his mother said. Slowly, quietly, he began to play his trombone. Nothing special just noise to drown out the tension. It was early September 1939 in Texas, the temperature over 100 degrees. Walking home through the Oak Cliff section of Dallas, Tim, now a sophomore in high school, had a big decision to make. To go out for the track team at Sunset High and defend his 880 state championship, or get an after-school job. Despite all the efforts of the New Deal, 10 million Americans were still unemployed. Tim made two dollars a week getting up before dawn to deliver the Dallas Morning News on foot. He couldn't afford a bike. Tim's parents had divorced at the end of his freshman year in Lubbock. He and his mother had moved to Dallas at the urging of her three sisters and two brothers, all of whom lived there. Her brothers were both successful insurance men and promised to look out for them. His father had remarried and moved to Austin. Tim hadn't seen him since. Tim wasn't happy about the move or the divorce. Dallas seemed big and unfriendly. None of the kids at school had divorced parents, and it embarrassed him. He didn't like leaving his friends in Lubbock, especially Byron. He didn't like living in an apartment. But most of all, he resented his dad for deserting the family. Continuing home, he started to run, despite the stifling heat. His new neighborhood, Oak Cliff, located on the south bank of the Trinity River, two miles from downtown Dallas, had been intended to serve as a resort but had instead become a working-class neighborhood. Tim had heard that Bonnie and Clyde had used it as a place to lie low. Later, Lee Harvey Oswald would live in a rooming house in Oak Cliff. To Tim, it seemed harder-edged than Lubbock. He often ran home from school, mainly just to burn off some of his considerable energy. At five feet seven inches and a wiry 130 pounds, he was hardly an imposing presence, but was very athletic 
and not one to back down from a fight. In his freshman year at Lubbock High, he'd won the regional championship in the 880, traveling all the way to Guymon, Oklahoma, to win the finals, a victory he dismissed as no big deal. This year he also wanted to go out for the wrestling team. He got good grades, too, mostly A's and B's, but the only class he really liked was band. He liked practicing his trombone, mostly playing compositions by John Philip Sousa or religious songs. But he understood the reality that earning money would most likely have to be a higher priority than sports and band practice. He knew his dad was supposed to send $8 a month in support, but rarely did. Occasionally his mom took in ironing, but she didn't look for a steady job, partly because her brothers didn't think women should work. To bring in money over the summer, Tim had mowed lawns, worked at an ice skating rink, and caddied at Glen Lake's Country Club for his Uncle Ben. If there was anyone Tim looked up to, it was Uncle Ben, the successful founder of Trinity Universal Insurance. Ben had bought stock in a little startup beverage company in Dallas called Dr. Pepper and watched his investment grow into a fortune. Tim loved riding with him in his shiny new car to the country club and spending holidays with him at his resort house on Lake Texahoma. It made him think that someday he too could be a wealthy insurance man. That was the dream. Breathing hard when he arrived back at the apartment, he opened the door and stepped inside. With no air conditioner, it was hotter inside than out. His mom stood near an open window, a fan positioned to blow on her. She was ironing someone else's clothes, sweat beating on her forehead. Tim studied her for a moment and knew what his decision had to be. The next day he found a job delivering the Dallas Evening News after school. There'd be no more track. In the summer of 1941, not even Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak could distract Americans from the threat of war. German troops had occupied Paris, and Hitler had reneged on his non-aggression pact with Russia. In secret military discussions over command and strategy, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff and their British counterparts concluded that Germany was the predominant member of the Axis powers, so if America entered the war, the Atlantic and Europe would be considered the decisive theaters. Any future American military effort would be concentrated there, and operations of U.S. forces in other theaters, such as the Pacific, would be secondary. Part of this reasoning was that Germany's offensive capabilities were greater and that its superior technology had the potential to develop a secret weapon that could destroy its enemies. Tim wasn't as concerned about the threat of war as he was about getting an occasional date and making money on his new job selling soda pop at the Wednesday night wrestling matches. On a good night, he could make as much as 75 cents, not to mention getting to see legendary wrestlers such as Silent Hubert, Strangler Lewis, Danny McShane, and Sailor Tex Watkins. He knew the matches were fixed, he'd seen the capsules of blood in the dressing room, and yet he liked watching anyway. But it was the money that was important. He liked being able to help out his mom with the rent. She was anxious by nature, always expecting the worst, and he was the opposite, constantly assuring her that things would be okay. He considered it his duty to keep her spirits up. In the fall of 1941, soon after Tim started his senior year at Sunset High, Byron came to visit from Lubbock. Despite having lived on opposite sides of the state for three years, they were still great friends. Byron liked not just Tim's sense of humor and intrepid approach to life, but also his compassion, like the way he treated Sidney Siegel back in junior high. Sidney, a small, plump Jewish kid, was everyone's favorite target, and he rarely made it down the hall without getting punched in the shoulder or being called kike or Jew boy. He attached himself to Tim, most likely because Tim was outgoing and friendly to everyone. Sidney soon became his shadow, following him everywhere. Tim accepted the role of Sidney's protector. He had taken to heart what he'd heard Reverend Truett preach about a person's true calling being to lend a helping hand. When Tim moved to Dallas, nobody was sadder to see him leave than Sidney. Seeing Tim for the first time in a couple of years, Byron noticed a change. On the surface, Tim was still full of spunk, bragging about getting paddled in band class for acting out. But now he was less directed, more intense, a bit of a loose cannon. 
It was almost as if he'd grown a chip on his shoulder. Not that they talked about it. In Texas, circa 1941, best buddies didn't talk about their feelings. Byron talked about joining the Navy. The idea appealed to Tim, too. He was tired of working four jobs, and he reasoned that in the Navy he would make better money and could send most of it home to help his mom. If there was a war, he figured he'd be safer on a ship in the middle of the ocean than in a muddy foxhole. The only possible wrinkle was getting his mother's permission, since he was only seventeen. To his surprise, she gave it, figuring he was probably going to drop out of school anyway. The next day, Tim walked across town to the recruiting depot, took his physical exam, and signed up. The day after that, he marched into the office at Sunset High and dropped out. The fact that he was still several months short of graduation didn't bother him. He could finish after he had served his time. A steady income was more important. On November 1, 1941, still not shaving daily, Tim kissed his tearful mother goodbye and boarded a train for boot camp in San Diego, California. On that same day, halfway across the world, six of the newest and largest Japanese aircraft carriers carrying 423 combat planes were assembling in Tancan Bay in the Kuriel Islands, ready to set sail for Pearl Harbor. 4. Gordy Cox of Yakima, Washington At the age of two, Gordy Cox was playing behind his house in Wayne, Alberta with his older brother Larry. They started chasing one of the family's new colts, and Gordy got too close. The colt kicked him, nailing him in the left eye, shattering the bone just below the eyebrow and knocking him cold. Larry ran to get their mother, Nellie, who scooped up Gordy, put him in the family's buggy, and drove ten miles to the nearest doctor. But the doctor was gone, and the closest town was Drumheller, another ten miles over rough, inhospitable terrain, too treacherous for a horse and buggy and an unconscious child. Now frantic, Nellie found two railroad men who volunteered to help. They led her to a flat-bedded railroad platform car powered by a pump handle. With Nellie cradling Gordy in her lap, the two men pumped all the way to Drumheller, then escorted them to the doctor who stitched the wound and applied ice to relieve the swelling. Gordy remained in a coma for the next two days. Eventually the injury healed, but in the months and years to come, Gordy struggled with his vision, especially close up. Reading was difficult, and he was always behind in school. He flunked the first grade. Gordy's a little slow, his mom would explain. He got kicked by a horse. Things always came tough for Gordy. Born at his grandparents' remote farmhouse on the Canadian prairie on June 23, 1923, Gordy was two months old before his parents hitched up the horse and buggy and drove into town to register his birth. They put down the wrong date. He was still an infant when they scraped together $100 for a down payment on a plot of farmland ten miles south of Wayne. The land seemed like a good buy. There was a spring and two lakes, a barn, and an old log structure to shelter the family's dozen pigs, workhorses, cows, turkeys, and chickens during the frigid winters. The house was another matter. It had no electricity, refrigerator, or indoor plumbing. Nor were there any tractors or combines to do the farming. All the work was done with horses. And there was no market nearby. Everything was homegrown. Bread, vegetables, meat. Milk came from their cows. Gordy always tagged along behind Larry, the most daring of the four Cox brothers, the one who always rode his horse at a full gallop. His two younger brothers, Willie and Don, were talkative and adventuresome. Gordy was the only one who wasn't a daredevil. He was shy and afraid of just about everything. When visitors came to the house, he hid under the dining room table. At school, he wouldn't meet the teacher's eyes, and on the playground, he walked away from confrontations. To get to school three miles away, Gordy rode with Larry on a family horse, holding on for dear life as Larry did his best to scare him flying through fields at full speed. Sometimes on the way home, Larry detoured by the two-bar ranch, daring Gordy to try riding one of the owner's sheep. He told him that that was how all the great rodeo cowboys at the Calgary Stampede had gotten started. Eventually, Gordy asked for a horse of his own. There's a depression on, son, his father told him. 
There's no money. A few weeks later, a man stopped by the farm trying to sell a little white pony that was half Shetland. Gordy's father offered the man ten bushels of oats in trade, and he accepted. Gordy named the horse Weasel because he liked watching weasels on the farm sneak up behind jackrabbits and kill them. Weasel had previously been a workhorse, pulling coal cars in the mines. He had an ornery streak that made it tough on Gordy at first. Short-winded from his work in the mines, he had a bad habit of ducking sideways and sending Gordy flying whenever he got tired. After a while, Gordy figured out Weasel's tricks, and they got along fine. He rode him to school almost every day, stabling him in the barn the school kept for the kids' horses. At lunch, he came out and fed him half his sandwich. During the winter, he hitched him to a sleigh and rode across the snow-covered fields. In the spring, he rode him to the south slope of the hill behind the house. Weasel would graze on the grass, and Gordy would stretch out on his back in a field of crocuses and daydream, the clouds billowing across the sky. At the age of ten, Gordy decided he had to have a violin. Never mind that he'd never played one, or that his parents had no money. As luck would have it, his mother spotted a contest in a magazine. Anybody selling ten dollars' worth of gold medal garden seed could win a new violin. The odds were against him. First, he'd have to write away to get the seeds, no easy task for Gordy, and then he'd have to sell them. It was 1933, smack dab in the middle of the Depression, and the neighbors who might be his customers were also struggling to get by not to mention that some of them lived twenty miles away and the Coxes had no car. Still, his mother encouraged him to try. Nellie Cox was the spiritual backbone of the family. Not that she was religious. Occasionally she read the Bible, but going to church was never part of the family routine. Besides, the nearest church was a dusty ten-mile ride away. Nellie preferred spending what little spare time she had reading to her four boys, often from the classics. She'd only completed the eighth grade, but everyone knew how smart she was. Whenever the teacher at the children's school was sick, she stepped in to substitute. At home, she never stopped working. She baked bread three times a week, boiled water collected in rain barrels behind the house on the wood-fired stove for washing and baths, cleaned the family's clothes on a scrub board, sewed clothes, darned socks, canned vegetables, made butter, nursed wounds. And she did it all with no electricity, refrigeration, or running water. She loved to ride her horse, Dexter, and once every six months she hitched him up to the buggy to make a trip into Wayne to buy supplies. With his mother's help, Gordy sent away for a full order of seeds, and then he set out on Weasel to sell them. He was gone all day, traveling round trip fifty miles. Not many people had the cash on hand to pay him. I can come back, he offered. Two weeks later, he rode back to collect. Some had the money, some didn't. Steadily, he neared his goal. If and when he earned his violin, he didn't aspire to play in a symphony or even a school orchestra. He just wanted to be able to accompany his mother, who loved to sing at family gatherings. Those were always special times. Aunts, uncles, and cousins singing, playing the fiddle, reading poetry, dancing. It didn't matter that Gordy had two left feet on the dance floor. He was, however, good at getting his chores done around the farm. He and his brothers were not yet teenagers, but they were expected to shoulder their share of the workload. Gordy milked the cows morning and night, shoveled hay, carried water from the well to the house, and hauled wood. It took three months, but he finally sold his full order of seeds and collected the money from the neighbors. He sent it all in, and a month later his shiny new violin arrived in the mail. Now all he had to do was learn to play it. Gordy's dad, Julian, nicknamed Shorty, was a slender five feet seven inches. He was a man of few words, but a hard-working farmer, out in the fields from dawn to dusk, fighting a losing battle against the depression and falling wheat prices. A drought added to the struggle, wiping out his entire crop. He replanted it, but a wicked wind lifted the soil off the seed grains and they blew away. The wind blew the dust so hard that Nellie had to light lamps in the house in the middle of the day. Dirt blew in under the doors and through the window frames. She stuffed rags in the cracks, but still the dust swirled inside. In winter, snow blew into the house. 
Outside, snowdrifts piled so high around the barn and corral that Gordy rode weasel right over the tops of the fences. To provide food for his family, Julian took a job working in the Red Deer coal mine in Wayne, ten miles from the farm. He hoped it would be temporary, but in the meantime he moved the family into town. All six of them lived in a one-room shack with no electricity, running water, heat, or even an outhouse. Nellie hung a sheet across the room to divide the space and cooked atop a coal-fueled heating stove. It was Gordy's job to walk the railroad tracks with a bucket every day and pick up lumps of coal that had fallen off the trains. Because so many farmers and ranchers had moved into town looking for work in the mine, Wayne had become a boom town, its population swelling to 3,000. Located in the heart of the Alberta Badlands, an area known to hold one of the richest dinosaur fossil beds in the world, it was a forbidding landscape. Summers were scorching hot, winter temperatures were way below zero. The gathering place in town was the Rose Deer Hotel, home of the Last Chance Saloon, where miners went after work to drink and play poker. But not Gordy's father. He wasn't much of a drinker, and he'd learned long ago that he was a lousy poker player. He continued to hope that he and the family would return to the farm. But any hope he'd had of returning was lost when the cows he'd left on the farm with a caretaker were stolen. Adding to his frustration, work at the mine slowed down and Julian was laid off. Now there was no money, no work, no cows, and no crops, not even a garden. About to lose the farm, he sold the property, took what little profit he made, packed up the family's meager belongings, including the farm equipment and weasel, and moved the family 200 miles north to Collinton. Located 90 miles north of Edmonton, it is a picturesque area known as the gateway to the great north country. The family found a small farm to rent with a run-down old house topped by a leaky roof. Now, instead of sweeping up dirt and dust, they mopped up the puddles from the rain and battled the frigid winter when the temperature dropped to 30 below and stayed there for months. On one occasion, it plummeted all the way to 72 below. For entertainment, Gordy sometimes tried playing his violin, but being tone-deaf didn't help. Mostly he played with his brothers. The neighbors had children, but the days were short, with little time for anything besides school and chores. Gordy's main responsibility was helping his brother Larry gather and cut wood. He continued to flounder in school. After years of struggling to make a go of farming in northern Alberta, and tired of the cold and isolation, Julian decided to move the family again, this time to Yakima, Washington. He'd heard there was work there. Before moving, he held an auction to sell off all of the farm equipment and animals, including Weasel. Gordy pleaded to keep him. His dad said no. As Weasel was led away, Gordy ran after him, tears streaming down his face, giving him one last hug around the neck. The next day, the family boarded a train south stopping in Calgary to visit relatives. Gordy was in the seventh grade, but it was his first time in a big city. He'd never experienced a house with a flush toilet or bread that wasn't home-baked. Larry coaxed him to go downtown with him. A prostitute approached, beckoning them down an alley. Gordy turned and ran home. He wondered if America would be so perplexing. In early June 1937, Gordy Cox crossed the border into the United States in the back seat of the 1928 Pontiac his dad had bought for the trip. It was Gordy's first time in a car. Yakima, named after the Indian tribe and located in a verdant valley in south-central Washington, 145 miles southeast of Seattle, was a leading agricultural center known for its fruit. With a population of almost 10,000, it seemed huge to Gordy. It even had an electric streetcar. But it didn't have any jobs. Soon after arriving, the whole family went to work outside the city limits picking fruit. The Depression was still on, and hundreds of families had come to the Yakima Valley, many of them farm owners and businessmen displaced by the Dust Bowl in the Midwest. Most of them lived in a large transient labor camp south of town and were treated as lower class by the Yakima townsfolk, who referred to them as Okies including the Coxes. Working alongside his parents and brothers, 
Gordy spent his first months in America picking apples, pears, strawberries, cherries, apricots, and peaches. The only fruits he'd seen in Canada were the sweet purplish-black Saskatoons and choke cherries that grew wild on the prairie, and it didn't take long for him to develop a dislike for the fruit he picked. At night he slept in a tent with his parents, or outside under the stars with his brothers, enduring wind, rain, and noise from the other migrant workers. Working together, the family made less than $100 a month. In September, just as school was starting, Gordy's dad got hired as an irrigator for a farmer living in Natchez Heights, 20 miles north of Yakima. The job paid $100 a month and came with an old house that had more conveniences than any place they'd lived, cold running water and electricity, a single bulb hanging in each room. To Gordy, now enrolled in the eighth grade at Marcus Whitman School, it felt like the Ritz. But at school he felt isolated from the other students, who were better off. Sometimes they called him Oki. He ignored them, choosing to stay mainly to himself. In time his dad lost his job and the family moved again, this time into a house in Yakima, and Julian went back to work picking fruit with the migrant workers. Entering high school, Gordy wore the same clothes he'd worn in the sixth grade. Gordy looked smooth in his new skates, gliding across the ice at Yakima Ice Rink, the only person left in the arena. This was his favorite time of the evening. He loved the quiet. It was his job to lock up the rink, and most nights he would skate for a few minutes before heading home, gliding effortlessly from end to end of the rink. He was dreading tomorrow at school. As captain of the school's hockey team, he was supposed to say a few words about the team at the school's sports assembly, but the thought of standing up and speaking before the whole student body terrified him. Now a junior, he'd done his best to pass unnoticed through Yakima High. He still had trouble reading and was barely passing his classes. He'd taken violin lessons, but without much success, and the violin was now stored away in a closet. Mostly he kept to himself, and as for girls, he'd never had a date. Even the thought of talking to the opposite sex made him nervous. His high school calling card, if he had one, was as the right winger for the hockey team. At five feet five inches, 130 pounds, he wasn't the best or toughest player on the squad. He did his best to avoid the contact and hitting, but he was the best skater, helped by his job at the rink. Skating gave him confidence, whereas in other sports he felt awkward and intimidated. He finished locking up the rink, then rode his new Schwinn home. His old bicycle had been stolen, and he had had to buy a new one to make his deliveries on his morning paper route. For a year now, he'd been delivering the Oregonian on the hilly west side of town, struggling out of bed at 5 a.m., an especially hard task on the mornings after he'd worked late at the skating rink. On the positive side, his two jobs provided him with the money to buy his bike, new skates, and movie tickets. A week earlier, he'd splurged on a black cowboy hat, just like the one Hopalong Cassidy wore. He was able to indulge himself because his dad was now working as a road builder for the WPA, and his brother Larry, who'd dropped out of school after the move from Canada, was now sending half his paycheck home each month from his job with the CCC. Arriving home at midnight, Gordy went to his room and pulled out his school books. As he tried to read his history assignment, his eyes grew heavy. Some days it was all he could do to keep his eyes open in class. He finished the first page, then realized he didn't remember anything he'd just read. It was this way almost every night, a struggle not only to stay awake, but to make sense of the words. It bothered him that other kids came to class every morning with their homework neatly done and an understanding of the material. He knew he was trying, but he was just slow. His mom still blamed it on being kicked in the head by the horse. He awoke the next morning, still terrified at the thought of going before the whole student body. He thought of calling in sick, but that would mean not getting to play in the game. He rolled out of bed, delivered the newspapers, then rode to school. By the time the assembly finally began, he felt the sweat rolling down his back and his mouth had turned dry. He had not written out what he was going to say because he thought it would be even more embarrassing if he got up there and couldn't read his own words. As the student body cheered the concluding remarks from the captain of the football team, 
Gordy turned to a teammate. I can't do it, he blurted, then stood up and bolted out of the gym, leaving his surprised teammate to talk to the student body. Later at practice, his teammates and coach didn't mention the episode. They didn't need to. Gordy had dealt himself another blow to his self-esteem, which was already in the basement. It was late 1940, and the idea of dropping out of school and joining the Navy seemed like a good plan to Gordy. His brother Larry had joined the Army right out of the CCC, and his letters home talked about all the new friends he'd made and places he'd visited. But there were a couple of big obstacles. One was passing the physical. Gordy had recently started wearing glasses, and that worried him. The other problem was that he was only seventeen and would need his parents' approval. He doubted he'd get it, especially from his mom, but it was worth a shot. During the previous year, he'd gleaned a vague understanding of the growing threat of war from reading the headlines every morning as he folded the newspapers, but that all seemed remote and unconnected to his world. Besides, he'd heard his father talking about how FDR was promising that America wouldn't get involved. What was real to him was that he was flunking English class. He had a book report due on Silas Marner, but he hadn't been able to get past the first few pages of the book. He'd all but given up on school. He presented his case to his parents. As he'd expected, his dad approved, but his mother insisted he finish high school. Over the next couple of weeks, he continued to plead with her. Finally, convinced that he wasn't going to finish school anyway, she relented. Now all that stood in his way was passing the physical and proving his U.S. citizenship. He needed to get a hold of his birth certificate, which showed that even though he had been born in Canada, his parents were American citizens, which made him one too. It took several weeks, but he finally got the proof. And to his surprise, he passed the Navy physical including the eye exam. In January 1941, Gordy Cox boarded a train in Seattle on his way to boot camp in San Diego, California. The thought of serving on a submarine had not crossed his mind. Part 2. Submariners. 5. Chuck Vervalen, USS Gudgeon. Standing with his sailor buddies outside the whorehouse on Hotel Street in Honolulu, Chuck was having second thoughts. Sure, he wanted to lose his cherry. He was nineteen, and if his buddies were to be believed, he was the last of the virgins. But this didn't feel like the way to go. It was March 1941, and Chuck was stationed on the USS Maryland, a battleship that had recently, along with the rest of the Pacific Fleet, shifted its base from a west coast port to Pearl Harbor as a deterrent to Japanese expansion. Chuck hadn't really given much thought to why the fleet moved. He was just happy to be in the Navy and traveling to new and exciting places. His three months in boot camp at Newport, Rhode Island, had been easy for him, thanks in large part to his experience in the CCC. He was used to discipline and regimentation. He loved the food and, not surprisingly, scored well on the rifle range, getting assigned as an anti-aircraft machine gunner. After boot camp, his whole company was assigned to the Maryland, including his new best friend, Wesley Strevis, whom he'd met on the train to boot camp from Buffalo. Strevis had attended Cornell for a year, and to Chuck he seemed so much smarter than his friends back home. After boot camp, they'd traveled together to Long Beach, California, and when they arrived there, Chuck was wide-eyed at the fragrant orange groves around every other corner, the hundred-foot-high palm trees, and the abundance of long-legged Southern California blondes. It was shortly after arriving in Pearl Harbor aboard the Maryland that Chuck applied for submarine service. Part of the appeal was money. Submariners made $20 more a month than the sailors of the regular fleet and would double their pay in war. He'd seen submariners on the deck of their ships, and they seemed more relaxed. Whenever the crew of the Maryland was topside, they had to wear dress blues and have boots, belt buckles, and buttons polished perfectly. Not so with the submariners. They wore dungarees and t-shirts. Plus, they had a reputation as elite crews. Chuck didn't think of himself as elite, but still, it was worth a shot. The line of sailors waiting to get inside the whorehouse on Hotel Street snaked halfway down the block. Many of the men had been drinking beer and cheap rum. 
The bars, such as Two Jacks and the Trade Wind, maintained a four drinks per person limit, usually serving all four drinks at once to encourage the men to guzzle and move on, a policy that made for a lot of quick drunks. Chuck didn't stop in any of the bars. Other than a few sips of hard cider in high school and a couple of swigs of rotgut wine back in Buffalo, he didn't imbibe. And as for girls, he'd never come close to going all the way. There'd been a few kisses with Irene, the girl back home, but she'd moved out of town. She'd written several times and even promised to wait for him, but he wasn't counting on it. Edging closer to the front of the line, he wished now he'd never confessed that he was a virgin. His buddies had made it their mission to get him initiated, and there was no shortage of brothels on Hotel Street to provide the opportunity. Located on the edge of Honolulu's Chinatown, it was the city's vice district, where men came to get drunk, tattooed, and laid. There were fifteen brothels, run-down places with names like the Senator Hotel or Bronx Room. Chuck was headed to the Rainbow Hotel. Prostitution in Honolulu in 1941 was big business. As it was stateside, it was illegal, but police and government officials looked the other way. Honolulu officials reasoned that with so many young servicemen full of raging testosterone, they couldn't fight nature and figured it was better that these men sought release from prostitutes than from the respectable young women of Hawaii. It was also a way to keep venereal diseases somewhat under control. The 250 registered prostitutes were required to have weekly checkups. They also had to pay taxes and a $1 yearly license fee as entertainers. Many of the prostitutes had followed the fleet from San Diego and Long Beach and San Francisco. Some serviced as many as 100 men a day, and because they got to keep $2 of the $3 fee, they could make up to $50,000 a year. With most of the Pacific fleet now stationed at Pearl, there were long lines day and night on the narrow sidewalks of Hotel Street. Sometimes the wait could last three hours. It was estimated that as many as 30,000 Marines, sailors, and soldiers visited the Vice District daily. Soon Chuck was at the door, then up the stairs to the second floor where he was greeted at a makeshift booth by the madam, a short Chinese woman. A sign on the side of the booth said, No Coloreds. Although Honolulu was a racially mixed city, and only 24% of the population were white, most madams ran segregated brothels to avoid racial conflict. Navy officials had advised government officials that their officers and enlisted men, almost all white, would not frequent brothels where coloreds were served. That'll be three dollars, said the madam. Chuck thought about walking away, but with several of his shipmates in line behind him, he knew that wasn't possible. He paid, then took a seat on a bench alongside other sailors waiting their turn. They smelled of liquor and cigarettes. Like all the other brothels in town, the Rainbow Hotel was set up like an assembly line, one room where the customer was greeted and the fee collected, another room for the men to get undressed, another room for the event, and another room for putting clothes back on. On Hotel Street, time was money. The madam finally motioned for him to enter the next room. Nervously, he opened the door. The room was divided by a flimsy piece of plywood that didn't go all the way to the ceiling or to the end of one wall. His side of the room was bare except for a wash basin. Slowly he undressed, leaving his underwear on. On the other side of the plywood he could hear a prostitute and a sailor having sex. It didn't last long. He heard a door on the other side of the plywood open. A voice summoned him to walk around the divider. Bring your clothes with you, she said. He walked around the partition and looked briefly at the prostitute. She was a brunette, and at first glance she seemed attractive, young, tired. She was naked. What's your name? she asked, barely looking at him. Chuck, he answered. He moved toward the end of the cot, embarrassed to let his eyes wash over her. She moved next to him and sat down her leg against his, her hand resting on his thigh. So what's it going to be? Straight up? He hesitated, trying to muster the courage to make his request, furtively letting his eyes wander over her body. He decided he might as well ask. The worst that could happen was that she'd say no. 
but before he could speak, she leaned forward and took an alarm clock off of a stand next to the cot and started to wind it. What's that? he asked. A clock, she replied. You got three minutes. This may sound strange to you, he stammered. But what I'd really like is to just talk with you. Just talk, she echoed. That's it? Actually, there's something else, he added. When you see the next guy, my friend, would you tell him that we did it? You know, had sex? She regarded him skeptically. I mean, I'll pay you a dollar extra, he assured her. She studied him for a moment, then smiled. Sure, whatever you want, she said. Three minutes later, he emerged from the room and passed back through the waiting area, greeted by his crewmates like he'd just run back a kickoff a hundred yards. All right, Chucky boy, welcome to the club. To his surprise, Chuck was accepted into Naval Submarine School. It was located at the base in New London, Connecticut, which had been built to accommodate the buildup in the submarine force. He was apprehensive about the school's reputation for being a tough program with lots of studying, but he also felt a sense of pride about joining such an elite branch of the Navy. As soon as he arrived on base, Chuck felt comfortable, even with the classwork. He tested especially well in mechanics and enjoyed the calisthenics and marching. He met with physicians, psychologists, and senior officers who poked and probed to find out if he was physically healthy, emotionally stable, and temperamentally capable of getting along well with other men during long periods of close confinement when nobody but the skipper or lookouts would see sun or stars or smell air untainted by fumes from diesel fuel. But to Chuck, submarine service evoked a greater sense of fraternity as well as a higher sense of purpose than did being part of the surface fleet. It was early 1941, and the pro-Navy leadership in Washington, D.C., FDR had served as undersecretary to the Navy, was providing more money to build up the fleet, including submarines. In World War I, U.S. sub-forces had been next to worthless, accounting for zero sinkings of enemy ships. Zero. But since 1930, the sub-fleet had grown substantially in size and prestige. In 1936, $238 million had been allocated for construction of new ships of all designs, three aircraft carriers, seven battleships, 11 cruisers, 108 destroyers, and 26 new subs, and these ships were now either newly commissioned or soon to be. The new subs were attracting a younger group of officers who saw the chance for an earlier command. Prior to the construction of these new vessels, U.S. subs had always been considered a defensive weapon, assigned primarily to coastal defenses, Manila, Hawaii, and the east and west coasts. To take on a bigger, more offensive role, they needed to be capable of long-range missions, which would mean more fuel capacity. In order to keep up with the fleet's surface ships, whose top speed was 17 knots, the new ships had a new, lightweight, high-performance diesel engine developed by private enterprise. They could dive within 60 seconds, and most had eight torpedo tubes, four forward and four aft. All had three-inch deck guns, and each had four engines turned by a generator. The commander could use two engines for cruising and two for charging batteries, or four for running at maximum speed. The new submarines also had more powerful batteries that would allow a submerged sub to run at two knots for 48 hours, or at maximum submerged speed of five knots for one hour. At 300 feet in length, they gave the crew more elbow room for long cruises. They would be the backbone of the Pacific submarine fleet by December 1941. Chuck graduated fifth in his class of 80 at submarine school and was assigned to the newly commissioned USS Gudgeon on the West Coast, a ship soon to join the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. He was happy to be going back to Hawaii. He would liked it when he'd been there several months earlier aboard the Maryland. Graduation from subschool and assignment to the Gudgeon did not mean the end of his studies, however. As with all new submariners assigned to a ship, Chuck's main course of study would become the ship itself. He would be required to know every valve, pipe, gauge, switch, or hatch 
as well as draw accurate diagrams of the more than 30 main systems in the sub. Not only would he have to know his own specialty, he was assigned as a diesel mechanic, but he also needed to know the duties of a torpedo man, an electrician, and all the other jobs on the ship. Only when Chuck could convince his section chief and the skipper that he knew the material would he be qualified and win his Silver Dolphin insignia. He would be joining a submarine force wedded to an antiquated strategy named Plan Orange, designed after the defeat of Germany in World War I. Japan was viewed as the biggest naval threat to America, especially after the Japanese began advocating expansionism and the conquest of China. Over the years, the Japanese Navy had steadily grown, and as part of the treaty ending World War I, Japan had been awarded the Marianas, less Guam, Carolinas, and Marshalls. These islands, if developed as naval bases, would cut off U.S. lines to the Philippines and would enhance the power and mobility of the Japanese fleet. Plan Orange assumed an initial Japanese attack would come on the Philippines, America's most vulnerable area. To prevent this, the plan was for a small army garrison and the Asiatic fleet to hold them off until the Pacific fleet could sail to the rescue from Pacific waters, including Pearl Harbor. Plan Orange dominated all U.S. naval planning and thinking. In 1940, the U.S. naval forces in the Pacific had been divided into two fleets, the Asiatic, which guarded the Philippines, and the Pacific, based in Pearl Harbor. When Japanese troops moved into Indochina to build air bases, U.S. naval officers were convinced that war with Japan was inevitable. By October 1941, the number of submarines in the Asiatic fleet had been increased to 29 out of a total of 50, leaving the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor seriously depleted. Rear Admiral Thomas Withers was in charge of the Pearl Harbor fleet, and on paper he had 21 subs, but in November 1941, only 10 were actually in the harbor. Most of the rest were at Mare Island in California for repairs. The Gudgeon, with Chuck now on board, was one of the ships in Hawaii. In Japan, Prime Minister Tojo had made the decision to widen the war beyond his nation's expansion into China, with plans to invade the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, and the Malay Peninsula, as well as Thailand and Java for their rich oil deposits. To accomplish this, a key strategy was the total destruction of U.S. naval forces in the Pacific. The first target would be the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor. If it could be destroyed in a single strike, the U.S. Navy could not recover in time to mount a counteroffensive. It was 7 a.m. Sunday morning, December 7, 1941. In the waters just outside Pearl Harbor sat five U.S. submarines, including the USS Gudgeon. For the past two days, the Gudgeon had been practicing firing dummy torpedoes. The Navy brass were concerned about the performance and accuracy of their new Mark 14 torpedoes. The entire Pacific fleet was on high alert due to the growing threat of a military strike by Japan. Wearing only his dungarees, Chuck readied himself for the day. Walking across the deck, he whistled Elmer's Tune, a song stuck in his head ever since he'd heard it the night before on the Lucky Strike hit parade on Armed Services Radio. He'd spent Saturday night studying the sub's electrical system so he could pass that part of his qualifying test. At 8 o'clock, the ship's Sunday morning calm was disrupted by an announcement over the PA system. Now hear this. Now hear this. This is the captain speaking. Pearl Harbor is under attack. There are air raids on Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Prepare to dive. Chuck wasn't sure what to think, but an attack on Pearl Harbor seemed too far-fetched to believe. The gudgeon, with the normal complement of five officers and fifty-five enlisted men on board, submerged, staying under the surface for most of the next twenty-four hours. The next morning... December 8th, they were ordered to return to Pearl Harbor and arrived that afternoon. Chuck stood on the deck, unprepared for the devastation he saw. The water in the harbor coated with oil, half-sunken ships still burning, bandaged men lying everywhere, and the smell, the horrible smell, 
a mix of smoke, oil, and burned flesh. On one of the burning ships, he saw a man crawling out of a porthole with torn skin hanging from his arms. Everywhere there were medics and men being carried away on stretchers. Chuck scanned the skies over the valley to the east, looking for enemy planes to come sweeping down again. He glanced at Battleship Row, or what was left of it, looking for his old ship, the Maryland. Moored next to the USS Oklahoma, it was spared the direct torpedo hit that sunk the Oklahoma and killed hundreds of men. The gudgeon docked at the sub-base and the crew went ashore to await orders. Word spread that FDR had declared war. Let's go into Pearl City tonight and kill some fucking Japs, someone shouted. With everyone restricted to base, that wouldn't happen. The next day, the gudgeon crew began loading torpedoes and supplies. They were going to war. On December 11, 1941, Chuck was at his station below deck as the gudgeon slid past the still smoldering ruins of Battleship Row and out into the open waters of the Pacific. Plan Orange had already been abandoned. The sub-commanders were now under new orders to do whatever was necessary to disrupt Japanese naval forces until America's fleet could regain its strength. Like the rest of the crew, including the officers, Chuck didn't know where they were headed. He did know, however, that the Gudgeon was the first U.S. warship to head off on an offensive strike against Imperial Japan in this new war. Among the men there was a sense of fear, but even more than that, the mood was revenge. Almost everyone on board had lost a friend in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Four of Chuck's ex-crewmates on the Maryland had been killed. A day into the voyage, 38-year-old Lieutenant Commander Joe Grenfell, a 1926 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, opened the ship's orders. Their destination was Bungo Suido, the southern entrance to Japan's inland sea. The gudgeon, alone and unprotected, was going right smack at the enemy's homeland. Chuck had mixed feelings. On the one hand, he was proud to be taking it right to the bastards who did that to our men and ships at Pearl Harbor. He had boundless faith in Grenfell and the other officers. But he was also scared. Would they run into the Japanese fleet that had carried the planes to the raid on Pearl? Did the Japanese have secret anti-sub weapons that nobody knew about? What if the enemy was tracking the gudgeon's every movement? Was the gudgeon mechanically capable of what might be a two-month trip? What if he wasn't psychologically strong enough to endure the journey? Adding to his level of apprehension was the fact that the ship had been ordered to adhere to strict radio silence. With the attack on Pearl Harbor, the rules of combat had changed. The London Naval Treaty, a pact the United States had signed following World War I that authorized submarines to strike only enemy warships and merchant vessels escorted by warships, was no longer in effect. Late in the day on December 7th, the Navy Department had issued the order, execute unrestricted air and naval warfare against Japan. That meant every ship was now a target. Adding to the anxiety, there was a critical shortage of torpedoes available at Pearl Harbor, with no sign that production could increase fast enough to solve the problem. The order was to use no more than two torpedoes when shooting at a merchant ship. By the third day of the voyage, Chuck and the rest of the crew had settled into a routine. He stood watch, four hours on, eight hours off, and slept in the enlisted men's crowded bunk space in the aft torpedo storage space. On watch, he tended to the diesel engines, making sure they were performing properly, the strong smell of diesel fumes a constant. Most of his free time he spent studying so he could pass his qualifying tests. What little time he had left, he joined friends in playing poker and drinking coffee in the crew's mess. Others played cribbage or acey Ducey, but he stuck to poker, five-card draw and seven-card stud. He loved the rush of gambling, even if he was at risk of losing a week's pay in one sitting. One week passed at sea for the gudgeon, then a second, the journey proceeding slowly, tediously, and, as ordered, cautiously. Grenfell was under orders to run submerged in daylight as soon as they got to within 500 miles of the Japanese coast, but he did so at 1,000 miles. At night, he ran on one engine to conserve fuel. One night, while playing cards, Chuck noticed a mild pain in his side. 
He dismissed it as a strain he'd gotten while loading supplies onto the ship. In the morning, the pain was still there, up under his ribs. After living with the pain for several days, he went to see Doc. Each submarine had a pharmacist's mate, or Doc, as he was called by the crew, and it was his duty to keep the crew as healthy as possible. Usually the extent of the training given these men consisted of first aid awareness and a rudimentary understanding of commonly prescribed painkillers and antibiotics. Beyond that, they mostly winged it. Stories abounded of pharmacists' mates heroically performing emergency surgeries with knives and spoons from the mess kitchen. After a brief examination, Chuck was ordered to his bunk and given an ice pack to keep on his side. I'm not sure what it is, Doc said. It could be your appendix. Chuck knew that if the pain was caused by his appendix, he could be in serious trouble. It didn't help when he overheard the pharmacist's mate tell an officer that he'd be a goner if that thing bursts. Chuck pressed the ice bag tight to his side. He also knew that the ship was entering Japanese waters and was likely to encounter the enemy soon. The last place he wanted to be when the action started was confined to his bunk. Over the next twenty-four hours, the pain worsened, especially when he tried to take a deep breath. It was Christmas Day. On January 2, 1942, twenty-one days after leaving Pearl Harbor, the gudgeon arrived at Bungo Suido. They were close enough to land that they could see navigational beacons ashore and sampans with running lights. The pain in Chuck's side had disappeared as mysteriously as it had begun, and he had been told by the pharmacist's mate to have it examined by a doctor upon returning to Pearl. Now he was just scared. He was in a metal tube under the ocean, thousands of miles from his home in New York, a place he might never see again. It didn't take long for Grenfell to spot a small coastal freighter. He closed to within 2,600 yards. As later reported, torpedoes were readied for firing and the necessary calculations were hastily taken. A new guidance system had been installed in U.S. subs. It received data from the periscope, or sonar, on the enemy's bearing, range, speed, and angle on the bow, and then was supposed to automatically plot the course of the target relative to the course of the submarine, computing and setting the proper gyro angle in the torpedo to intercept it. But to obtain an accurate range estimate, the captain had to calculate the height of the target's mast then extrapolate from the horizontal lines in the periscope's crosshairs using a slide rule. At the same time that Grenfell was sorting out this data, he had to keep sweeping around the horizon for enemy escorts and aircraft. In peacetime, U.S. subs had trained primarily with destroyers with known masthead heights, but now the target ships would have unknown masthead heights, and in most cases these ships would be zigzagging. These zigs and zags had to be considered. Another potential problem was the torpedo spread, how to space the firing so as to score hits. In practice, three torpedoes were fired, one forward of the bow, one at the middle, and one astern. The spread compensated for errors in speed estimates or changes in the target's speed. But because they were under orders to fire two rather than three shots at merchant ships, the spread technique had to be revised requiring a higher degree of accuracy in estimating speed and range, but also the length of the target ship. All this was being done in the heat of battle. In addition, the captain had to be calculating his ship's escape route immediately after firing in case an escort ship chased down the torpedo's bubbles. This required that the sub dive neither too steeply, which could structurally endanger the ship, nor too shallow, which would leave the shears, external housing and support for the ship's periscope, exposed and make them vulnerable to counterattack. But the biggest problem facing the gudgeon, as well as all American subs at the onset of the war, was the growing concern that these subs were equipped with defective torpedoes. In pre-war testing, these Mark 14 torpedoes, the only ones the United States had produced, either had run too deep or their Mark VI magnetic exploders had not detonated. By design, a trigger in the Mark VI allowed the torpedo to explode at a distance beneath a ship, where it had no armor. When this explosion reached the hull, it would cause catastrophic failure to the keel. Following a perfect approach by the gudgeon, the small coastal freighter was dead center in the crosshairs. Fire Torpedo 1 
Fire Torpedo 2, ordered Grenfell. Everybody on board waited for the explosion. Nothing. The gudgeon escaped, but now the real possibility existed that they were deep in hostile waters armed with useless torpedoes. After almost two weeks of patrolling near Bungo Suido, the gudgeon started the trip back to Pearl Harbor, Captain Grenfell surprised that they had gone over a week without spotting anything despite patrolling in a busy shipping lane. But shortly after turning for home, they encountered another freighter, this one estimated at 5,000 tons. It was night, and the gudgeon was on the surface recharging its batteries. Grenfell maneuvered to within 2,500 yards, and despite orders not to fire more than two torpedoes at merchant ships, he fired three. From his place in the hull, Chuck felt the shock of an explosion. As the gudgeon fled the area, everyone on board shared in the jubilation of believing that they had sunk their first ship and that their torpedoes weren't ineffective after all. Like everyone else on board, Chuck felt relieved to be returning to Pearl Harbor. They'd been gone over six weeks, six weeks of unrelenting tension. Rumor had it that the whole crew would be housed at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, what a treat after the cramped and foul-smelling quarters of the submarine. Fresh air, good food, big beds, and who knew, maybe even a woman. The sense of relief was short-lived. On January 24th, the gudgeon received a coded message that three Japanese submarines were headed in their direction. The tracking of Japanese submarines by naval code breakers had been made a high priority after December 7th. As later confirmed, Japanese submariners were irresponsibly chatty, communicating almost daily to their commanders or home base in a code that was easy for the Americans to decipher. The three subs for which the gudgeon now lay in wait had brazenly been patrolling off the California coast, firing a few shells into a refinery near San Pedro that did no damage but caused great fear with the citizens of Southern California. This alerted Navy intelligence, which began tracking the subs, their job simplified by the sub's frequent radio transmissions as they proceeded on a great circular route back to their base in Kwajalein. Perhaps emboldened by sneaking so close to the California shoreline, the subs also fired a few shells onto Midway Island as they passed, further betraying their position. At 9 a.m. on January 27th, just as projected, one of the subs crossed the path of the submerged gudgeon. Spotting it through the periscope, Grenfell was dumbfounded. Look at this, he said. They're coming along fat, dumb, and happy. They're not even zigzagging. The men are lounging on the deck, sunbathing, and smoking. Grenfell ordered battle stations, then fired three torpedoes from the bow tubes. Eighty-one seconds later, he heard a dull explosion. Not positive if they'd scored a direct hit, Grenfell cautiously brought his ship closer to the surface. There was no submarine in sight, no propeller sounds or sonar. It's not known for sure if the torpedoes worked. There is speculation that I-173 tried to dive but forgot to close its hatches, thus flooding the ship. In any case, the submarine disappeared from radio traffic forever, making it the first major Japanese warship sunk in World War II. Chuck's reaction surprised him. He expected to feel a sense of revenge, and in fact, he'd shouted and raised his fist in triumph when he heard the explosion, until he visualized the Japanese crew in their control room, doing the same job he did. Surely they must have heard the swishing sound of the torpedo approaching, and surely for an instant before the explosion they knew what was about to happen. Rationally, he knew they were the enemy and needed to be eliminated. Still, it bothered him. 6. Bob Palmer, USS Tuna When Bob dropped out of Medford High to join the Navy in September 1939, just before Germany invaded Poland, it was not for duty and country. He wanted to get away from his stepmother, Cora, and from the pain of the breakup with his sweetheart, Barbara Kohler. Initially, Bob thought joining the Navy was the greatest thing that had ever happened to him. At boot camp in San Diego, California, he loved everything about it, the playing of taps in the evening, the colors, saluting the flag, and even all the marching on the grinder, 
which is what the recruits called the marching compound. Sometimes in the morning when they raised the flag and played reveille, he'd feel so much pride that he got tears in his eyes. For the first time in his life, he felt he belonged. He liked the simplicity and regimented routine. His life had purpose. But by the time he finished boot camp, he was beginning to have doubts, thinking the only skills he'd really learned were how to march and how to peel potatoes. When he was assigned to the USS Wright, an aging World War I mothership to seaplanes, he had hopes of working as an airplane mechanic. But in the three months he'd been at Pearl Harbor, all he'd done was scrape paint from the hull of the old ship. About the only thing he felt good about was all the letters he'd written home for his crewmates. It surprised him how many of them didn't know how to write. Then one day, the ship's executive officer asked if anyone on the crew could type. Bob was the only person who raised his hand. In his junior year, he'd taken a typing class, thinking it might be a good way to meet girls. The officer instructed him to step forward. You just volunteered, he said. The next day, Bob reported to the USS Tuna, a submarine, and was assigned to be the man in charge of clerical duties, the ship's yeoman, or as crewmates often called the position, first pussy. And that's how he became a submariner. Bob quickly regained the sense of purpose he'd initially felt when he joined the Navy. He liked his crewmates on the tuna. What struck him most about this crew, as compared with that of the right, was how much smarter the men seemed. They could all read and write, and they were good at mechanical and engineering problems. Plus, there was a camaraderie and togetherness that he hadn't felt before. It wasn't something the crew talked about, it was just there. He admitted, however, to being nervous on his first training dive. It was his first time aboard a sub. The ship plunged downward at a steep angle, and there was a lot of clanging and banging, the sound of rushing air, and the sight of men furiously spinning valves. It was the noises that scared him most. As the ship's yeoman, he had the sense that he was just along for the ride, a reluctant passenger on a scary ride at an amusement park. He felt the ship throb, almost like it was groaning. He held on to the desk in his little cubbyhole of an office, hoping everyone else on board was too busy to notice how scared he was. In the weeks ahead, he got progressively less frightened with each dive, but he was never completely at ease. Bob couldn't believe his good luck. It was October 1941, and when the tuna got sent to Mare Island near San Francisco for repairs, he found out that Barbara was now working as a secretary for an insurance company in San Francisco. She had dropped out of the University of Oregon after a year and was living in a cramped studio apartment on Pine Street with her cousin Margie and Aunt Fern. He wasted no time in calling her, and to his great joy, she agreed to go out on a date with him. That first date didn't go quite as he'd planned. The day before he was supposed to meet her, he forged an officer's signature on a weekend pass for a shipmate and got caught. Sentenced to a week in the brig, he couldn't call. When he finally got out and called, he apologized profusely. To his relief, she quickly got over being angry and gave him another chance. When he arrived at the apartment and Barbara opened the door, he stood there, mouth agape. She was even cuter and shapelier than he remembered. For her part, she thought he looked pretty damn cute himself, all decked out in his sailor suit. He'd matured since she'd last seen him, his lean frame filled out a bit, his face fuller, more mature. And those eyes, sky blue and friendly, reminded her why she'd first been attracted to him back in high school and why she'd let him sweet-talk her into the back seat of her father's car across the street from the Baptist church. They went out for dinner at Mona's nightclub, veal cutlets and mashed potatoes, and a lot of close dancing. She invited him to spend the night. Because her aunt and cousin shared the small studio apartment with her, he would have to sleep on the couch. That was fine with him. He was just happy to be with her again. She was as affectionate as he remembered, and she still had that flirty way that got him excited. For the next six weeks, he came to see her on every weekend pass he got, taking the one-hour bus ride from Mare Island into San Francisco, then a twenty-minute walk to her apartment. They even began to talk about marriage. 
On December 4th, 1941, her parents drove down from Medford for a visit. Barbara summoned her nerve to tell them that she and Bob were dating again, and that she was in love, and that they'd talked of getting married. Over my dead body, her father replied. On Sunday morning, December 7th, Bob awoke late at his brother Darrell's house in Medford. Home on a four-day pass, he'd come to tell his father and Cora that he planned to marry Barbara after he completed his stint in the Navy. Getting dressed, he listened to the big band sounds of Tommy Dorsey on Mutual Radio. The programming was interrupted with a terse two-sentence announcement. The Japanese have attacked U.S. Navy ships at Pearl Harbor. Enemy ships have been reported close to our shores. He spun the radio dial, searching for more news. All servicemen on leave anywhere in America, he learned, had been ordered to return immediately to station. He wouldn't be able to see his dad and tell him about his plans with Barbara. By early afternoon, he was boarding a bus in his navy blues to head back to California. Settling into his window seat, he braced for the long ride, resolute in his country's purpose. On her way to work the morning of Monday, December 8th, Barbara stopped at a newsstand, paid a nickel, and bought a copy of the San Francisco Examiner. The headline bannered the news, U.S. Jap War. Later that day, along with the whole nation, she listened to President Roosevelt's historic A Day Which Will Live in Infamy speech. For the people in San Francisco, the impact of the sneak attack was especially sobering. The vulnerable West Coast was now confronted not only with the reality of America being at war, but also with the task of preparing for the very real possibility of an enemy invasion. San Francisco quickly moved to a war footing, but confusion and invasion fever reigned. Within hours of the first word from Pearl Harbor, sentries recruited from the California State Guard, armed with guns and bayonets, were posted on the Bay Bridge and the San Francisco waterfront. Checkpoints were established, and cars were inspected for Japanese occupants before being allowed to pass. Any Japanese was detained for questioning. From San Jose to Marin County, a blackout was quickly put in place. The California State Automobile Association put up 3,000 signs in the area, ordering headlights dimmed. Traffic slowed to a crawl, worsened by accidents caused by cars and trucks driving with only parking lights on. Air raid signals blared and searchlights scanned the skies. The army base at the Presidio was darkened. A few miles away in San Francisco Bay, however, Alcatraz was lit up like a ballpark. Officials worried that darkening the prison would encourage escape attempts. Heavy-duty anti-aircraft guns were installed next to the Golden Gate Bridge, and guards patrolled for possible sabotage. A three-mile-wide submarine net was stretched across the opening of the bay. Civilian defense officials designated certain buildings as public air raid shelters, and signs indicating their locations were quickly posted. Civilian patrolmen started a training course for defense against chemical attack, and 16,900 gas masks were sent from Washington, D.C. to equip the city's protective services and civilian defense workers. Commercial fishing fleets were placed under the protection of the U.S. Coast Guard, and Japanese-American fishermen were forbidden to practice their trade. At the phone company building across from Barbara's office, sandbags were piled two stories high. At Barbara's apartment, her aunt taped butcher paper over the windows in compliance with the blackout and filled the tub with water in case the Japanese bombed the reservoirs and contaminated the water. Her neighbors joined together and demanded that local merchants dim their store lights like everyone else. On December 11th, a front-page story reported that two squadrons of Japanese bombers had flown over the Bay Area the night before. The story even carried a map detailing the route the bombers had taken, one squadron passing over Mare Island and then heading north toward Mendocino County, the other group circling over San Jose before disappearing to the southwest. The story turned out not to be true, but still it jangled everyone's nerves even more. Eager to do her share, Barbara volunteered with the Red Cross emergency team and was assigned to put gas masks into boxes for distribution throughout the city. Bob was confined to his base, and it took several days for him to get a call through to Barbara. He didn't waste words. Let's get married, he proposed. When? Now? 
as soon as you can find a church? She accepted his proposal. With so many sailors and soldiers about to ship out for the war, young couples all over America had decided to speed up their wedding plans. Churches all over San Francisco were booked solid. It took Barbara several calls to find a church and minister, but she finally set up a ceremony at San Francisco's Trinity Church at 9.30 at night, December 16, 1941. Then she called her parents to break the news. No, 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 were the first words out of her father's mouth. But when she persisted, her parents reluctantly agreed to return to California for the wedding. How could they stand in the way of their daughter marrying a man about to risk his life for his country? Bob also called his dad and stepmother, and they too agreed to attend. Barbara took care of buying the rings as well, spending thirty dollars out of her savings for two simple gold bands. She'd also bought a new black and gray knit dress and matching pillbox hat for the occasion. She was nineteen. Bob was twenty. With their parents in attendance, they were married as planned, although Barbara's father had made it clear he didn't approve. Not only were they too young, he thought that with Bob shipping off to war in a few days, this was no way to start a marriage. Plus, he was still having trouble letting go of the feeling that Bob wouldn't be able to provide for his daughter. But the outbreak of war and the photo images of the death and destruction at Pearl Harbor had created a national will and unity of purpose, and a respect for the men going off to defend the American way of life, especially in a branch of the service as dangerous as submarines. Beneath all of Bob's big smiles and excitement about getting married, he also felt a sense of inadequacy. He hadn't been able to afford the rings, he didn't have enough money to pay for the reception dinner at Vanessi's in North Beach, he couldn't afford to provide his new wife a nice apartment while he was gone, he didn't earn enough so that she didn't have to work. Maybe his new father-in-law was right. Maybe he wasn't good enough for Barbara. It helped that she told him otherwise, and that she loved him for his heart and good looks and sense of humor and not his money. But still, Bob worried. He was also worried, of course, about going to war and dying, but he knew it was his duty, his responsibility. He took some solace in knowing that his Navy pay would double in wartime and that he'd be able to send most of it back to Barbara. On January 9, 1942, the tuna departed San Francisco on its way to Pearl Harbor. Bob was on the deck straining to catch a glimpse of Barbara as it sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge. She'd promised to be there to wave goodbye, but her boss wouldn't let her off work. She cried most of the day. Three weeks later, Bob was on the deck again as the tuna left Pearl Harbor on its first patrol. It had just enough room to slide by the stern of the battleship USS Nevada aground across the channel. Bob was shocked by the devastation to the ships in Pearl Harbor, and he worried that the tuna was not sufficiently ready for battle. The crews of the submarines making up the Pacific and Asiatic fleets, including the Gudgeon with Chuck Vervalen, now shared a deep mistrust for the Mark 14 torpedo and the Mark 6 magnetic exploder, believing the torpedo ran deeper than designed and the magnetic exploder was defective, causing it to explode prematurely. There was little information on how to adjust or repair the device. The skippers had been instructed to set the torpedo to run deep beneath the keels of the enemy and let the exploder take care of the rest. But because of the shortage of torpedoes, no live tests had been conducted prior to sending subs out on patrol. Reports from the early patrols had substantiated the concerns. In the first three weeks of the war, American subs had fired 96 torpedoes with only three hits. Several captains urged Admiral Withers, commander of the Pacific Fleet, to give orders to deactivate the exploder and fire the torpedoes for direct contact hits. Admiral Withers refused, reminding the captains that there was a critical shortage of torpedoes at Pearl Harbor and that they needed to trust their weaponry. The submarine force had no choice but to place blind faith in this order and the new weapon. John Detar, the captain of the tuna, wasn't happy with the decision. Like several other skippers, he toyed with the idea that once he left Pearl Harbor and reached the combat zone, he would deactivate the exploder and shoot for contact, which he hoped would improve the possibility of an explosion. If necessary, he would swear his men to secrecy 
and doctor the reports to justify using more than one torpedo. For this mission, the tuna was assigned to patrol off the east coast of Japan and, in fact, to go right into harbors. Bob tried to hide his nervousness. He'd heard the concerns about the torpedoes. He also worried about the crew's readiness for battle. They were undertrained and inexperienced. Worse, he lacked confidence in Dittar. Instead of sleeping in his quarters, the captain slept on a mattress in the conning tower. He strutted around with a pistol strapped to his side. He strictly rationed the crew's use of fresh water, even though he had two distillers on board. He forbade the men from taking showers and ignored their complaints. And when the hydraulic system malfunctioned more than once, he accused someone on the crew of trying to sabotage him. Bob didn't know if it was possible, but he was already thinking about requesting a transfer after this patrol. Every day he sat in his yeoman's cubicle, staring at a framed photo of Barbara. It was very dark as Barbara walked up Pine Street in her high heels. The streetlights were turned off because of the blackout. She was returning from the Red Cross office where she'd gone after work to help pack boxes with emergency medical supplies. She'd watched teams of volunteers in a mock emergency medical drill, and the images of bandaged patients and men in helmets played on her nerves. The danger of an attack now seemed even more real, especially following numerous reports of Japanese warships off the California coast. It was February 2, 1942. As she neared her apartment, she was looking forward to sharing her big news with Fern and Margie. She'd been to the doctor earlier in the day and gotten the word that she was pregnant. She was thrilled and would write to Bob that night to tell him he was going to be a father. She hoped he'd get the news before heading off on patrol. She would write her parents as well, not sure if they'd be happy about the news. She also wrote her cousin, June, back in Medford. Oh, it's so awful to have him gone, June. He's been gone only three weeks, but I miss him terribly. I received two letters from him Saturday and another two today, which is the first I've heard from him. All of them were written while he was in Pearl Harbor and sent by Clipper. I don't know where he is now, though. It's awful not knowing, but guess I'll have to get used to it. The crew of the tuna was on edge. Dittar's disturbing behavior, repeated malfunctions of the hydraulic system, lack of confidence in the torpedoes, and the numbing fear of being on a mission to penetrate deep into enemy waters all took their toll. Moreover, the trip across had taken longer than scheduled, and Dittar had kept the ship submerged much of the way, including at night, despite orders to the contrary. He continued to maintain his strict rationing of drinking water. Upon reaching the coast of Japan, Dittar guided the ship into a harbor, one suspected of being mined, close enough that he could see people ashore through the periscope. Bob heard a scraping against the port side of the boat. It was a cable from a mine. Dittar kept the ship in the harbor for twenty-four hours, with nothing accomplished other than rattling the crew's nerves. As they headed back out to sea, Dittar spotted a freighter in the distance. He closed to within 3,500 yards and fired three times in direct defiance of orders. All three shots missed. As they tried to flee the area, a Japanese destroyer moved in quickly and began dropping depth charges, at least twenty of them, one explosion after another shaking the tuna, knocking out the lights and twisting the hull. Bob and the rest of the crew held on in terror. One of the blasts damaged the propeller, causing it to squeak. Now, if they tried to run, the destroyer overhead would hear them. Dittar's only option was to wait it out and hope the destroyer would eventually leave. But for the next twenty-three hours, the destroyer stayed, dropping more depth charges. Barbara hurriedly opened the special delivery letter from her mother, sure it was in response to the letter she'd sent announcing she was pregnant. Your father and I, it began. That phrase was always a signal to Barbara that she was in trouble. In the letter, her mother spelled out the reasons she thought it was not the right time for Barbara to be having a child. She was too young. Her husband was at war with no guarantee of returning. A child needed two parents. Money would be a problem. There would be plenty of time later to have a child. Barbara fought back tears. 
It wasn't just that her parents didn't think having a baby was a good idea. It was the furious, how-could-you-let-this-happen tone of the letter. After twenty-four hours on the ocean floor under steady depth-charge bombardment, the tuna finally escaped, heading east toward deeper, safer waters. Soon the crew began pursuit of a four-thousand-ton freighter. Defying orders again, Detar deactivated the magnetic exploder on his remaining torpedoes. Bob was no torpedo expert, but it made sense to him. The torpedoes they'd fired earlier hadn't sunk anything, so something needed to be done. Detar moved in for the attack. At 2,000 yards, he fired. Bob heard the explosion. This time they scored a direct hit. After a few minutes, Detar brought the tuna to the surface to observe the damage. The freighter was splitting in two. Standing on the deck, Bob watched the freighter going down. But instead of a sense of vindication, he had a sick feeling in his stomach. In the oily, fiery ocean, men, women, children, and dogs struggled to stay afloat. The freighter had been carrying civilian passengers. He heard screams and saw desperate outstretched hands disappear under the water. He knew that the freighter was probably carrying supplies to be used against American troops and ships, but later that night he could still see the images of the outstretched hands. After receiving the letter from her mother, Barbara had confided her situation to Estelle, a woman with whom she worked. Estelle was twenty-nine, and to Barbara she seemed worldly wise. Estelle told her about a clinic, reassuring her that it wasn't some back-alley place but a clean facility with a receptionist, nurses in white uniforms, and a doctor who was known as the safest and most experienced abortionist in the city. Patients received printed instructions for follow-up care. Although she didn't know anyone who'd had an abortion, or at least anyone who admitted it, Barbara had heard tales of coat hanger abortions and hospitals having abortion wards filled with women suffering from botched procedures. She knew it was illegal and risky. She'd made the decision to tell people, including Bob and her parents, that she'd had a miscarriage. Her whole life Barbara had pretty much done what her parents told her. Going against their advice seemed wrong. While her mother had not directly told her to have an abortion, she would never do that, the letter made it seem that having a baby at this point in her life would be a huge mistake. As badly as Barbara wanted a child, she saw her parents' point. A few days earlier, she'd seen a newspaper headline declaring, Japs sink two more American subs. Manila was about to fall, the Germans were sweeping through Europe, and military leaders were forecasting a long and bloody war. As much as she didn't like to think about it, there was a good chance that Bob could get killed. She didn't know any single mothers. She was also persuaded by her mother's point about the financial difficulty she would have in raising a child, especially if Bob didn't return. She would have to quit her job to raise the child, and that would mean she would have to move back home with her parents in Central Point. She definitely didn't want to do that. But what if Bob wanted her to have the baby? She'd written and told him she was pregnant, but she wasn't sure if he'd even gotten the letter. They'd talked about having children, but it was something they figured would happen later, after the war, after their lives were more settled. As she wrestled with her options, half a world away, Bob's submarine sailed through the debris and bodies from the sinking Japanese freighter. 7. Tim Skeeter McCoy, USS Trout Stripped to the waist, 17-year-old Tim wiped the sweat off his freckled shoulders, his lean frame glistening in the tropical sunshine. Along with the rest of his new crewmates on the submarine USS Trout in Pearl Harbor, he was helping to load 3,517 rounds of artillery shells on board for a special mission. The fact that most of the ship's torpedoes had been unloaded signified something was up. Why would a submarine about to head off toward enemy waters be without a full load of torpedoes? They were due to leave tomorrow, January 12, 1942. Tim had been a submariner for only two days. After only five weeks of basic training in San Diego, his entire company of new recruits had been rushed off to Pearl Harbor just days after December 7th. 
Tim had arrived in San Diego by train from Dallas, and for him, boot camp seemed easy enough, mostly just marching and learning Navy terminology. He liked getting to sleep in a hammock and living in a big barracks with other recruits. His company had taken a bus to the harbor once and boarded an anchored training ship for an orientation session, but that was the extent of his training before shipping out. He had no regrets about dropping out of high school at the start of his senior year to enlist. It was time for him to get out on his own, and the guarantee of three square meals a day and a regular paycheck made sense. His decision had nothing to do with what Hitler was doing in Europe. It was all about getting out from under his mom's feet and earning enough to help her out. It seemed unlikely that his father was ever going to provide his mom with any financial help. When he first arrived in Hawaii, he felt like he'd reached the edge of his world. But this wasn't Hawaii the tropical paradise. There would be no hula girls, grass huts, or splashing in the surf. The Hawaiian islands were now under martial law. Barbed wire fences lined the beach at Waikiki. Tim and the men in his company would be restricted to base. After docking, they rode a bus straight to the submarine base at Pearl Harbor, the whole company assigned to the submarine tender USS Pelias, a huge floating repair shop for subs. Two days after being assigned to the Pelias, Tim answered a call for volunteers for the USS Trout, one of twelve new fleet submarines commissioned in 1940 in the hasty pre-war Navy buildup. Its skipper, Lieutenant Commander Frank Fenno, had been asked how fast he could get the ship ready for sea. It was urgently required to deliver much-needed anti-aircraft ammunition to Corregidor, the small island fortress in Manila Bay nicknamed The Rock. Fenno said he needed only a couple of replacements for his crew and could be ready to go in a couple of days. That's when Tim volunteered and became a submariner. Tim figured a submarine would be safer than a surface vessel, because it could see the enemy while the enemy couldn't see it. But more than that, there was something daring and adventurous about being a submariner that appealed to his cocky nature. He was assigned as a mess cook, which meant a lot of peeling potatoes and cleaning dishes. There was really nothing else on board he was qualified to do, except help load tons of artillery shells for the secret mission the ship was leaving on in the morning. The Japanese knew the Philippine Islands were essential to controlling the Western Pacific and providing a lifeline to Indonesia and its many resources, as well as to Australia. By the time the trout left Pearl Harbor, Japanese forces had created a hopeless situation for the 100,000 U.S. and Philippine troops on the Bataan Peninsula. Manila had been evacuated, and General MacArthur had moved his headquarters to Corregidor, now the final U.S. foothold against the invading forces. On Corregidor, the main defensive feature was the man-made rock tunnel near the middle of the tadpole-shaped island. It had become an underground storehouse for the Philippine and U.S. forces, as well as for a large portion of the Philippine treasury's gold and silver. The Japanese were bombarding the island by air and with artillery fire from Cavite on the mainland pounding it relentlessly day and night, making life on Corregidor unbearable. Even the tunnel trembled. It was the Trout's destination. The anti-aircraft gunners on Corregidor urgently needed more long-range, mechanically-fused, high-altitude projectiles, the ammunition Tim had worked up a sweat to get onto the Trout. For Tim, it had all happened so fast, boot camp, coming to Pearl Harbor, volunteering for submarine duty, that he didn't have time to sit around and develop a case of war nerves. As the trout sailed for Corregidor, every inch of its interior space was crammed with the cargo of ammunition, a priority so great that the spare torpedoes had been removed, leaving only eight torpedoes on board. Commander Fenno was under orders not to engage the enemy unless his own safety was in peril. Having seen the destruction at Pearl Harbor and eager to sink Japanese ships, he was unhappy about the assignment, so he engineered a compromise with his commanding officers. After dropping off his load of artillery shells, he would pick up a load of torpedoes and fuel at Corregidor, then patrol the Formosa Strait and the lower reaches of the East China Sea on the way home. To Tim, everything was new and exciting. He'd been a submariner for less than three days, and he was already headed into combat. When the ship made its first dive beneath the surface shortly after leaving Pearl Harbor, 
He loved it. There was no claustrophobia, no fear of being under the water. In fact, he liked being submerged better than riding on top. It's as smooth as glass, he said, describing the underwater ride. It was also a cultural awakening. Other than one trip to Oklahoma, he'd spent his whole life in Texas. That was his identity, his culture, his accent. Now he was surrounded by guys from New Jersey, Minnesota, California. They all had their different ways of expressing themselves. Not everyone appreciated his cocky manner. Fortunately, there were two other Texans on board, and he immediately gravitated to them, quickly picking up the nickname Skeeter. He wasn't exactly sure why they called him that. Maybe it had to do with him always buzzing around like a pesky mosquito. The trout reached the entrance to Manila Bay on the afternoon of February 3rd, but the water around Corregidor was heavily mined, and it would be too risky to proceed to port. With tons of high explosives on board, the sub was a gigantic fireball waiting to happen. After waiting until nightfall, Captain Fenno, a class of 25 graduate of the Naval Academy, took off on a zigzag course through the heavily mined harbor. He was following a motorboat guided by a torpedo boat squadron commander, Lieutenant John Bulkley. As Fenno maneuvered the 307-foot-long fleet-type submarine in the wake of a fast-moving torpedo boat in the pitch-black night, it was as quiet as a church on board. Halfway to their destination, Tim heard a mine scraping down the port side of the sub. For forty-five nerve-wracking minutes, Tim and the rest of the crew held their breath. Finally, the ship pulled alongside the south dock and darkened its lights. The crew immediately went to work, passing cases of artillery up through the rear hatch and unloading them on the dock. Tim cast a glance toward Cavite across the bay from where Japanese artillery emplacements could easily blow them to smithereens. In the distance, the sound of artillery fire rumbled through the hills of Batan. Tim saw explosions. The night sky lit up like someone had waved a giant sparkler through it. Despite his being in great shape, his muscles quickly wearied. While the ammunition was being unloaded aft, the trout took on ten torpedoes through her forward hatch. Each torpedo weighed three thousand pounds, and with no crane or hoist to help, the crew, aided by Filipino stevedores, grew even more exhausted. On the port side, the ship took on twenty-seven thousand gallons of fuel. As he continued to work, Tim looked down the dock and spotted dozens of carloads of locals arriving. Because of the constant bombardment that Corregidor had been under, supplies had dwindled and food was scarce. The civilians had come in hopes of a handout. Seeing their desperate and pleading faces, Fenno ordered all possible supplies to be brought to the dock, cigarettes, medical supplies, and food. Tim helped carry up food supplies. When the job was finished, all that was left on board for the rest of the mission was the ingredients for spaghetti, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Nearing midnight and the end of the unloading of the ammo, Fenno inquired what type of ballast was available to replace the twenty-five tons of shells that had just been removed. Without sufficient ballast, the ship would have trouble diving and be dangerously top-heavy when on the surface. He said he'd take anything, crushed rocks, stone, sandbags. But every sandbag on the island had already been used for protection against the constant bombardment. A new plan was hatched. The ballast would come from the gold bars and silver coins from the Philippine treasury hidden in the tunnel. The amount was staggering for the time. Thirty-eight million dollars in U.S. treasury checks, thirty-one million dollars in American and Philippine currency, nine million dollars in silver Philippine pesos, and over six tons of gold worth nine million dollars. After a call to MacArthur, it was agreed that a portion of the treasure, twenty million dollars, would be transferred to the trout. Soon tons of gold, securities, and silver were being loaded onto five-ton flatbed army trucks for the trip to the dock. With the help of locals, Tim and the crew began loading 319 bars of gold, passing them by hand down the hatches into the sub. Each bar weighed 40 pounds, a total of almost six and a half tons. It took only minutes to load them. Next came the 630 bags of silver, each bag containing a thousand pesos. 
Tim wasn't sure how much each bag weighed, but by now they each felt like a ton. By the time the money was loaded, every available inch of space on the inside deck of the trout was stacked with the bars of gold and the bags of silver. As Fenno readied the ship for departure, Tim saw one of his crewmates, Doug Graham, furtively untie one of the bags of silver coins, reach inside, pull out a handful of coins, and stick them in his pocket. Tim had heard Captain Fenno talk about the integrity of delivering their cargo, and stealing ran contrary to Tim's Baptist upbringing. He debated whether to blow the whistle on Graham, but decided to sleep on it for a few days. With the final transfer of funds completed, the trout turned and headed toward the open sea. On board was the richest ballast any ship had ever carried. Fenno's instructions were to transport the money directly back to Pearl Harbor for transfer to the American treasury and not engage the enemy. But Fenno was itching to sink a Japanese ship. He set course for the East China Sea. Two weeks after leaving Corregidor, Fenno got his wish. The trout sank a 2,700-ton cargo ship off the northern coast of Formosa using three torpedoes. Tim was still wrestling whether to say anything about Graham's taking the coins. It upset his sense of right and wrong, especially after he heard Graham talking about being a deacon in his church back home in Sacramento, but he finally decided not to make an issue of it. He was the youngest and the lowest-ranking man on the ship, and this was not a good time to alienate anyone. He would, however, turn Graham in after the war, he told himself. The next week was uneventful except for the foul winter weather, gale winds, and mountainous seas. It gave Tim a chance to continue his naval education. So far he'd studied how to operate the build system, how to fire a torpedo, how to go into the engine room and start the big Fairbanks Morse engine from scratch, and how to put power to the screws, propellers. Sometimes he felt like he was back in school again, constantly reading manuals, looking at drawings and blueprints, listening to the officer's instruction. But this wasn't like school back in Dallas, where he was rarely interested in the assignments. He liked studying about the submarine. It was important to him to move up in rank. Not satisfied with just one sinking, Fenno scored another kill this time an enemy gunboat passing through the Bonin Islands south of Japan near Iwo Jima. Fenno wanted more, but soon a message arrived from Pearl Harbor ordering him to return to base. Word had come from Washington. A sub loaded with gold and silver was too valuable to risk chasing after enemy gunboats and freighters. On the afternoon of March 3, 1942, after 50 days on mission, Tim was topside as the trout moored port side to the USS Detroit at Fleet Air Base in Pearl Harbor. Its precious cargo was quickly transferred to the Detroit to be taken to America. For the mission, Commander Fenno was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary heroism. Tim and the rest of the crew all received a prestigious Silver Star Medal. And for his part in guiding the trout through the minefields of Manila Bay, as well as his heroic efforts in the climactic final hours of the Philippine defense, including the personal evacuation of General MacArthur and his family from Corregidor, Lieutenant Commander John Bulkley was presented the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Roosevelt. At a time when there was almost no good news to report from the war, the Trout's mission made headlines across the country and helped lift the nation's beleaguered spirits, 17-year-old Tim McCoy felt proud to have been part of such a heroic effort. Tim sat in his hotel room, staring out the window, trying to figure out something to do to pass the time. He and the rest of the crew of the Trout were staying at the posh Royal Hawaiian. The Navy had taken over the three fanciest hotels on the island, the Royal Hawaiian, Moana, and Halikulani, to house and feed the sailors between combat patrols. Enlisted men stayed for free. Officers paid one dollar for a suite. Before the war, these were the hotels for movie stars and rich tourists, off-limits to servicemen. Tim was bored, unimpressed with Hawaii, or at least Honolulu and Waikiki. Sailors had taken to calling Oahu the rock, comparing it to Alcatraz. Isolated, overcrowded with military personnel, a departure point for the horrors of combat and possibly death. 
For many of these young men, the tension was relieved only by alcohol. For the first time in his life, Tim had awakened with the curse of a hangover. Out his window, he saw men standing in line to catch a bus. He'd always been an impatient, fidgety kind of kid, and to him, Hawaii was a place where he was always waiting, waiting to wash his skivvies, waiting for chow, waiting to be sent off to battle again. It also felt like a lot of the locals didn't like servicemen. With the arrival of so many sailors and marines, the population on the island had ballooned dramatically. Services were strained. In addition to the flood of service personnel, thousands of others had come to the island seeking the promise of important war work. At first, these new arrivals, or malahinis as the natives called them, were greeted warmly. But soon this swarm of new people were viewed with a wary eye. They drank and cussed too much, made too much noise, and started too many fights. To Tim, like most Navy men, Honolulu was a dirty town inhabited by Japs, chinks, and dark-skinned people running around unwashed and barely able to speak English. Racial slurs and epithets were part of normal conversation. Men who'd never interacted with people of color or different ethnicity now found themselves in the minority. Tim didn't feel comfortable walking the streets. The atmosphere felt tense, especially with so many of the men wandering the streets drunk, most of them not good at handling their liquor. Another thing Tim didn't like about the island was the lack of women. Most of the white women on the island had returned to the mainland after December 7th. Tim heard an estimate that the ratio of men to women in Honolulu was 500 to 1. With such scarcity, sailors looked at every woman they saw as if she were a Betty Grable or a Hetty Lamar. The Navy and the USO staged dances, but as with everything else on the island, the men had to stand in line to wait their turn to dance. Tim had been to one dance at the Navy Rec Center in Waikiki, but with over a thousand men attending and only about thirty women, he left early. He wasn't interested in the brothels either. Honolulu brothels were now servicing up to 30,000 men a day, and for many of these servicemen it would be their only encounter with a woman before they died. There was also the chance of catching a venereal disease. More men in World War II would get VD than be wounded in action. To a huge number of young servicemen, it was worth the risk. Not to Tim. I have no desire to be the hundredth guy some whore does it with in a day, he said or, for that matter, the first. I can't even imagine. Tim quickly glanced at his cards, then glared at Petty Officer Joe Boyle sitting across the table. For some unknown reason, Boyle had made it his assignment to ride Tim. Along with four crewmates, they were playing poker in Boyle's room at the Royal Hawaiian. One of the other players was Doug Graham, whom Tim had seen steal the coins on the trout. Between Boyle, Graham, and the ten beers he'd downed, Tim was feeling irritable. Where's your auntie? asked Boyle. I forgot, replied Tim, tossing a matchstick into the pot. He took another swig of his beer. Is everybody from Texas as stupid as you? needled Boyle. Tim set his cards down. Kiss my ass, he muttered. What did you say? You heard me, asshole. Boyle slowly stood. Common sense should have told Tim that fighting with an officer was a sure way to get washed out of the submarine service, sent to the brig, or court-martialed, or all three. But at that moment, none of that occurred to him. He unloaded from somewhere south of the lobby, his right fist nailing Boyle squarely on the jaw. Down he went, out cold. Tim turned and headed out the door. He didn't know anything about maritime law, but he was pretty sure he was in big trouble. 8. Gordy Cox, USS Sculpin The physical part of boot camp was easy for 17-year-old Gordy. He'd always been wiry and full of energy. All of the hockey and skating, as well as riding his bike up and down hills in Yakima to deliver newspapers, had prepared him well for the calisthenics and marching. Plus, he had a good attitude, happy to be on his own, proud to be in the Navy. Unlike many of the inductees, 
He didn't grouse about sweeping the grinder or spending endless hours learning to tie knots. He'd even been able to send part of his weekly $21 boot camp pay home. Gordy was good about writing to his mother about life in the Navy. He always used U.S. Navy stationery and always signed with his whole name, Gordy Cox, but never added an I love you or any other sign of affection. February 1, 1941 The Navy gave me $100 worth of clothes and I have to learn a different fold for each article. I've never seen so many crackpots in one bunch as in this company. We start marching Monday with a gun as big as a cannon. The sun is plenty hot here and my neck is getting burned and my feet are sore. February 26, 1941 I had my first liberty last weekend. I think San Diego is the prettiest town I was ever in, especially Balboa Park. While I'm thinking of it, you had better write me an invitation to come home on leave. They won't let us go if we don't have a written invitation from home. I'm going to take a test in a few weeks, and maybe I'll qualify for the communication and clerical school, the radio division of it, but I doubt I'll make it. I have never heard so much profane language in my life, but haven't heard any new words. March 22, 1941 Boy, we sure live in a swell barracks now. There's linoleum on the floor, which isn't half bad to swab. I still only make $21 a month. I got paid yesterday, so I thought I'd send you a little money. You need it and I don't, and if you don't need it now, you can stick it away. If I keep it, I'd just waste it. Gordy set down his test paper. He'd answered only half the questions, and he had no doubt he'd flunked. For most of his life he'd been told he was slow, so there was no reason for him to believe he'd do any better on a test now that he was in the Navy. The test was one given to the thousand recruits who'd just finished the seven weeks of boot camp. Those who scored in the top 20% would go on for special training. The rest would be assigned to a ship and go to sea. That was fine with Gordy. When the results of the test were finally announced, Gordy was one of the 20% who'd passed. They assigned him to communications school. I can't imagine how dumb those guys who failed must be, he said. March 30th, 1941 I'm trying to listen to Jack Benny and write at the same time. Well, we got started to school yesterday. I have to learn to type. It doesn't seem so hard. They also gave us some dot and dash we have to learn. I'm flat broke. April 10th, 1941 There's a bunch of guys came in from Newport Training Station. Most of them are from New York. They sound as bad as the Texans. Thanks for the card and the dollar, but I really didn't need it. April 16, 1941 There's a few guys here who keep getting me mad, but don't think I'll have any trouble. Just think, in one month and a week I'll start drawing $36 per month and an automatic promotion to second-class seaman. May 12, 1941 I saw Martha Ray yesterday and a glimpse of Edgar Bergen but old Charlie and Snurd were in their suitcase. There are quite a few movie stars that come down here. Lou Costello, the comedian, was here. I got to talk to Bud Abbott for a little while. Well, so much for famous people. After all, they're the same as everyone. June 10th, 1941 Saw Bob Hope the other day. You probably heard the program over the air. There are lots of Texans down here that are better than us. Just ask them. August 17, 1941. Well, I'm still here, and they haven't shipped me out yet. I haven't done any work lately except scrub a little paint. I never saw so many dopes. Most of them never do anything sensible. Most of the guys are disgusted now, but I think it will be better after we get out to sea. Gordy graduated from Quartermaster Signalman's Radio School in Communications School and was waiting at the base in San Diego for assignment when there was a call for volunteers for submarine service. He'd never thought about being a submariner and had no intention of signing up, but while standing in line, a friend gave him a shove in the back, and he was a volunteer. He could have easily stepped back into line, but not wanting to draw attention to himself, he agreed to go. The next day he signed the papers, and a week later he was on a ship heading to the sub-base at Pearl Harbor. 
September 12, 1941. I've been ashore out here, and it is a dump. There isn't anything here. The town of Honolulu is like Front Street in Yakima. All of the people here are Japs or something that looks like almost Japs. If a person sees a real Hawaiian, he's lucky. I'm making $46 a month now and would like to save some of it. A person has to have a lot of money out here to have a good time. I can't figure out where they get all that stuff about romantic Honolulu. It's the dirtiest and shackiest town I've ever been in. October 2nd, 1941. Suppose everyone has gone back to school by now. I kind of wish I were going back with them. I guess I didn't realize that I was doing all right then, or else I thought the Navy was too much of a good thing. It wouldn't be so bad if a person could see some white people when he went ashore, instead of a bunch of Japs, Chinks, and Hanakis. The Hanakis look like Filipinos, only blacker. The only people that will talk to you are someone trying to get your money or a drunk sailor. Speaking of dumb sailors reminds me about the other night. Elmer, a friend of mine, talked me into drinking two or three beers, and if it hadn't been time to come back to the ship, then I probably would have been a drunken sailor. It's sure a job to keep from going out and getting drunk or something. There's nothing else to do. I haven't gotten a letter from you since I came back off leave. Have you forgot that you have a sailor, son, or did you disown me? October 20th, 1941. Looking forward to June 13th, 1944. That's when I get out. I wish I could finish high school now. Somehow I don't regret joining the Navy, but I wish I were out. I learned considerable since I joined, although it wouldn't help me in getting a job. I don't know whether I'll be back home for Christmas. I doubt whether Roosevelt himself knows, although there are rumors about being back on the first of the year. Hula dancers. Fooey. The only hula dancers over here are in photo shops where you pay 50 cents to get your picture taken with them, and half of the time they're not real Hawaiians. It was November 8, 1941, a month before the attack on Pearl Harbor, and Gordy was aboard the USS Sculpin as it sailed into Manila Bay. The Sculpin, named after a small, grotesque fish with a large, shining head and short, tapered body, was one of twelve submarines being transferred from the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor to the Asiatic Fleet based in Manila. For Gordy, a guy with no mechanical background or training, the submarine was still one big mechanical puzzle. Because he hadn't been to sub-school like a lot of the guys on the crew, he was scared he wasn't smart enough to learn what he needed to become qualified or perform under pressure. It helped that he was assigned as a mess cook. He was happy to be coming to Manila. Anything, he figured, had to be better than Honolulu and the unfriendly locals. From what he'd heard, Manila was a city where the locals treated servicemen well, even if it was only to get them to spend their money. Plus, the Philippine women were supposedly very friendly. And as far as the threat of war, if the top brass were concerned that it was about to start, the news hadn't drifted down to Gordy. Admiral Thomas Hart had been put in command of the Asiatic fleet, and he believed that a major weakness of the war plan was the inadequacy of that fleet. He also believed that a Japanese attack on the Philippines was imminent, so he took over with an iron fist, requesting reinforcements. In response to his plea, top Navy brass sent him the submarine tender Holland and an escort of twelve submarines, including the Sculpin swelling the Asiatic submarine force to 29. Fearing that the surface ships stationed in Manila Bay would be vulnerable to an attack, Hart ordered them withdrawn to the south. All the subs remained in Manila Bay. Gordy knew nothing of these strategic decisions. He was just eager to get liberty in Manila so he could go ashore and find out if Filipino women were as friendly as advertised. Before heading ashore, however, he and the crew had to listen to a lecture from an officer warning about the danger of venereal diseases. It's worse here in the Philippines than anywhere, the officer said, showing the men photos of genitals grossly deformed by syphilis and gonorrhea. But I'm sure some of you guys won't heed the warning, and you'll be sorry. December 8th, and dawn was breaking over Manila Bay. Gordy was in his bunk, fighting a hangover. He and his buddy Otis Taylor had gone to a cabaret in Manila, 
and while a couple of other crewmates danced away the evening with some of the Filipino girls, he and Otis had pounded down a half-dozen Canadian club and seven-ups. They hadn't danced because neither knew how. Now his head hurt. To Gordy, Manila was as seedy as Honolulu, only dirtier. What struck him most were the ramshackle houses and the poverty, orphans wandering the streets, begging for handouts, sleeping in alleys. He had yet to meet any Filipino women. Stirring in his bunk, Gordy vaguely heard someone ordering him to get up. It seemed too early. As he drifted back to sleep, someone else shook him. The Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor, a voice shouted. Within minutes, everybody on board was at his station, getting the sculpin ready to leave the harbor. The skipper, Lucius Henry Chappelle, had already received a message from Commander Hart, alerting all submarines and Navy aircraft to immediately begin waging unrestricted warfare. It was assumed that it would be only a matter of hours, maybe minutes, before the Japanese began attacking the Philippines. With all the submarines lined up together, they were sitting ducks. The Japanese plan was for roughly simultaneous attacks on Malaya, Thailand, American-held Guam and Wake, Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines, and Pearl Harbor. The raid on Pearl Harbor was meant to destroy the U.S. Pacific Fleet in its home port. The other attacks were meant to serve as preludes to full-scale invasion and occupation, as well as to secure resources the U.S. embargo was preventing from reaching Japan. The Philippine Islands, some 7,000 in number, form a natural barrier between Japan and the rich resources of Southeast Asia. Under American control since the Spanish-American War, in 1941 the Philippines formed the westernmost U.S. outpost, 5,000 miles from Pearl Harbor and over 8,000 miles from Gordy's home in Yakima. By contrast, Manila was only 1,800 miles from Tokyo. By 1941, Japan controlled much of the surrounding territory, including Formosa, a strategic airbase only 600 miles to the north. Although the United States had maintained military forces in the Philippines, including a substantial number of indigenous units, the islands were largely unprepared for hostilities with Japan. A key to the Japanese strategy was to strike and destroy MacArthur's air force there. If American air power were destroyed, Japanese troops would be able to invade and capture the Philippines, then push south to capture Borneo, Sumatra, Java, Timor, and New Guinea. The Japanese fully expected that MacArthur would have the planes ready to fight. For reasons never fully explained, MacArthur did not have his planes ready, and his ground troops were spread too thin, even though the Japanese intent to attack was clear. American radar had picked up enemy aircraft heading toward the Philippines and Clark Field from Formosa the morning of the 8th. They struck at noon, and by the end of the raid 40 minutes later, one half of America's total air power in the South Pacific had been destroyed. In all, 55 men were killed and over 100 wounded. The disaster at Clark Field would give air control to the Japanese, and coupled with inadequate ground forces and a disabled navy, the fate of the Philippines seemed hopeless. With the American Navy's Asiatic surface fleet having been sent to the south, the weight of the naval defense of the Philippines now fell to the submarine force. Sunshine Murray, the designated operations officer for Asiatic submarines, hastily addressed the skippers of the 29 subs moored in Manila Bay. Don't try to go out there and win a Congressional Medal of Honor in one day. The submarines are all we have left. Your crews are more valuable than anything else. Bring them back. Nursing his hangover, Gordy joined his crewmates as the Sculpin waited its turn with the other submarines to refuel and load stores and torpedoes. With all the subs gathered in the bay like targets on a firing range, there was great urgency to get these ships out to sea before more Japanese planes came swooping down out of the sky. Late in the afternoon of the 8th, the Sculpin sailed out of Manila Harbor, one of five subs assigned to patrol the eastern side of the island. After leaving the other ships, it sailed east through the San Bernardino Strait at the southern tip of Luzon, the biggest Philippine island, then headed north up the east coast to patrol off Lamon Bay, a possible landing site for a Japanese invasion from the east. 
En route, the ship stayed submerged during the day and surfaced only after dark. Each evening, Gordy looked forward to coming up for air. Shortly after the ship left Manila, its air conditioning had quit. Efforts by the auxiliary men to fix it failed, and with the engines running hot, the heat was dispersed through the sub. The temperature inside the ship hovered between 100 and 105 degrees. Like the rest of the crew, Gordy stripped down to just his shorts. All the men were sweating profusely, dripping onto the deck, making walking through the boat a slippery proposition. Sleeping was also difficult. With not enough bunks to go around, the men slept in shifts, grabbing any available bunk. The mattresses soon became completely sodden. Gordy tried placing a towel atop the mattress, but it quickly got soaked too, and when he hung it up, the humidity inside the ship prevented it from drying. Adding to the discomfort was the fact that the ship had been in such a rush to leave Manila that there was a shortage of distilled water. Drinking water was rationed. Showers weren't allowed. Gordy soon developed a severe rash, particularly bad in his armpits and crotch. At first, he worried that it might be a symptom of one of the venereal diseases the crew had been warned about, but he knew he had not had sex in the Philippines. He soon learned it was a heat rash. The pharmacist's mate tried several treatments, but none worked. With each day, the conditions on the ship worsened. A dwindling supply of drinking water, no showers, slippery deck, wet mattresses, high temperatures and humidity, and a growing stench. The only relief was at night, when the ship surfaced and the men could go topside for air. But outside it was eighty degrees and humid, offering little respite. The meal schedule was changed so that dinner was served while the ship was on the surface in order to keep down the heat from cooking. This was no way to start a war, thought Gordy. After a few days, a treatment was discovered to combat the rash, torpedo fuel. It was not the fuel's only alternative use. On most World War II subs, the pure grain alcohol used for the fuel in torpedo motors was also used to produce a short, powerful high with little in the way of a hangover, which was ideal for men in a stressful environment who wanted a bit of relief but didn't want to be fuzzy on duty. Conventional alcohol was prohibited on board. The Navy believed that life at sea was uncompromising enough, especially during wartime, and any abuse of alcohol would be totally unacceptable. But that didn't stop the Sculpin's crew from hiding a mini still in the machinist's room. The torpedo fuel cocktails they concocted were known as Pink Ladies, so named because the Navy added a pink coloring to the torpedo fuel to indicate it was not meant for drinking. The crew sneaked slices of bread out of the kitchen that they used to filter the fuel. Usually they mixed the fuel with coffee. Gordy had tried a sip from a coffee cup only once, but hated it, figuring it must be an acquired taste. Instead, he spent most of his spare time studying. From his perspective, the information about the operation of the submarine he was trying to digest was hard enough to grasp while sober, so why make it even harder by ingesting 180-proof pink lady? He did, however, apply the torpedo fuel to his rash. It stung like hell, but it did diminish his rash and cool him down. Gordy retrieved the Paul Mall tucked behind his ear, then struck a match. It didn't light. He tried again, but still no luck. The humidity inside the ship made it tough to light a match. He tucked the cigarette back behind his ear and continued to read his manual on the ship's hydraulics. Gordy had taken up smoking shortly after coming aboard the Sculpin. Everybody, it seemed, smoked. FDR, Clark Gable, Joe DiMaggio. By Gordy's count, there were only a couple of guys on the ship who didn't. Cigarette smoke permeated the ship, adding more carbon monoxide to the air and another smell to deal with. For Gordy, smoking had become a way to deal with the tension. There was now a heightened sense of urgency and alarm to everything happening on board. They were in enemy waters, and their base back in Manila Bay had been destroyed. Moving north, the Sculpin found itself running right into the throat of a fierce December storm that relentlessly pounded the ship, making the search for the enemy even more difficult. The constant bobbing up and down and pitching to and fro was unnerving. 
At times it felt as if the ship was totally helpless against the raging sea and squalling sheets of rain. The bouncing was also making Gordy seasick. Despite its being a goal of every new submariner to become qualified, Gordy didn't feel driven to pass the test. He studied because he'd been told to. But down deep he had doubts that he'd ever be able to qualify. Sometimes he would read the same sentence in his manual over and over and still not understand it. But he persisted, spending his spare time studying rather than joining crewmates for poker or acy Ducey at the mess tables. Gordy donned his rain gear and climbed the ladder to take his position as the port side lookout. They were on the surface to recharge the batteries. Standing on the platform, he leaned against the waist-high ring. There was no hook or chain to secure him. Swells crashed over the bow and against the superstructure, banging him around in his little cage. No stars, no lights, just darkness and the storm. This was the third day of the storm. Standing lookout, he was soaked to the bone, cold, wet, and miserable. Raindrops coated the lens of his binoculars. The visibility was abysmal. The ship rode a swell, then dove down the other side, driving the bow straight into the next swell, kicking the screws out of the water as she went over the top and down again, movements endlessly repeated, hour after hour, pounding the ship's machinery and wearing on Gordy's nerves. He threw up again and again. After several days of their being buffeted by the storm, a shipmate on lookout spotted two Japanese battleships in the distance. Getting a bearing was difficult. The vessels could be seen only when the sculpin crested atop a swell. At first, Captain Chappelle, a soft-spoken, easy-going southerner, chose not to fire on the two ships. Part of the cautious breed of captains in charge at the start of the war, he was respected and well-liked by his crew. But despite Chappelle's caution and the difficulty in getting an accurate reading, he couldn't resist the temptation to fire his first shots of the war. He launched two torpedoes. They both exploded halfway to the target. The Asiatic subforce was off to a miserable start. None of the 29 subs assigned to protect the Philippines had sunk an enemy ship. Several had had close-range opportunities, but their torpedoes had malfunctioned. Facilitated by the pitiful failure of the U.S. Navy's submarine force and its flawed torpedoes, the Japanese had successfully invaded the Philippines. Critics, including Clay Blair, Jr., a leading submarine historian, were quick to point out the mistakes that had been made in the planning and execution of the submarine's defense of the Philippines. For starters, the sailors' training had been inadequate. This limited preparation had neglected such basic factors as the psychological effects of long-term patrols or even how much food to take on board. Poor maintenance of the ships was another issue. Almost without exception, the Asiatic fleet's subs suffered continuous engine breakdowns because of outdated or poorly repaired equipment. Another mistake was basing the subs in Manila, which had been good for liberty and recreation, but unwise as a base for operations. When MacArthur's air power was destroyed, the fleet was left unprotected. Once the combat began, the plan of defense was weak. Captains were told to patrol briefly and cautiously, and to place survival ahead of inflicting damage on the enemy. But with the submarines cast as the main naval offense, critics believed a bold call for action was needed, not caution. And perhaps the Navy's most dangerous mistake was its failure to adequately test the Mark 14 torpedo. Even the simplest of tests would have revealed the weapon's flaws, and measures could have been taken to repair them so that the ships would not have had to go into battle effectively unarmed. Within the submarine force, there was a feeling of frustration for failing to stop the Japanese advances. By the end of December, the Asiatic fleet had mounted 45 separate attacks, firing 96 torpedoes. Post-war Japanese records confirmed only three ships sunk. In terms of the overall impact on the war, the loss of Manila and Luzon was a greater military setback to the United States than the loss of its battleships at Pearl Harbor. It let the Japanese overrun the Philippines and launch their invasions to the south. Admiral Ernest King, chief of naval operations, later called it a magnificent display of bad strategy. 
With the American fleet forced to flee its base at Manila, the Sculpin and the rest of the subs no longer had a safe harbor. The Sculpin was ordered to proceed to Balakpapan on the east coast of Borneo to refuel, its crew already exhausted, the war less than a month old. Gordy was happy for the respite, even if it would only be for a few hours. A few days earlier he had been given a certificate acknowledging his graduation from Poliwog, a sailor who had not crossed south of the equator, to the status of shellback, one who had. It was a Navy tradition, and it had given him a measure of pride at a time when he was feeling overwhelmed by all he still needed to learn about the ship. He placed the certificate in the scrapbook he carried in his belongings. Despite the bad start to the war, the crew had the feeling that the problems were just temporary. America was on the right side of the conflict, God was on their side, and their power would soon prevail. After forty-five long, grueling days on its first patrol, the Sculpin arrived for supplies and repairs in the harbor at Surabaya, Java. The second largest city in Indonesia after Jakarta, Surabaya was an important commercial center for Southeast Asia. Java was a Dutch colony and a key target of Japanese expansion. For Gordy, the stop couldn't have come soon enough. What was supposed to have been a three-week patrol had lasted twice as long. But now, much to his relief, they were scheduled for a leave of five days. Located on the north side of Java in the Bali Sea, the harbor at Surabaya was crowded with American ships fleeing south from the advancing Japanese. Many of these ships had been damaged, either by storms or in battle. There was a shortage of everything, spare parts, torpedoes, food. The work to repair vital machinery, especially engines, was being rushed to hurry the ships out of the harbor before the expected Japanese attack. Their previous port, Balikpapan, had already been invaded, and it was only a matter of time before Surabaya was hit. To get away and relax, the crew traveled by train to a large Dutch army base at Malang, a city in the mountains two hours from Surabaya. Gordy marveled at the beauty of Java, an island he'd never heard of two weeks earlier. It dawned on him that the slogan, Join the Navy and See the World, was true. Nine months ago, his entire world had consisted of Yakima, Washington, and already he had been to San Diego, Hawaii, the Philippines, Borneo, and Java. When the crew returned to Surabaya after a couple of days in Malang, Gordy was overwhelmed by the stench that greeted him upon reboarding the ship, a foul brew of sweat, diesel oil, and cooking fumes. He'd become adjusted to it while on patrol, but returning to the ship after the fresh air of the mountains had been a shock. Javanese laborers had been brought in to scrub the whole boat, and the mattresses had been sent out for cleaning, but the odor remained. Gordy dreaded the prospect of going out on patrol again. With the war less than two months old, news was still sketchy and often inaccurate. Rumors ran wild. Most of the news that filtered down to Gordy was discouraging. Guam, Wake Island, and Manila had fallen. Singapore was under attack so was Indonesia. A couple of days after the Sculpin left Java, Japanese planes heavily bombed Surabaya and Malang. It was assumed that Japanese forces would soon steamroll their way right into Australia. When Gordy had first signed up for the submarine service, he'd been told of the closeness and camaraderie of the crew, a band of brothers sort of togetherness. But so far, even though he'd just completed a war patrol, he didn't share that feeling. He didn't even know the names of half the men on the ship. He might see them at meals or in their bunks, but he really didn't have any interaction with them. On February 17th, a convoy was spotted. As Chappelle prepared the ship for a surface attack, they were spotted. Prepare to dive, he ordered. As the Sculpin passed 225 feet, Gordy heard a depth charge detonate, then another, and another, each one getting closer. The ship shook violently. To keep from getting tossed to the deck, he held on to a pipe. There were two more depth charges, each of them rocking the ship. Light bulbs burst, pipes sprung leaks. In the maneuvering room, depth control was lost, and the sculpin plunged to 275 feet, then 325. 
Her maximum redline depth was 250. Anything below that could cause the pressure to pop the hull and create massive, unstoppable leaks. The captain struggled to get the ship under control. The rudder and stern planes froze. At 345 feet, the captain brought the ship to an up angle and cut to two-thirds speed on the screws, bringing a halt to the ship's plunge. Everyone on board breathed a momentary sigh of relief. But while they had been fighting for depth control, a fire had broken out in the control room. Salt water had leaked in and shorted electrical wiring. Black smoke filled the control room. Quickly an extinguisher was used to put out the fire, but the smoke made breathing difficult. Soon the leakage was stopped and the sculpin was eased back up to 250 feet. The rudder and planes began working again. But from other parts of the ship, reports of broken gauges, grounded motors, and electrical shorts reached the control room. They were having trouble slowing down the propellers. At this speed, the Japanese would surely pick them up on their sound gear. The chief electrician climbed into the electrical cubicle and removed a nut that had come loose and fallen off, jamming the controller. That slowed the screws, cutting down the noise and reducing the risk of being detected. Soon the depth charges stopped and the convoy moved south. A few days later, the Sculpin spotted a merchant ship, but missed with two torpedoes. Then a few days after that, they fired at a large destroyer, missing once again. The destroyer turned and came after them, dropping five depth charges, the first two coming very close, shaking the ship so badly that the starboard shaft began to squeal and give away their location. Suddenly, Gordy heard a noise coming from the aft part of the ship, a loud metallic banging against the hull. Bam! 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 The noise was sure to give away their position if it hadn't already. He heard loud voices. Somebody grab him! Quick! Then there was the sound of a struggle. In the aft torpedo room, one of the crew had been overcome with panic and the crushing fear of dying at the bottom of the ocean 8,000 miles from home. The man had picked up a wrench and begun wildly banging on the side of the hull, getting in several clean hits before the men around him tackled him and pinned him to the deck. To keep him under control, they dragged him to the mess area and bound and gagged him. The depth charging stopped, and the sculpin escaped to calmer waters and received a message to move southeast of Timor and head for Australia for desperately needed repairs to men and equipment damaged by the depth charging. Later, Captain Chappelle would write in his report about the repeated failure of the torpedoes. If the truth be told, the commanding officer was so demoralized and disheartened from repeated misses he had little stomach for further action until an analysis could be made and a finger put on the deficiency or deficiencies responsible and corrective action taken. For Gordy, his first two war patrols had been worse than anything he could have imagined. He wished he'd never volunteered. Part 3. Assignment Grenadier 9. Chuck Vervalen, USS Grenadier Chuck was eager to end this patrol aboard the Gudgeon. It was the sub's 53rd day at sea. The previous three patrols had been 50, 52, and 20 days in duration, and to this point in the war, August 1942, no other American submarine had spent as much time on patrol or survived so many depth charges. The Gudgeon's previous patrol had been at Midway Island in early June one of twelve subs assigned to protect the island from an expected Japanese invasion that had been detected by American codebreakers. The battle turned out to be the first decisive American victory in the war, with four Japanese carriers sunk and over three hundred planes lost. Chuck stood on the deck as the ship eased into the harbor in Fremantle, a small town located fifteen miles south of Perth on the west coast of Australia. This last patrol had been a harrowing one. With ten other subs, the Gudgeon had been patrolling the waters west of Truk, an island to the north of New Guinea. After a failed attack on two large transports, they were counterattacked by two destroyers that dropped a total of sixty depth charges, many of them rattling the ship. A severe storm was the only thing that saved them. Leaks occurred throughout the ship, and in the words of the executive officer, Dusty Dornan, the crew was shaken up considerably. 
it would be Chuck's last patrol aboard the Gudgeon. In early 1942, the people of Australia faced the danger of invasion from Japanese forces rapidly pushing south. These fears intensified with the fall of Britain's supposedly impregnable fortress of Singapore and the capture of 15,000 Australian troops. Then, on February 19th, Japanese planes bombed Darwin on the northern coast, an attack seen as a prelude to a full-scale invasion. With most of their military already stationed overseas, Australians knew they were vulnerable to a war fought on their home soil. Word spread of the Japanese atrocities in China and Korea, with millions slaughtered. The country had unprotected coastlines and no hope for protection from its motherland, Britain, which was fighting for its own survival. Nor could they count on the Dutch, who had already lost their homeland to the Germans and were seeing their resistance crumbling in the Dutch East Indies. To protect against an invasion, citizens of Perth and Fremantle did what they could in setting up a defense, erecting barbed wire entanglements on the beaches, digging slit trenches, blackening streetlights, and installing air raid alarms. Australia now looked to America as the keystone of the effort to stop the Japanese advance. But the Americans were battle-scarred and in retreat as well, having been run out of the Philippines and forced to depend heavily on a submarine fleet armed with inexperienced leadership, exhausted crews, and defective torpedoes. The arrival on March 3, 1942, of the submarine tender Holland followed by Gordy Cox's ship, the Sculpin, inaugurated Fremantle as the U.S. Navy's primary submarine base for the rest of the war, a place for the Navy to repair damage, assess losses, heal wounds, and find temporary relief from the stress of war. In addition to a good harbor and sufficient piers, Fremantle had the advantage of being outside the range of land-based Japanese aircraft. The American sailors were universally welcomed in Perth and Fremantle, greeted with huge relief, gratitude, and an almost starry-eyed ecstasy. The citizens took pleasure in seeing American uniforms on the street. As more and more submariners arrived, hotels, taxis, and cabarets all thrived. To house the sailors on leave, the Navy rented out entire hotels. Organizations fell all over themselves to treat the Americans well. A giant Fourth of July celebration was held at the Perth Zoo. Within a few short months, the Americans had become a pervasive presence. About the only place this wasn't recognized was in the newspapers. Because of security issues, the government was censoring coverage of the American arrival, and most of the time the press pretended the Americans hadn't arrived. But an article in the Fremantle Sentinel titled The Anglo-Saxon Race, America and Australia Unite, defied the censorship. The Americans are well-liked here, and on all sides favorable comments can be heard. The recent arrivals are a fine type of men, particularly well set up and also smartly uniformed. The absence of heavy drinking, and also the fact that they have friendly manners, these things are winning for them much appreciation. These men are certainly a good type, well-paid and mostly skilled men. The Australian press made every attempt to paint the notion of Anglo-Saxon superiority repeatedly warning about the yellow peril and the savagery of the myopic, slant-eyed Asians. Nobody was more impressed with the superiority of these newly arrived men than Australian women. It was widely known that each new ship was greeted by a welcoming chorus of admiring females. With so many Australian boyfriends, husbands, and lovers gone to war, the women had been deprived of local male company and the newcomers personified the Hollywood dream. They were described as handsome and worldly, a mixture of vulnerability and brashness, usually somewhat courtly in their manners, somehow less crude than the Australian men they were used to. Plus, the Americans had money to burn. The wartime pay of submariners was three or four times the pay of local men, and the sailors didn't hesitate to spend it, treating the women to fancy presents and expensive entertainment. The ultimate dream for many of these women was to hook one of these men and eventually move to America. Relationships quickly developed, ranging from the intensely romantic to the coldly commercial. There were six brothels on Rose Street in Perth, but unlike in Hawaii, attractive local women were available and eager. Most of the men visiting the brothels were older sailors, the guys Chuck liked to say, 
didn't want to waste time going out with nice girls to sip tea. Sexual liaisons became common knowledge, and it didn't take long for conventional morality to crack under the American presence. Married women, their husbands off to war, also seemed eager to participate in this new social order. Perth Fremantle was described as a living lab for demonstrating that during wartime, inhibitions break down. Some of the Americans exhibited a self-confidence that bordered on arrogance, but the Australians were willing to tolerate the occasional bad behavior and bravado. Of course, not all of the servicemen were just about sex and romance. Most of the men were homesick and lonely and sometimes scared, looking for nothing more than the warmth of human contact. Many were invited to private homes for a meal or an evening of talk. Chuck met a pretty blonde girl from South Perth who invited him to her parents' house. He appreciated the home-cooked meal, but he also felt a little guilty because he was really only interested in the girl for, as he put it, shacking up. For Chuck, the two-week leave in Perth had been a wild time. Most of the Gudgeon's crew had stayed at the Wentworth Hotel downtown, and he spent his nights drinking and chasing women, amazed at how many attractive and available women he'd been able to meet. During the day, he usually went to the beach or to the racetrack. He still harbored hopes of getting involved in harness racing after the war. Another daytime diversion for the sailors was going out in the countryside to hunt kangaroo. Chuck tried it once, but he never even got close enough to a kangaroo to fire his Navy rifle. But he still fared better than one of his crewmates, who opened fire on something moving behind a thicket, only to discover he'd just killed a local farmer's prize horse. By October 1942, Chuck had been in Australia for two happy months. He'd transferred off the gudgeon to the Pelias, a submarine tender. He was serving on a relief crew responsible for repairing the subs that came into port, readying them to go back into battle while their crews went on leave. Being on a relief crew was a common rotation for men who'd been under the stress of patrol, giving them a break before sending them back into combat. Chuck's job was helping to overhaul the diesel engines. He was enjoying the respite, but he was also getting anxious to go back out on patrol, back to a higher sense of contribution to the war effort. But on this day, he wasn't thinking about torpedoes or evading depth charges. He was fixated on spending the evening with 19-year-old Gwen Howey, a wavy and dark-haired, brown-eyed beauty he'd met a few days earlier when he and a shipmate were strolling through an arcade in Perth. A private in the Royal Australian Women's Army who served as a messenger and secretary to the base commander, Gwen had been walking with a friend, and even though she was wearing her unflattering green wool army uniform, Chuck thought she was just about the prettiest thing he'd ever seen. He got her number, and when he called to ask her out to a movie, she accepted, requesting that he pick her up at her house so that her family could meet him. Gwen was the middle child of three sisters. Her mother was from England, and to help the family get through the tough times, often took in laundry and ironing. Gwen had warned Chuck about her father, a strict Irish Catholic and an ex-rugby player who'd owned racehorses before the Depression, but who went broke because, according to him, the Filipino jockeys he'd hired had lost all his money by throwing races. Now he traveled the countryside shearing sheep. He had always closely monitored Gwen's dating, regularly taking her to the neighborhood priest for lectures on morality and proper behavior, and once, when he spotted her laughing and having a good time with a boy from the neighborhood, he gave her a whipping with a whip. Chuck was prepared to be on his best behavior. Like most Australian girls her age, Gwen was fairly ignorant about America. Most of what she knew had come from Hollywood films, which portrayed a mostly rich, glamorous lifestyle, with no images of the grinding poverty that Chuck and many of the other sailors roaming the streets of Perth had lived through. Her first impression of Chuck fit the image, handsome and well-mannered, nicely paid, a young man willing to risk his life to save her country from the Japanese. She'd heard stories about the atrocities at Nanking and that the Japanese were cannibals, celebrating their conquests by ceremonially eating some of the vanquished. For her, these brave American men, risking their lives, were heroes. Chuck approached the front door of Gwen's house in Victoria Park, a working-class section of Perth. He checked to make sure his uniform was just right 
desperately wanting to make a good impression on Gwen's parents. Entering the house, Chuck introduced himself to her family. From his fellow sailors, he'd learned the advantage of showing up with gifts to sweeten the first impression. Perhaps as much as anything, the Americans' long-term impact in Australia would be measured in what they introduced into Australian culture. Coca-Cola, hamburgers, peanut butter, spaghetti and meatballs, and American brand cigarettes. To Gwen's sisters, Chuck gave chewing gum. To her father, he presented a cigar and a five-cent pack of Lucky Strikes. To her mother, he gave candy. As Gwen went to get a sweater, her mother followed her into a back bedroom. A moment later, they both emerged wearing sweaters, both of them moving toward the door. Chuck looked puzzled. He held the door open for them, quickly getting the picture. Gwen's mother would be joining them on their first date. They went to see Cary Grant in Penny Serenade. Chuck ushered Gwen to their seats. Her mother took a seat two rows behind them. Along with everyone else in the theater at the start of the movie, they stood for the singing of God Save the Queen. He could feel her mother's eyes boring into him from behind. After the movie, they headed straight home. On the front porch, Gwen's mother stood right next to her. Chuck politely thanked them for a nice evening, then watched as they retreated inside. Clearly this wasn't the first date he'd imagined. Still, he was totally smitten and determined to see Gwen again. It had been three months since that first date, and he was still head over heels. Being in love was a new experience for Chuck. He'd been infatuated with Irene back in high school, but that was kid stuff compared to this. At night he went to sleep thinking about Gwen, and when he opened his eyes in the morning, she was the first thing on his mind. Their time apart always dragged. They didn't get to see each other for fifty-one days at the start of 1943. He was in the Java Sea on his first patrol aboard the Grenadier, the sub he'd been assigned to after serving on the subtender Pelias for a month. He would lie in his bunk thinking about places they'd been together, especially Leighton Beach and its idyllic long white beach and gentle warm surf where they'd gone several times. Sometimes when he thought about her, he actually felt a chemical rush. And this wasn't just lust. They'd finally shared their first kiss, but Gwen had made it very clear that she would remain a virgin until her wedding night. That was fine with Chuck. He'd even talked to Gwen's commanding officer, who'd requested to see him to ask his intentions with Gwen. He assured the lieutenant that his motives were honorable. He'd told his friends that she was the marrying kind, and besides, on some of the nights he wasn't with her, she didn't get much time off, he had other opportunities to satisfy his physical needs. On a couple of occasions, he even had dates with two women the same night, getting off a streetcar with one to meet another on the corner. He rationalized this behavior the same way many of his fellow servicemen did. He could die tomorrow, so why hold back? After all, he and Gwen weren't officially engaged or anything. In fact, the subject of marriage hadn't been brought up yet, nor had he actually uttered those three little words. Chuck was glad to be assigned to the Grenadier. When he enlisted, he'd said he'd consider staying in the Navy if he made second-class chief petty officer by the end of his six-year hitch. He liked the work and the challenge of learning the intricacies of the submarine. He felt a sense of purpose and a bond of brotherhood with the other men in the crew. He felt part of an elite fraternity that regular citizens couldn't understand. How could others possibly know the helpless quivering in your gut while lying several hundred feet beneath the ocean's surface with explosions shaking every rivet of your ship and driving your heart right past your throat into your mouth? They couldn't. Upon first being transferred off the gudgeon, Chuck missed the buddies who'd been with him on that first patrol when they were the first American warship to sail out of Pearl Harbor. In comparison, his new crewmates on the Grenadier seemed inexperienced, many of them on their first patrol. But he had confidence in its hard-nosed skipper, Captain James Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald wasn't a leader who demanded respect, he earned it, and he was friendly and accessible to his men. He was only five feet seven inches, but as a collegiate boxing champ he had gained a hard-as-nails reputation. One of the officers on the ship, Lieutenant Al Toulon, called him a little bantam with a tough face. On that first patrol up into the Java Sea, there was a calm professionalism about Fitzgerald that Chuck appreciated. 
a leader not likely to buckle under the pressure, yet maybe a little more approachable than the other skippers he'd served under. Once, while walking with Gwen in Perth, he'd run into Fitzgerald, and when he introduced Gwen, he was struck by how friendly and polite the captain had been. Chuck slowly untied the bow of the little package Gwen had just given him. It was March 19th, 1943, and Chuck knew that sometime within the next 48 hours he would be shipping out on his second patrol aboard the Grenadier. The crew never knew precisely when they would sail. Departure times were kept secret during wartime, but they usually knew within a couple of days. He had traded with a crewmate to get this time off, and Gwen's commanding officer had generously granted her request for the evening off to be with Chuck. It seemed that Chuck had made a favorable impression on his visit. Chuck opened the small gift box and removed a St. Christopher's medal, a symbol of devotion to the patron saint of travelers, including sailors. He slipped the chain over his neck. It's weird, he said. For the last few days, I've had a feeling that something is going to happen on this patrol. Like what? I don't know. It's just a feeling that won't go away. Why do you think that is? He took her by the hand. Probably because for the first time in my life I have somebody I really care about. It was the closest he'd come to saying he loved her. She put her finger to his lips. You're going to be all right, she said, and I'll be waiting for you when you get back. He rubbed the medal. I'll never take this off, he promised. 10. Bob Palmer, USS Grenadier Waiting on the pier at Hunter's Point in San Francisco Bay, Barbara Palmer could barely contain herself. It was April 29, 1942, and the submarine tender USS Pelias, with her husband Bob on board, was due in from Pearl Harbor within minutes. He was scheduled to be home on leave for three weeks, and they planned to cram as much living as possible into their time together. She'd even rented a studio apartment for the two of them in the same building on Pine Street where she'd been living with her Aunt Fern and Cousin Margie. A month earlier, she'd written and told him that she'd had a miscarriage. Maybe when the war was over she'd confess to the abortion, but not now. The procedure had taken place without any complications, and in fact she walked the two miles from the clinic back to her apartment afterward, in high heels. Bob was proud to be part of the war effort, and especially proud to be part of the crew of the USS Tuna, as good a group of men as he ever hoped to serve with. But when he learned that the Pelias was returning from Pearl Harbor to Mare Island for repairs, he saw a chance to get back home to see Barbara. He'd thought about her constantly, especially after getting her letter about the miscarriage. He wasn't trying to escape combat, but he'd finished the first patrol on the Tuna with an earache that needed medical treatment. That was the excuse he needed. On a building behind the pier where Barbara waited, two large signs offered evidence of the nation's war footing and fear of saboteurs. Loose lips sink ships and keep your trap shut. In San Francisco, an almost palpable paranoia had spread regarding enemy saboteurs with constant warnings to be on the alert and to report any suspicious behavior to the FBI. One sign warned, there is nothing too vile for Axis saboteurs to stoop to to achieve their evil purposes. Eleven days prior to Bob's homecoming, sixteen B-25 bombers under the command of Major James Doolittle had taken off from the USS Hornet and conducted a daring raid on Tokyo. After dropping their bombs, the planes flew to China, where they all ran low on fuel and the crews either crash-landed or bailed out. Although the raid inflicted minimal damage, None of the men were killed, and the raid helped lift the spirits of the American people. Doolittle received the Congressional Medal of Honor. In the weeks leading up to Bob's return, Barbara had seen signs of the war everywhere on the home front. Remember Pearl Harbor had become the great rallying cry and could be seen in almost every facet of propaganda, posters, pennants, napkins, patches, matchbook covers. The V for Victory sign had also become ubiquitous. People flashed it from cars, shops, sidewalks, recruiting rallies, and homes. Patriots hung banners in windows declaring that theirs was a victory home. Mothers put it on baby carriages. Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse flashed it in promoting war bonds. 
Little Orphan Annie encouraged kids to distribute V for Victory leaflets. Joe Palooka enlisted. Everywhere Barbara went in the first few months of the war, she saw anti-Japanese publications and drawings with depictions of buck-toothed Japanese. The anti-Asian racism that had been fermenting on the West Coast boiled over following Pearl Harbor, especially in California. Seventy-five percent, ninety-four thousand, of Japanese Americans lived in California, and despite whatever loyalty they had to America, they were automatically considered guilty of sedition. In the aftermath of December 7, 1941, they were harassed, assaulted, evicted, and denied basic needs such as food, clothing, medical care, and shelter. They suffered property damage to their homes and businesses and faced constant threats of mob violence and lynching. Although Barbara didn't actively participate in any of the overt discrimination, like most Americans, she had no sympathy for the Japanese. Why should she? Her husband was in constant peril of being blown to smithereens by one of their torpedoes or depth charges. On February 19, 1942, FDR had signed Executive Order No. 9066, prescribing the confinement of Japanese-American citizens in internment camps erected east of the Sierras. The roundup of these Japanese-Americans began in late March, with thousands hastily rousted from their homes, businesses, and farms, and carted off to assembly centers at Santa Anita and Bay Meadows racetracks before being shipped to permanent internment camps. A few pacifists objected to this treatment, but Lieutenant General James DeWitt, the commander of the West Coast Evacuation, countered, A Jap is a Jap. It makes no difference whether he's an American or not. Many of these Japanese Americans held to a belief that complying with their government's orders would confirm their loyalty to America, but it made no difference, even though no Japanese American was ever brought to trial on charges of espionage or sabotage. They were forced to adapt to primitive conditions in the internment camps, with overcrowding, barbed wire fences, and dirt and dust a way of life. Armed guards stood watch over them. They lived with rumors and threats, that they would all be sterilized, that they would all be shipped to Japan after the war. They started each dreary day with the Pledge of Allegiance. But none of that mattered to Barbara as she watched the USS Pelias ease its way to the dock. Bob had been gone for only three and a half months, but it seemed like an eternity. She was ready to bring him home to the privacy of her new studio apartment. Bob's leave in San Francisco flew by. He and Barbara crammed as much living and loving into three weeks as possible, including a trip home to Oregon. Although Cora didn't buy Barbara's story that she had suffered a miscarriage after an adverse reaction to a shot at the dentist, Bob did, or at least he didn't push for more details. He scored a few points with Barbara's dad when he helped him fix the carburetor on his car. At least that boy will always be able to get a job as a mechanic, said Mr. Kohler. At the end of the leave, Bob and Barbara both agreed that his departure this time was even more gut-wrenching than when he'd left right after they'd been married. On their last night together, she couldn't stop crying. Bob rode the Pelias back to Fremantle, where he worked on relief crews for two months before being assigned as the yeoman for the Grenadier. He was an enlisted man, just like the mechanics, torpedo men, and all the other guys who got their hands a lot dirtier on the job than he did, but he identified with the officers. His little office kept him in close proximity to the officers' quarters, and he talked to them frequently, taking great pride in the service he provided. His logs were always grammatically perfect, thorough, and precise, with great attention to detail. As the recorder of the Grenadier's log, Bob had meticulously familiarized himself with the ship's design and history, taking pride in memorizing details and facts, such as that she was commissioned on May 1, 1941, and was 307 feet in overall length and 27 feet abeam, and had a surface speed of 21 knots. She had ten torpedo tubes, six forward and four aft, and carried one three-inch anti-aircraft deck gun and two anti-aircraft machine guns. After the initial shakedown exercises in the Atlantic, she sailed for the Pacific, and on February 4, 1942, she left Pearl Harbor on her first war patrol, commanded by Captain Alan Joyce, going closer to Japan than any Allied vessel since the beginning of the war, 
sneaking within one mile of the beach just north of Inubosaki Lighthouse. On her second patrol, she sank a large merchant vessel of 14,900 tons, then underwent a scary 23-hour depth charging, surviving a total of 70 blasts that damaged the propeller shaft, knocked out lights, caused leaks, and twisted the superstructure. After repairs back in Fremantle, the ship's third patrol was spent primarily on station around Truck and Toll Island and resulted in the sinking of a 15,000-ton tanker. Again, she survived a depth charging that severely shook the ship, returning to port on September 18, 1942. Bob joined the crew shortly after that. The primary object of the Grenadier's Fourth War Patrol, captained by Lieutenant Commander Bruce Carr, had been to lay a field of 32 mines in the approaches to the harbor in Haiphong, Indochina. The plant, one of the first submarine minefields of the war, was successfully executed at night as the Grenadier dodged junks and islands in water as shallow as 26 feet. Returning to base, the ship was forced to dive during another depth charging, the force of the blow as they hit bottom ruining the sound gear and causing chlorine gas to accumulate, which caused considerable suffering and breathing difficulties among the crew, but no permanent casualties. Upon reaching Fremantle, Lieutenant Commander Carr was relieved by Captain James Fitzgerald. As the Grenadier prepared to pull away from the pier at Fremantle to start its sixth patrol, Bob frantically looked through the drawers in his office. He couldn't find his wallet. It was March 20, 1943, and the Grenadier was headed for the Andaman Sea, from the Gulf of Martaban down through the Mergui Archipelago to the Strait of Malacca. Her assignment was to investigate and destroy enemy shipping. The Grenadier was the first American submarine assigned to the area. Bob checked his pants pocket, then his footlocker. He closed his eyes, trying to remember where he'd last had it. It didn't take long to figure it out. He'd left it at Leslie Phillips's house, on the nightstand where he'd emptied his pockets before tumbling into bed. He'd met Leslie a couple of nights earlier. He and Len Clark, his new best friend on the Grenadier, had been hitting the pubs in Perth, and living it up like sailors about to go back into enemy waters. They ran into Leslie and her friend Hazel at the Prince Edward Hotel. Bob and Leslie hit it off right away, and when Leslie invited him to come for dinner the next night, Bob didn't see the harm. He told her about Barbara, and she told him about her husband, who was fighting in North Africa. Her offer of a home-cooked meal was just too good to pass up. Bob put his hand to his neck and frowned, realizing that not only had he left his wallet at Leslie's, he'd left his ID and dog tags there, too. Not that he'd need any of that stuff on this patrol, but it was just irritating. He'd told Leslie he'd see her when he returned to port, so he'd pick up the items then. 11. Gordy Cox, USS Grenadier it took Gordy over a year from the time his hot and stinky patrol aboard the Sculpin landed in Fremantle until he was assigned to the Grenadier. During that time, he mostly worked on subtenders, helping ready ships to go back into combat. He had time to write a lot of letters home. April 3, 1942 I'm getting along okay, I guess. One day I'm cussing the Navy and everything else, and the next I feel almost happy. But I know one thing for sure, and that is that I'll never make good in the Navy. I just don't fit here. I guess you'll have to wait until I see you to find out where I've been and what I'm doing. Have you got any of that money that I sent? I've taken some pictures, but they won't pass the censors, so I can't send them. I've only received one letter since the war started. April 27, 1942 Everything is still okay on this end, so you have nothing to worry about. It's very quiet here now. It's hard to believe there's a war going on. I made seamen first the other day, which I should have done long ago. Gordy liked Fremantle. Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood, a popular can-do type of officer, was put in charge of sub-operations there. He had been associated with subs his whole career, and one of his first commands, despite contrary advice from naval brass in Washington, was to lease four hotels 
the Prince Edward, Wentworth, Ocean Beach, and Majestic, in the Fremantle, Perth area for the returning crews. He had made improving morale a high priority. The area had excellent recreational facilities, and there was no shortage of women. Gordy had been transferred to the tender Holland. He figured he'd been selected because he hadn't qualified yet. During the previous three months while on patrol, he'd tried to study, but with his duties on the ship, his difficulties with reading, and the constant stress of combat, he doubted whether he'd ever be able to qualify. On the Holland, he was assigned as a mess cook again, an assignment he wasn't happy about. He also spent four hours every night on watch. Even though Fremantle was beyond the range of land-based Japanese planes, the fear was that an attack could be launched from aircraft carriers. He continued to write home. May 5th, 1942. I hope you have stopped worrying about me. There's really not much reason to. You said yourself that when a person's time comes, it don't make much difference where they are. There sure isn't much to do over here. I've been trying to find a good pastime, but as yet I haven't. I've met a couple nice girls and their families, but liberty isn't very good and there isn't much to do when you do get over. All of the music over here was out before I left home. The Navy decided to move part of its fleet stationed at Fremantle, including the Holland, even farther south to Albany. Should a Japanese attack sink the tender Holland, the fleet would have no way to repair damaged subs. Gordy rode the Holland into Albany. From the deck he could see a small town surrounded by barren hills. The town, population 300, was only a couple of blocks long. The crew of the Holland numbered close to 600, and with an additional 150 men from two subs that had accompanied it south, plus a destroyer tender and its crew, the resources of Albany were overwhelmed. But its people were eager to be hospitable, believing the survival of their country depended on these American servicemen. With the ship moored in Princess Royal Harbor in King George Sound, the crew received liberty every fourth day. Almost daily, Gordy listened to crewmates venting about the bad torpedoes. But it wasn't just the crews who were upset. Admiral Lockwood also listened to his frustrated skipper's complaints about watching helplessly as faulty torpedoes either ran deep, fired prematurely, or were duds. Lockwood tried to get the Bureau of Ordnance to conduct torpedo performance tests, but they refused, blaming the skippers for not preparing and firing the torpedoes improperly. So Admiral Lockwood ordered his own tests, which showed conclusively that the torpedoes didn't work. But the Bureau of Ordnance still rejected the results and told Lockwood to halt his testing. He didn't, and the further testing eventually caught the attention of Admiral Ernest J. King, commander-in-chief of the U.S. fleet, who intervened. Finally, eight months after the war started, the Bureau of Ordnance admitted that the Mark 14 ran deep. The solution included installing new firing pins machined from a light, high-strength aluminum alloy using metal that reportedly came from the propellers of Japanese fighters shot down during the Pearl Harbor raid. Immediately, the number of sinkings increased dramatically. But the early course of the war had already been seriously compromised and the lives of thousands of submariners unnecessarily jeopardized, a mistake and scandal later described by naval historian Clay Blair, Jr. as the worst in the history of any kind of warfare. Gordy continued to write home regularly. June 14, 1942. I have a very nice girlfriend over here. Her name is Lindley Austin, Lynn for short. She's a pretty blonde. I go up and have supper with her and her parents almost every liberty and then go to the show or the dance. That's about all I do. July 9, 1942. I'd like to let you know where I am, but that would be impossible. I'm still going with Lindley Austin. We're going to a high school ball on Friday. I can't dance very good, but nobody knows the difference. I'm sending some more money for you to stick in the bank. If you need any of it, go ahead and take it. I've been to a few pictures lately, but they are ones I've seen before. A person has to do something to keep from getting any battier. I haven't been drunk yet, but it's a wonder. I've done almost everything else. I've written to almost all of my old friends, but never received any answers. I guess everyone has forgotten me. 
If you remember, please send me Reader's Digest and an algebra book. July 13, 1942 I still haven't heard from anyone back there. You can't realize how much I would like to get home right now. Guess there's a lot of fellows feel the same way. Gordy celebrated his 19th birthday in Albany. In August, American forces invaded Guadalcanal, and after a ferocious battle, they secured the island in the first major land victory of the war. Word of the triumph slowly reached the submariners in Western Australia, but Gordy was more focused on his own situation. He wanted off the Holland and out of Albany, and if that meant getting reassigned to a submarine and going out on patrol again, that was fine by him. He soon got the transfer he wanted, not to a submarine, but to another tender, the Pelias, back in Fremantle. As it was with so many American sailors in Australia, he said goodbye to his girlfriend, Lindley, both of them promising to stay in touch and keep the fire burning. On the Pelias, he was assigned to polishing brass. Each day he would sit on the forward deck and polish away for a couple of hours, then go hide and nap or write letters. October 20, 1942 to his brother Willie after their brother Larry had married. I hope you can keep a couple good-looking babes from getting married back there. I'd hate to have to steal somebody's wife when I get back. Keep the old town in one piece, and I'll help you tear it up when I get back. October 24, 1942 I have a friend who can sneak my letters past the censor so I can talk to you about the war. I'm now stationed in Fremantle, Australia. I was in Manila when the war started. I'm completely out of danger now. I'm hoping to get transferred again, but I don't know where I'll go after that. We were in Albany. That's where Lynn lives. I've only heard from Lynn once, and it's been almost two months since we left there, so I have practically forgotten her. I have figured out a way to tell you where I am, and will use it in the future. In the P.S., take the capital letter at the beginning of each sentence, and it will spell my location. The P.S. will have no meaning. Do you realize I have half my enlistment completed? I hope the war is over when my time is up. November 20th, 1942 Well, I don't seem to be getting anywhere in the Navy. My enlistment is half over and I'm still seaman. All the fellows I joined with are third or second class petty officers. Well, maybe if I hang around here long enough, they'll realize I'm here and give me a rate. It hasn't done any good to study. Tell Donald as to joining the Marines that it is entirely up to him, but if it were me, I would try to stay out of the service and get a job in defense work. One morning, just before he was to go on duty chipping paint, Gordy was sitting on a five-gallon can of paint thinner, nursing a hangover and feeling sorry for himself. With his head in his hands, he heard a voice speaking in an Australian accent. What's the matter, mate? He could see a pair of brown shoes and coveralls, and quickly learned that it was Lieutenant J.G., junior grade, in the repair crew. Figuring he might as well tell the truth, Gordy unloaded his complaints. After listening to him, the officer issued a stern rebuke. Sensing he had nothing to lose, Gordy asked to see the commander. The next morning he got his wish, and after stating his case again, he was surprised by the commander's response. You'll be at sea within a week, he said, and assigned him to the Grenadier, which needed several men for her next patrol. A few days before heading out on patrol with the Grenadier, Gordy wrote his mom again. March 17, 1943 I'm not the good little boy that left home, as you have probably gathered. I've been having a good time the last couple weeks, but it's about over. I won't be able to write for a while, but don't let that stop you from writing. 12. Tim Skeeter McCoy, USS Grenadier Tim got lucky. Punching an officer in a beer-fueled poker game was a remarkably dumb thing to do, but the fact that it was wartime and every hand was needed kept him from being severely punished. Instead, he was transferred off the trout and assigned to the subtender Pelias, which left Hawaii the next day bound for Fremantle, Australia. For the next several months, Tim worked on relief crews getting subs ready to go back out into battle and trying to stay out of trouble. 
It had been several months since the first American ships had arrived on the west coast of Australia, and they were mounting complaints from the locals about the American presence. The initial goodwill and tolerance were starting to wear thin. The sight of drunken sailors staggering down the street, some of them with young Australian girls on their arms, was getting old. In the first few months of the Americans' arrival, people had accepted the sexual flings and the loosening of morals, deeming it okay for local girls to have a frolic on the beach after the sun went down with a guy about to leave for war. For the most part, the warnings about the unrealistic hopes of falling in love and then galloping off to America went unheeded, and now the reality of fickle lovers, unwanted pregnancies, venereal diseases, broken hearts, and tear-jerking separations was beginning to take hold. Eventually, Tim got reassigned to the Grenadier, and he was on board as the ship headed out of Fremantle on its sixth patrol. Like his new crewmates Chuck Vervalen, Bob Palmer, and Gordy Cox, he had mixed emotions about this patrol. On the one hand, he was eager to get back in battle and feel he was contributing to the war effort. He had taken his work on the relief crew seriously, but he liked the danger and the rush of combat. He hated the Japanese. It wasn't because of anything that had happened to him growing up in Texas. He'd never even seen one. This was a hatred born out of the destruction he'd seen at Pearl Harbor. To him, they were everything the propaganda had portrayed. Little, buck-toothed, slant-eyed savages. But while stationed in Fremantle, he, like Chuck, had found the love of his life, Valma Gray, a beautiful, blue-eyed redhead who had recently been crowned Miss Perth. They'd met at a dance, and he'd wasted no time in letting her know how he felt, telling her he wanted to marry her after the war and take her back to Texas with him. For her part, Valma was enchanted by Tim's courtly manners and enthusiasm. She also found his Texas accent endearing. From that night on, he'd spent every possible minute of leave with her. The night before leaving on this patrol, he'd proposed and given her an engagement ring. She'd accepted and promised she'd wait for him. The Grenadier left Fremantle on its sixth patrol on March 20, 1943. For the first seventeen days, there were no sightings of enemy ships. Then, on the night of April 6th, a small freighter of about 2,000 tons was sighted off Phuket Island. A surface torpedo was fired, and there appeared to be an explosion, followed by the wounded freighter firing at the Grenadier, its shells zinging over the sub or landing in its wake. The Grenadier returned fire from its deck, but when the freighter moved into shallow waters near the beach, Captain Fitzgerald ordered the ship to submerge and move to the safety of deeper water. The next sixteen days were again uneventful, with no sign of shipping in the area. Anxious to inflict damage on the enemy, Captain Fitzgerald sent a request to move to a more fruitful area. Then, on the moonlit evening of April 22, 1943, before the request to move was granted, the lookout spotted a worthy target, two large enemy freighters. Upon closer look, he saw they were unescorted relatively easy prey. Tim felt the rush of adrenaline when Captain Fitzgerald ordered the men to man battle stations. Fitzgerald was Tim's kind of captain, tough, straightforward, a look-you-in-the-eyes kind of man. His decision to aggressively pursue the freighters was not second-guessed. If the tide of the war in the Pacific was going to turn in America's favor, as it slowly had been since the Battle of Midway, then the mentality of the new breed of submarine skippers was that they needed to spearhead the attack, to be aggressive. Fitzgerald had gained even more respect from his crew earlier in the patrol when he confronted Thomas Trigg, a muscular mess cook from Texas and the only black on the crew. He was easily the most disliked man on board. The crew thought he was sullen and disrespectful. At the time, America was still a Jim Crow segregated country, and most of the men on board had never been around blacks. The Navy was still segregated, and on submarines a black could only be assigned as a mess cook, helping to serve the men and wait on the officers. It was not uncommon for someone to wake Trigg in his bunk and order him to bring coffee to the skipper. Most blacks in the Navy were compliant, but not Trigg. Built like a linebacker, he'd arrived on board with a chip on his broad shoulders, or at least that's how the crew described it, 
a chip nobody on board was eager to try to dislodge. Earlier in the patrol, when someone allegedly witnessed him spitting into the officer's soup, a livid Fitzgerald ordered him up to the bridge and challenged him to a fistfight, an invitation Trigg declined. Fitzgerald put him on notice that he had filled out court-martial papers and would file them when they returned to port. The incident had elevated Fitzgerald's standing with the crew even higher. Dawn had broken over the Strait of Malacca on April 23, 1943, when the Grenadier surfaced. The bright sunlight gave the promise of a warm, tropical day. Hours earlier, after encountering the two freighters, Fitzgerald decided to do an end-around on the surface to intercept them. But after getting into position and submerging, all he could see through the periscope was the plume of smoke of the two ships zigzagging away. He gave the orders to surface. Never mind that standard submarine procedure was to always stay submerged while in enemy waters, or that he was disregarding the fact that the enemy knew a submarine was in the area. Shortly after the sub surfaced, the lookout on duty, George Stauber of New York, spotted a Japanese dive bomber coming in their direction. It's coming in low out of the northwest, he informed the skipper. Fitzgerald hesitated briefly, waiting to confirm the sighting. As soon as he saw the plane, he gave the order to dive. All ahead emergency, he commanded. The bow plunged underwater, heading down at a steep angle. At 120 feet, the executive officer turned to Fitzgerald. We should be safe at this depth, he said. In the engine room, Tim heard a turbulent swishing noise. A second later, he heard a metallic click, the sickening sound of a firing mechanism activating. Then came the explosion, deafening like two trains colliding head-on at full speed. It was an aerial torpedo, a weapon weighing 1,900 pounds with a warhead of 500 pounds of TNT. Dropped from a low-flying torpedo plane and capable of hitting a submarine up to 300 feet beneath the surface, it was a hallmark of Japanese tactical effectiveness. The grenadier shook violently, listing hard to port, slamming Tim against the bulkhead and knocking other crew members off their feet. In an instant, the ship was going down, stern first, plunging toward the bottom of the ocean. The lights flickered and then went out. So did all electricity and power for propulsion. They were in total darkness, out of control and plunging toward the ocean floor. Behind Tim, two men were sprawled on the deck unconscious. Others struggled to their feet, groping for something to hang on to. Ceiling cork fell to the deck, light bulbs shattered, locker doors flew open. Men were cut and bleeding. Groans echoed through the compartments. At three hundred feet, the ship slammed into the ocean floor, quickly settling into the silt at a twenty-degree angle, bow up. A quick assessment by the crew revealed massive damage. The propeller shafts were seized in a vice-like grip pressed against a bulkhead, and with no propeller, the ship was dead. In the engine room, close to where the blast had occurred, tubes were bent, pipes ruptured, gauges and valves broken. In the radio room, somebody had forgotten to securely fasten the ship's radio transmitter, and the explosion had sent it flying against a bulkhead, smashing it beyond repair and leaving them with no way to radio for help. But the biggest problem was the salt water pouring through the loading hatch and other openings. To Tim, it sounded like Niagara Falls. If these hatches couldn't hold under the pressure, he was about to die a horrible death. He thought about Valma. Surprisingly, nobody was seriously injured from the initial explosion, and despite the massive damage, the ship and outer hull were still in one piece. Working frantically, the electricians quickly activated the emergency lighting, casting everything in an eerie red glow. Fire in the maneuvering room! a voice cried out. The smell of smoke rapidly permeated the ship. An electrical fire spread swiftly, sparks and short circuits popping everywhere. Tim knew that if the maneuvering room was lost, getting back to the surface would be impossible. Stay calm, encouraged Fitzgerald. Stay calm? They were in a submarine that was on fire on the ocean floor with salt water spraying into the engine room. All available hands man the bucket brigade. Fitzgerald ordered. Tim found comfort in Fitzgerald's voice, trusting his leadership. 
The plan was to move the excess water from the engine room to the forward torpedo room, which would hopefully balance the boat, the first step in getting back to the surface. The heat from the fire was intense, a temperature gauge now showing 120 degrees. Tim stripped to his shorts and stood in the bucket line between the motor room and forward torpedo room, passing along the buckets. There was urgency to the crew's efforts. If the water level reached the main propulsion motors, there was no chance of ever restarting the engines and no chance of escape. Adding to the peril was that the ship had come to rest on a shelf, dangerously close to deeper water, with a strong current pushing it in that direction. If they went over the shelf, the pressure would tear the ship apart. Men began to pass out from the heat and exhaustion. The ship's interior grew even hotter. The thermometer read 124 degrees. An hour passed, then another. Fighting against time, the crew continued its efforts to control the fire and balance the water level. They worked non-stop through the morning and into late afternoon. Men continued to drop from exhaustion, choking and gagging from the smoke. Still, they remained calm, everyone too busy to panic, and everyone still trusting the skipper. But the situation grew grimmer. Renewed efforts to free the propeller failed, and the available oxygen supply continued to diminish. If you're not working on the line, just sit still and conserve oxygen, ordered Fitzgerald. After fifteen hours on the ocean floor, and with all efforts to restart the engine and free the propeller unsuccessful, the captain devised a new plan to raise the boat back to the surface. His strategy was to blow the water from the main ballast tanks, which could make the ship buoyant enough to rise to the surface, where it would be easier to restore full power and fix the propeller. The necessary calculations were figured and refigured, but there were uncertainties. Maybe the ship was too embedded in the silt on the ocean floor to shake loose. Or maybe the crew had not bucketed enough water forward to balance the boat and allow it to rise on an even keel. Captain Fitzgerald waited until 2100 to give the order to blow the ballast tanks. If they did make it back up, it would be under the cover of darkness. Finally his voice boomed over the intercom. Stand by to surface. Close all vents. Open all flood doors. Blow all ballast tanks. Tim knew that if this plan didn't work, they were doomed. And even if it did work, they could still be doomed. Most likely the Japanese were waiting on the surface, ready to finish the job and send them back down to a watery grave. As the ballast water was blown out, Tim felt the grenadier shudder and then ever so slightly begin to lift. There was a momentary pause. She was either going to fall back to the ocean floor or rise to the top. The ship sank back to the floor. Fitzgerald wasted no time in repeating the procedure, but once again the ship failed to rise. With the air compressor failing, they were down to their last chance. Again the ship shuddered, but this time it broke loose and started to rise, slowly, floating toward the top like a cork. The crew cheered. Captain Fitzgerald was at the number one periscope as the grenadier neared the surface. A quick 360 degree revealed no enemy warships, just a few sampans in the distance. The ship broke on top. Permission granted for all hands to come topside, he announced. Tim stepped onto the deck, the warm tropical night air filling his lungs. He glanced at his crewmates. Standing nearby were Chuck Vervalen, Bob Palmer, and Gordy Cox, Three young men he barely knew, all shirtless, all sucking in the fresh air. None of them knew anything about the other's love life or home life or religion. But now, in the middle of a moonlit sea thousands of miles from home, they were together, more scared than they'd ever been. Their ship was dead in the water, deep in Japanese territory, and they all knew that with daylight would come the enemy. Part 4. Captured. 13. Chuck Vervalen, USS Grenadier. The Grenadier lay dead on the ocean surface. Only the slightest breeze blew across the Strait of Malacca. Standing on the deck, mechanics first mate Chuck Vervalen and the rest of the crew were drenched in sweat 
from the fifteen-hour ordeal in submarine hell at the bottom of the ocean. The coast of Malaysia lay a dozen miles to the east, but it might as well have been a thousand miles away. By Captain Fitzgerald's calculations, they had eight hours of darkness to try to restore power to the ship and escape to safer waters. Luckily, there had been no destroyer or escort ship assigned to the merchant ships, but most likely other enemy ships would be in the area, or planes patrolling from a nearby base. In the morning, the grenadier would be a sitting duck. Fitzgerald ordered the crew to gather around him. Men, it looks like I've got us in a hell of a mess, he said. Indeed, he had made two crucial errors. He had not retreated to safer waters after they'd been spotted, and he had surfaced in daylight. But nobody on the crew was blaming him. The first order of business was clearing the ship of smoke by opening all the vents and using the engines to help suction it out. The second task was readying the ship for a possible battle. The ship's biggest deck armament, a three-inch gun, had been knocked out of commission by the initial blast, but the twenty-millimeter gun was still operative. Below deck there were approximately twenty rifles, plus several handguns. Bring up all the guns, Fitzgerald ordered. We'll need all the help we can get. Chuck brought up a Browning automatic rifle. He'd been a great shot growing up and scored high in marksmanship at submarine school, but this rifle was nothing like the one he'd used to hunt squirrel for the family's dinner back in New York. On deck, Fitzgerald watched the sub's slow drift and its wide, phosphorescent wake. He heard the sound of the diesels, barely rumbling, echoing forward in the calm night. And he heard the soft silence of the bow wave, telling him what he already knew. His ship had little chance of regaining power. Efforts continued to fix the ship's radio. Without a working radio, there was no way to send out an SOS. Its transmitter had been severely damaged in the initial blast from the torpedo. The subsequent electrical fires had shorted out the receiver. Still, hope persisted that the radio could be repaired. All the frames, from the engine room through to the aft torpedo room, were badly bent inward. The torpedo hatches were damaged, the gasket so badly cut that Fitzgerald could slip his hand all the way between the knife edge and the hatch cover. All the hydraulic lines to the tubes, vents, and steering mechanism were ruptured. One of the mechanic's mates, Bernie Witzke, a rangy 19-year-old from St. Paul, Minnesota, looked like he'd slept in a vat of axle grease. In the mess hall, the shock of the explosion had knocked dishes and phonograph records to the deck, shattering most of them. Chuck knelt down and sifted through the pieces, shaking his head to discover that all of his favorites, Armstrong, Ellington, Crosby, Goodman, were broken. He found a Victrola submerged in the sink. He sat on a bench, the sweat rolling, drips trickling from his nose, a pool of perspiration collecting in his shoes. The cook had made sandwiches and coffee for the crew, but few of the men were eating, too consumed with repair tasks to think about food. Chuck hadn't been thinking about eating either, but when he walked by the table and saw a big can of peaches, he grabbed a soup spoon and dove in, the sweet, thick syrup soothing his parched throat. Most of the smoke had been purged from the sub, but the intensity of the heat and toxic air had taken its toll many of the men going about their business in a semi-dazed state, many still coughing. If all efforts failed to get the engines started again and the screws turning, Fitzgerald's plan B was to cobble together a set of sails and rig them to the periscope shears. They would hope to catch a trade wind and ride it to nearby Pilgrim Island or to the Malaysian shore. Once there, he could disembark the crew and blow up the ship. Even though Japanese forces had captured Malaysia, it was possible that the crew could find sympathetic Malaysians to provide them refuge until a rescue could be organized. Or if they couldn't make it to land, maybe they could sail to one of the sampans in the distance and commandeer it to shuttle the men to land. Efforts to repair the radio failed. Whatever was going to happen to them, nobody would know. Fitzgerald remained on the bridge for several hours, awake through the changing watches. At 2.30 a.m. he toured the boat, stopping in the engine room to offer encouragement. Returning to the deck, he cast a lonely figure, his granite jaw set, his slate-gray eyes relentlessly studying the sea.
Chuck knew that if the ship was to escape, the engines needed to be able to turn the shafts. Normally, it took only 450 amps to get it done. Finally, after several hours of hot, sweaty labor, they got one shaft to turn, but only barely, and it took 2,750 amps to accomplish that. The shafts had been bent too badly. At 0400, the bone-weary engineering officers and electricians reported to Fitzgerald on the bridge. Everything possible has been done to re-establish propulsion, reported Lieutenant Al Toulon. I believe there's nothing further we can do. Pass the word for all hands on watch to start rigging a sail, replied Fitzgerald. On the double. 14. Bob Palmer, USS Grenadier. Bob sat in the forward torpedo room. He had a gash on his forehead, and dried blood smeared his face. He'd helped gather canvas from all parts of the ship, mattress covers, tarpaulin from spare parts, torpedo covers, seat covering, and now he was part of the team assigned to cut and fit these pieces into a sail. Half the men snipped, the others sewed. Bob was on the sewing team. He had learned to handle a needle and thread as a boy, mending holes in his socks and breeches. Skipper's ready to try rigging a sail, someone yelled. This could work, Bob said, holding the makeshift sail aloft. As he helped carry the sail up to the deck, he coughed, still trying to clear his lungs. Dawn was breaking. The air was motionless, the sea like molten glass. Bob licked his finger and held it skyward into the gray-black morning, feeling nothing more than the slight chill of the waning night. When the sun came up, he hoped, so too would a breeze. Captain Fitzgerald was on the bridge, perched on a jump seat behind the conning tower, staring down over the bow at the work party of sailors, stringing up the sail along the lower guy wires to the antenna trunk. The patchwork sail was unlike anything he had seen when he was sailing in Chesapeake Bay as captain of the Naval Academy's sailing team. But there was no wind, and the sail hung limp. For the next two hours, as the sun came up, the sail would catch an occasional puff of wind, then go slack again. By 0800, all hopes of riding the wind to shore were abandoned. Fitzgerald began to consider the unthinkable, the last choice any captain wants to make, to abandon ship. His thoughts were interrupted by one of his lookouts, Enemy ship approaching from the northwest. Looks like a destroyer or a light cruiser. Captain Fitzgerald quickly gathered the entire crew on the forward deck and pointed toward the approaching ship, now about five miles to the northwest. He began to choke back tears. I'm sorry for this mess, he said. I just hope I can get us out of it. The men were silent. By Bob's figuring, the captain had two options. The first was to take the grenadier back down again, with the crew on board. If he did that, it was highly unlikely he could get it back up. The second option was to abandon ship. If they did that, the ship would fall into enemy hands. It would be the first American submarine ever captured. Neither Bob nor anyone else on the crew had received any training on what to do if forced to abandon ship, or if captured by the enemy. I want all important documents and papers destroyed, including all Australian money, said Fitzgerald. We can't let the Japs know where our home port is. Destroy any equipment that could help them. Bob hurried down the hatch, opening his foot locker and duffel bag, making sure to remove all his money, which wasn't much. A couple of officers weren't so lucky. A few nights earlier, Lieutenant George Whiting had won $800 in a poker game, but he had to stuff it in a bag to go overboard. It was the same fate for the $400 hidden inside a flashlight that Lieutenant Toulon, an Annapolis grad, had won in a cribbage game. Bob fought the temptation to stuff his pockets with mementos. He picked up a framed photo of Barbara, gave it a kiss, and set it on top of the bunk. Bob turned, distracted by what was going on behind him. Several of the men were passing a flask, Bob assumed it was Pink Lady. It dawned on him that these men passing the flask back and forth would most likely be drunk when they had to abandon ship. 
Chuck picked up the pillow on his cot and gently placed his watch under it in the middle, then set a picture of his parents to the left of it, a photo of Gwen to the right. Then he covered his little shrine back up with the pillow, giving it a pat as he turned and headed back up on deck. Bob entered his yeoman's cubicle and began frantically stuffing paper into a duffel bag. The ship's logs and records of the ship's patrols, targets, torpedoes fired, fuel intake, mechanical repairs, all data the enemy would definitely want. As the ship's yeoman, Bob had compiled this data. Now it was his job to destroy it. Lieutenant Kevin Hardy was also stuffing the ship's documents into a mailbag. To help it sink, he jammed rocks into the bag. The rocks were originally brought on board to weigh down bags of garbage thrown overboard during the patrol so the sub wouldn't leave traces of where they'd been. Bob put rocks in his bag, too, and he and Hardy both cut air holes in the bags to help them sink. With all hands on deck, Captain Fitzgerald stayed below, cradling a submachine gun. Making sure nobody was still down, he opened fire on vital equipment, radar, coding machine, cryptograph machine, anything he thought could give the enemy useful information. Bullets and shredded parts flew in every direction. When he was satisfied enough damage had been done, he headed up to the deck. 15. Tim Skeeter McCoy, USS Grenadier Tim picked up a framed photo of his new fiancée, the red-haired Miss Perth, and put the photo on a bunk. Then he headed to the deck. With every body and everything cleared out from below, Fitzgerald surveyed the situation on deck. The bags of data, money, and everything else that could betray their origin had been thrown overboard, destined for the ocean floor. To the northwest, the Japanese ship was still bearing down on them, although lookouts now recognized that it was not a destroyer or light cruiser as they had first thought, but some sort of merchant ship. To the starboard side, Tim noticed one of the bags with the ship's documents just bobbing like a cork in the water. It had floated too far from the ship to reach from the deck. Somebody's got to go out there and bring it back, said Fitzgerald. What about sharks? someone asked. Tim stepped forward. I'll do it. That Tim was the first to volunteer didn't surprise anyone. In his short time on the Grenadier, he had already gained a reputation as the first to run his mouth and the last to back down. He dove into the water and started swimming. Neither he nor anyone else on board had seen the sea snakes swimming nearby. Poisonous sea snakes. It took him a minute to reach the bag. From his spot in the water, he could still see the sub, but not the enemy ship in the distance. Pushing the bag in front of him, he turned and headed back toward the sub. Halfway there, he glanced to his left and spotted one of the snakes, five feet long and swimming parallel to him. He grabbed the bag, trying to shield himself. The snake moved closer. Tim didn't know that sea snakes are air breathers and that although they can swim under the surface, they must come to the top for air. Mostly they inhabit tropical waters and feed primarily on fish. Although not normally aggressive toward swimmers, they will attack if provoked their hinged mouths able to open as wide as a man's thigh. Unless treated with anti-venom, their bites can often be deadly. Frantically, Tim continued swimming toward the ship, the bag still with him. The men on deck watched helplessly, one eye on their crewmate, the other on the Japanese ship. Several of the men held rifles brought up from below deck. Two had machine guns, but no one wanted to risk a shot with Tim and the snake swimming too close together. Then, without saying a word, second mate George Stauber, the lookout who had first spotted the dive bomber and yelled out the warning to the captain, stepped toward the edge of the ship, a pistol holstered at his side. Raised in Ohio, he had scored high marks at the shooting range. He drew his six-shooter from his holster, extended his arm, and without seeming to aim, fired at the sea snake. It was a perfect shot, hitting the snake right in the head, blowing it to pieces. A few seconds later, Tim scrambled out of the water and back onto the ship, tossing the mailbag onto the deck. More weight and more holes were added, and it was thrown back into the water, where it sank immediately. Jap plane coming out of the northwest, yelled Bernie Witzke. Everyone turned to look, and there, about a mile away, another Japanese dive bomber was coming right at them. 
Tim spotted the two 100-kilogram bombs tucked under its wings. The grenadier was a sitting duck. Tim scrambled for cover behind the conning tower while the gunners took their position at the 20 millimeter. The men with rifles and machine guns crouched into position. Hold your fire until he's closer, ordered Captain Fitzgerald. The single-engine plane swooped in, taking a run up the port side. When it was a quarter mile away and at 65 degrees elevation, Fitzgerald thundered the word for the two 20 millimeters and two 30 caliber machine guns to open fire. A solid wall of fire erupted from the sub's deck, tracers streaking across the bright morning sky. The plane fired back. Tim heard the sound of bullets ricocheting off the deck and the clinking of bullets hitting the plane. Chuck swung his rifle into position. He'd shot a lot of rabbits and squirrels as a kid, so he knew he needed to aim in front of the plane. He fired, the gun's report echoing a foot from Bernie Witzke's head. Hit the goddamn Jap, not me, yelled Bernie. Chuck fired again. The plane was low and close enough that he could see the pilot's face. With so much fire bursting from the deck, he couldn't be sure if his shots scored a hit. He glanced up toward the conning tower, where Captain Fitzpatrick was firing away with his pistol like a gunslinger. The plane suddenly pulled its nose up sharply and changed course to the left, going around the stern to get into position for a run on the grenadier's port side. The gunners all held their fire until the plane was close enough again, then let loose with another fusillade, the machine guns wildly blasting away. He's dropping his bombs, Tim shouted. Standing nearby, Lieutenant Toulon quickly surveyed the trajectory. They're going to miss! They're going to miss! he yelled. The bombs drifted over the ship and exploded 200 yards off the grenadier's starboard side. The plane wobbled momentarily, then veered to the left, heading toward land. Fitzgerald ordered the men to cease firing. Tim took a deep breath. The Japanese ship was still bearing down on them. Fitzgerald ordered the men below deck one more time, instructing them to bring up as many mattresses as possible and toss them over the side. Tim wondered why, but did as instructed. Grabbing one end of a mattress, he glanced over and saw Bob Palmer furtively pull a bottle of pills out of his duffel bag and stick it in his pocket. Maybe it was for some kind of allergy, thought Tim. With the mattresses in the water, Fitzgerald gathered the men around him again. He glanced at the approaching ship, then at the faces of his men, many of them, including Tim, still not old enough to vote. Prepare to abandon ship, Fitzgerald instructed, voice cracking. The last order of business was to pass out the life preservers, belts that fit around the waist and inflated when the cord was pulled. With not enough to go around, the stronger swimmers were instructed to go without. Tim didn't take one. The rifles that had been brought up on deck and used to fire at the plane were thrown into the water. As Tim and the rest of the crew prepared to jump overboard, Fitzgerald ordered Chief of Boat Whiting below deck to open the vents. Down below, Whiting first hurried into the officers' quarters and found a Victrola and a stack of records that had not been damaged. He hustled to the ship's PA system and pulled a record out of one of the sleeves, then set it on the turntable. Upstairs, as the men readied themselves to go overboard, they heard the music, Glenn Miller's theme song, Moonlight Serenade. Tim remembered he and Valma had listened to that song the first night that they met in Perth, and the exhilarating rush he felt at having just met someone so beautiful. He crouched, ready to jump overboard. 16. Gordy Cox, USS Grenadier on his last trip below deck, Gordy pulled two pearl-handled knives from his footlocker. He'd bought them in Borneo when the Sculpin stopped to refuel after fleeing the Philippines. He also pulled out a ring his mother had given him for good luck when he left home in Yakima. Reluctantly, he tossed the ring and knives back into the footlocker and climbed up to the deck. With the sound of Glenn Miller wafting through the tropical air, he jumped into the water, surprised at how warm it was. He wasn't wearing a life belt. A rubber life raft loaded with cigarettes and sandwiches was lowered into the water behind him. Finally, with all the men off the ship and into the water, Fitzgerald gave the word to Whiting to open all vents. Treading water twenty yards away, Gordy heard a whooshing sound, 
then watched Whiting and Fitzgerald jump off the ship and swim away. It took just seconds for the grenadier to begin capsizing. First the stern went under, then the shears and conning tower, and finally the bow, all in stunning silence. Gordy felt sick. In the short time he'd been part of the grenadier crew, he felt closer to these men than to the men on the sculpin. Now their home was on its way to the ocean floor. Turning, he saw the Japanese ship, now less than a mile away. They're going to shoot us! someone yelled. The men swam in different directions, figuring they'd be harder targets if they spread out. Wearing just his dungarees and a t-shirt, Gordy swam toward the rubber raft. Trigg, the black mess cook, whose court-martial papers had gone down with the ship, was the only man in it. Trigg waved him away. There's not enough room, he yelled. Bob Palmer also approached the raft, and he too was shooed away. Goddamn nigger! Bob yelled, dog paddling away. Within ten minutes of the grenadier going under, the crew and its officers were spread out over a square mile, half clinging to mattresses, the rest floating with their life belts. Nobody seemed in peril of drowning, and no sharks had appeared, at least not yet. The sea snakes were keeping their distance. On a mattress nearby, Lieutenant Hardy, an Annapolis grad and liked by everyone on the crew, clung to the side with one hand. In the other, he held a water-soaked copy of Reader's Digest that he'd stuffed in his pocket before jumping overboard. He opened the pages and began reading the jokes from humor in uniform to the four other men clinging to the mattress. At first, they looked at him as if he was nuts, and then they started laughing. A shot fired from a deck gun startled Gordy. He waited for more shots, but none came. Then the ship turned and heaved closer, it was a merchant ship that had been converted into a corvette, a highly maneuverable armed escort, lighter than a destroyer. Its flag with the rising sun of the Empire was clearly visible. The ship completed another turn, and then the engine stopped. Gordy was one of the men closest to the ship, and he looked up and saw a rope ladder swing down over the side. On the deck, two Japanese seamen standing behind mounted machine guns signaled him and the others to start climbing up the ladder. Gordy waited for an order from Fitzgerald, but unable to spot him, he swam to the ship, followed by several other men and more swimming in that direction. He reached up and grabbed the bottom rung, then started his climb up, his arms weary from his two hours in the water. As Gordy reached the top of the ladder, a Japanese seaman grabbed his arm and jerked him over the ship's rail and onto the deck. He scrambled to his feet, now face to face with a seaman and his rifle and bayonet. As he glanced around at the other Japanese, his first thought was how short they all were. The Japanese seaman moved toward him, jabbing the air with his bayonet, barking orders in Japanese. Gordy stood frozen, not understanding the instructions. The man continued yelling, then swung his rifle, the butt smashing Gordy in the shoulder, knocking him to the deck the bayonet now an inch from his nose. The seaman motioned him to stand up and take off his clothes. Gordy removed his T-shirt and dungarees. The guard signaled him to keep going. Gordy took off his skivvies. Totally naked, he glanced at his crewmates, who were also being ordered to strip as soon as they climbed aboard. They did as instructed, heaping their clothes into a big pile. The guards stood around them, bayonets pointed at the men. They were ordered to sit in rows, officers and crew together, knees to their chests, arms on knees, heads down. The sun was now full in the cloudless sky, and it was hot, very hot. Gordy thought about his mother. How long would it be, he wondered, before she found out that he'd been captured? Would the Navy inform her, or would she figure it out when his letters stopped coming? But mostly he wondered what the Japs were going to do with them. By his count, there were six guards with rifles and fixed bayonets and two mounted fifty caliber machine guns all aimed at the crew. Maybe the Japs would decide their prisoners were too much trouble and were going to shoot them and throw their bodies overboard. But that seemed unlikely. No American submarine crew had ever been captured, so this would probably be a big deal for the Japs, not only a great propaganda tool, 
but also a chance to gain information about the strategy and technology of American submarines. Soon the ship headed full steam toward Malaysia, then called Malaya. Sitting in the middle of the crew, Captain Fitzgerald watched the guards, and when they turned their backs, he spoke in a hushed voice. Don't give them any information, he instructed. Just name, rank, and serial number. If they ask the name of our ship and where we're stationed, tell them it's the USS Goldfish and that we're stationed in San Francisco and we're on a photo reconnaissance mission. They'd been on board for an hour, maybe more. The deck of the main hatch they sat on was blistering hot and they were starting to get sunburned. Gordy was beginning to get the idea that this ragtag crew of Japanese seamen didn't know what to do with them. Captain Fitzgerald stood up and identified himself as the ship's commander. He was taken at gunpoint down below. Within minutes, Gordy and the rest of the crew heard him scream in pain. The ship continued its course. For Gordy and others, it had been more than twenty-four hours since they'd eaten. In the early afternoon, a tin of cigarettes was passed around, each man getting one cigarette, lighting it off the nearest man. When they were finished, a guard collected and counted the butts, making sure nobody had stashed one away. After several hours, they each received one cup of water and another cigarette, as well as a hardtack biscuit. Most devoured the biscuit quickly, but Gordy saved his, figuring he'd need it later. After a while, a guard brought up a five-gallon bucket to use as a toilet. Late in the afternoon, a guard motioned for the men to put their clothes back on. Rummaging through the messy pile, Gordy knew he'd have no chance of finding his own thirty-inch waist pants. He settled on a pair with a thirty-four-inch waist, cinching a belt tight, its excess length hanging halfway to his knees. As the sun disappeared below the horizon, a guard ordered the men to lie down on the deck. Gordy hadn't slept in thirty hours. Exhausted, he quickly fell asleep awakening just before dawn as the motion of the rolling ship stopped and the engines went into reverse. The ship shuddered. It had pulled into a harbor. Still lying down, Gordy heard voices coming from a dock. He rose to his knees to look, but a guard shoved him back to the canvas hatch cover. Other guards, more emboldened, moved between the rows of men, randomly selecting men to slap across the face or hit in the back with their gun butts. A guard yanked Gordy to his feet and shoved him toward the starboard side of the ship. It was still dark, but Gordy could see soldiers on the dock. A guard tied his hands behind his back and blindfolded him, then did the same to everyone else in the crew. Following the men in front of him, Gordy stumbled down the gangway and along a rutted road toward a waiting convoy truck. Unable to see, he felt a hand on his back, someone pushing him up into the back of the truck. Half the crew was loaded onto one truck, the other half onto another, all of them still blindfolded with hands tied. Squeezed in between Chuck Vervalen and Bob Palmer, Gordy felt the truck begin to roll down the rutted road. Part 5. The Convent on Light Street 17. Chuck Vervalen, P.O.W. Jammed in tight with his crewmates, Chuck Vervalen bounced along the bumpy road in the back of a convoy truck, blindfolded, hands tied behind him. He heard a whisper that they had landed on Penang, an island of Malaya. Another convoy truck with the other prisoners followed. Known as the Pearl of the Orient, in 1941 Penang was a tropical island paradise filled with lush vegetation and exotic beaches, a popular destination for Asian travelers drawn by its sparkling sea and powdery white sand. It had been under British rule until the Japanese invaded in 1942. The balmy air held a sweet fragrance, reminding Chuck of the orchids he'd smelled walking down Hotel Street in Honolulu. After a short ride, the truck abruptly stopped. A Japanese soldier opened the back flaps and ordered the men out. Other soldiers untied their hands and removed their blindfolds. The morning sunlight filtered through a grove of coconut palms. Chuck eyed a complex of beautiful white buildings that looked like a school or convent. Brandishing rifles with fixed bayonets, soldiers hustled the crew through a large, solid wooden gate that opened onto an open grass courtyard, a setting that was serene, 
almost spiritual. Chuck's knees shook. Before the Japanese commandeered it during their invasion, the convent on Light Street was a prestigious Catholic school for girls, noted for a devotion to the arts and its botanical gardens. Located on several acres of land close to the harbor, it was named after Captain Francis Light, who first claimed the island for the British in 1786. Scrubbed white buildings with sturdy columns and arched corridors bordered a grass courtyard filled with coconut, mango, palm, fig, and breadfruit trees. Wild orchids scented the air, and the sound of waves drifted in on a gentle sea breeze. Chuck felt a gnawing in his stomach. During the Depression, many nights he went to bed hungry, but that hunger was different. Back home, he knew the next day would somehow provide something to eat. This was a different kind of hunger. All he'd had to eat since the ship had been torpedoed forty-eight hours earlier was a bowl of cling peaches and a hardtack biscuit. Word quickly spread that they'd be served breakfast soon. Inside the grounds, the crew was separated. The officers, who'd stepped forward to identify themselves, were led to a room upstairs, and the rest of the men were divided into two groups and placed in adjoining rooms that had been used as classrooms before the invasion. The rooms were empty now, with barren white walls and concrete floors. Shuttered windows faced the open courtyard. Four guards, armed with rifles and bayonets, ordered the men in Chuck's room to form two lines and stand at attention, shoulder to shoulder. These guards wore different uniforms than the guards on the ship. Chuck figured that they were part of the Japanese army, and from the stories he'd heard, an army that could be brutal. Slowly, one of the guards walked down Chuck's line, glaring at each man. Next to Chuck, Gordy shifted his feet to get comfortable. The guard spotted the movement and moved in front of him. Without warning, he swung his rifle butt and caught Gordy on the jaw. He crumpled to the floor. The guard kicked him in the ribs, then motioned for him to get back on his feet. Chuck reached down to help his crewmate up. Bad mistake. The guard rifle-butted him across the back, buckling his knees and bringing tears to his eyes. For the next four hours, Chuck and everyone else in the room stood at attention, staring straight ahead. Every time someone moved or looked anywhere but straight ahead, they got a rifle-butt in the back or to the stomach. Chuck struggled to stand straight, his whole body aching from the strain. Another hour passed and new guards entered, bringing with them a renewed sense of arrogance and brutality. One of them stood directly in front of Chuck and glared. Chuck stared straight ahead. The guard screamed, then smashed him in the face with his fist. Chuck staggered but didn't go down, quickly retaking his place in line, standing at attention, not daring to wipe the blood streaming from his nose. Dusk came, the light in the room was turned on, and the men still stood at attention. There was still no food or water. One of the men passed out, falling to the floor in a heap. A guard ordered the men next to him to pull him back up to his feet and support him in an upright position. These orders were given in Japanese, and although nobody on the crew spoke the language, they could decipher the meaning from the gestures and the situation. Other men passed out as well, and they too were propped back up by their crewmates. Through the night they stood, the guards taking turns walking up and down the lines, randomly stopping to punch someone, sometimes in the face, sometimes in the stomach. By dawn, everyone had been knocked to the floor at least once, each collapse greeted by laughter from the other guards. Daylight brought the hot tropical sun, draining the strength of the men even more. Still, no one brought them food. It was Chuck's turn to go to the head, this had been the men's only respite, a trip made three at a time, out the door and down the corridor to the left accompanied by a guard. The head was a small windowless room containing only a toilet. Chuck and the other two men squeezed inside, shutting the door. The guard stood outside. While the other men urinated, Chuck quietly lifted the tank lid. Using both hands, he scooped out a handful of tank water and poured it into his mouth, swallowing slowly savoring each drop. The other men did the same. 
The second day passed, and the men had still not been allowed to sleep or eat. Like almost everyone else, Chuck had a black eye and a swollen lip. On the third day, the shutters on the window were opened, and he looked out onto the courtyard. Two guards appeared, holding a stumbling man in khakis between them. His face and arms were a mass of bruises, his eyes swollen shut. He had been beaten almost to the point of being unrecognizable. It was Captain Fitzgerald. Dragging him across the grass, the guards stopped next to a long wooden bench. Two other guards stood alongside, holding clubs the size of baseball bats. Fitzgerald was placed on the bench. Then, on signal, the guards started raining down blows on his arms, legs, and chest like they were driving a circus tent stake. It was a contest to see who could hit the hardest and make the captain scream the loudest. Five, ten, thirty blows. They took a breather and started again. Chuck felt like throwing up. The beating lasted ten minutes. Then a guard took two leather straps and tied Fitzgerald to the bench, his head dangling over the edge. He was barely conscious. Another guard raised one end of the bench, elevating Fitzgerald's feet above his head at a thirty-degree angle. A guard carrying a tea kettle approached. With one guard holding a hand over Fitzgerald's mouth, another slowly poured the water out of the tea kettle up his nose. He coughed and choked, flailing his arms, desperately gasping for air. Each time he moved, a guard hit him. Then another poured more water up his nose. When the kettle was empty, they refilled it and poured it again up his nose. And again. And again. Finally, Fitzgerald passed out. Dragging the captain slowly back across the courtyard, the guards smirked, knowing they were being watched. They pulled him up the stairs and out of sight. 18. Bob Palmer, P.O.W. The crew nicknamed the meanest guard Goldtooth Maisie because of the gold cap on one of his front teeth. When the light hit it just right, it sparkled, and he liked to flash it when he glared at the crew. On this morning, he'd chosen Bob Palmer to pull out of line. Slowly, he ran his bayonet down Bob's forehead, pressing just hard enough to break the skin and leave a trickle of blood. Bob felt the cold steel continue down the midline of his face, between his eyes and down his nose, stopping on his upper lip. Goldtooth Maisie held it there for several seconds, grinning, flashing his gold tooth. Then, with a quick upward flick, the sharp edge of the bayonet ripped into the bottom of his nose, blood squirting everywhere. Goldtooth Maisie shoved him back in line. For three days Bob had been a captive, and for three days he had not eaten or slept or even sat down except on the ship. But his suffering was not nearly as bad as that of his crewmate, Charles Taylor, who'd gotten a bad case of gonorrhea in Fremantle. He had been trying to treat it with sulfur pills while on patrol, without much success. It had gotten much worse since being captured. His testicles had swollen to several times their normal size. To help relieve the pressure, he'd torn a hole in the crotch of his pants. His testicles had turned a grotesque purplish-blue, extending like an eggplant out of the hole in his pants. He could only move if he reached down and cradled them in his hands to relieve the pressure. At times the pain was excruciating and he would moan and double over. Crewmates pleaded to the guards to get him treatment. Instead, they made him stand at attention or crawl around like a dog, sometimes poking at his testicles with their gun butts. Just prior to the scuttling of the ship, Bob had hustled back down below deck and fetched a bottle of sulfur pills. Several other men on the crew had seen him do this, including Chuck, and when someone questioned him about it, Bob claimed he did it for Taylor. Chuck didn't buy it, believing Bob had gotten the pills for himself. As hellish as the physical torture was, the uncertainty was worse. What was coming next, Bob wondered. Would they be lined up against a wall and shot? Would they be starved to death? Would the torture and beatings get worse? Did the Navy know they were there or that their ship was missing? Would his resolve to survive weaken? 
Sometimes it was hard to think about anything other than his immediate situation and surviving the next five minutes or the bayonet being pricked under his nose. He tried to think about Barbara. He closed his eyes and saw her standing next to him at the church in San Francisco on their wedding night. How beautiful she looked. He remembered lying in bed next to her, his arms around her, how good she felt. He created a dinner menu in his head, big slices of honey-baked ham with mashed potatoes and glazed carrots. It was the glazed carrots he savored, the sweet taste filling his senses. In whispers, the crew pondered strategies for survival. They knew that they were at the mercy of their captors, but they all shared the same goal, to get home, and everything they now did would be to achieve that result. Specific strategies were slowly beginning to emerge. It was clear that Tim McCoy was determined to stand up to the guards and be as big a pain in the ass as he could. Gordy Cox was going to make himself as invisible as possible and do whatever he could to avoid being noticed. Chuck Vervalen thought he'd be best served by never showing them pain, never looking weak. Bob's plan was to go inside his head and escape to a world where he was with Barbara again. She would be the light at the end of the tunnel, his reason to keep going. A part of him wondered if he had the strength and courage to keep going. Maybe under the pain of torture he'd cave in and tell the Japanese whatever they wanted to know. As the ship's yeoman, he knew more than anyone except the officers about the ship's recent history and patrols. If surviving to see Barbara again meant revealing what he knew about any of that, then he couldn't be sure he wouldn't crack, no matter how much he loved his country and the men in the crew. Still, he was determined not to give the enemy anything they could use. Bob heard the thump outside the window, the now familiar sound of a coconut hitting the ground in the courtyard. On his way to the toilet, he'd seen them lying there, tantalizing. The last food he'd had was the hardtack biscuit on the Japanese ship four days earlier. As a boy growing up during the Depression in southern Oregon with its rich farmland, he had not suffered as much as others that he knew from a lack of food. The twisting, churning hunger pain in his stomach was a new experience. He ran his hand over his face, feeling the stubble of his beard. It had been almost a week since his last shave and shower. The layer of soot and grime collected during the 125-degree ordeal at the bottom of the ocean in the Grenadier had been washed away in the ocean, but the days in captivity had given him a patina of sweat and dust tinted with dried blood. More fastidious than anyone else on the crew, he always paid attention to his appearance, whether he was in civilian clothes or his navy blues. He placed a shower just below sleep and a full plate of food on his wish list. Bob was beginning to see a pattern in the guard's selection of targets. The bigger guys were singled out, the smaller Japanese guards taking pleasure in inflicting pain and humiliation on a larger man. At five feet nine inches and 160 pounds, Bob presented a smaller physical presence than many of the crew. Now he wished he was even smaller. Everyone looked out the window watching Goldtooth Maisie and another guard drag Captain Fitzgerald across the courtyard toward the bench again. He was wearing only his skivvies. Two other guards, armed with machine guns, stood nearby. The crew could see that Fitzgerald's entire body was black and blue. Goldtooth Maisie strapped him to the bench, just as they'd done before, but this time, instead of pounding him with clubs, they doused him with water and began beating him with thick leather straps. The sound of the straps snapping against the captain's body echoed across the courtyard. Bob turned his head, unable to watch. Just as before, Goldtooth Maisie lifted a tea kettle and poured water up Fitzgerald's nose while another guard held his hand over the captain's mouth. After the fifth tea kettle of water, Goldtooth pulled a chair next to the bench and climbed on top. Looking down at Fitzgerald, he readied himself, like a bully at the pool getting set to execute a giant cannonball. Then he jumped, butt first, landing directly on Fitzgerald's stomach. Fitzgerald convulsed, the force of the landing shooting water up and out his nose and mouth. Then the other guard climbed atop the chair and did the same thing. 
After ten jumps apiece, the guards removed the straps from Fitzgerald and dragged him back across the courtyard and up the stairs. Like everyone else on the crew, Bob had never questioned why America had gone to war. Seeing firsthand the destruction at Pearl Harbor had only intensified his belief in America's commitment to fight an evil enemy. But now that he'd seen the enemy up close, it was even more evident to him that the Japanese were not human. 19. Tim Skeeter McCoy, POW It was Tim McCoy's turn to be pulled from the line by Snake. That's the name the crew had given the guard who slithered in and out of the lines. Snake always carried a stick like a policeman's billy club, and his specialty was the devil dance. Using his club, he spread Tim's feet two feet apart, then ordered him to go into a half-knee bend up on the balls of his feet, arms raised straight over his head, palms together. Slowly, Snake circled, tapping him with his club on the calves, then the thighs, making sure Tim maintained the devil dance stance. Tim had won the State 880 as a freshman back in Lubbock and had always thought of himself as having strong legs, but after several minutes his legs wobbled and his heels touched the floor. Snake smacked his butt with his club, hard. After a couple more minutes, the exhausted nerves in Tim's calves, thighs, and arms began to twitch, his whole body vibrating as he struggled to maintain the position. Snake grinned, summoning Goldtooth Maisie to join him watching Tim suffer. Finally, unable to hold the stance, Tim straightened his legs. Four sharp whacks to the back of his legs, harder than anything his father ever administered back in Texas, sent him sprawling to the floor. Fuck you, he muttered. Dragon had once lived in Hawaii and spoke limited English. You kill our pilot, he spewed at the crew. Now you pay. It was true. The return fire from the deck of the Grenadier had hit the pilot of the dive bomber that had tried to sink it. He'd managed to fly his plane back to land, but he died soon after landing. Dragon stepped in front of Tim. He swung his club, hitting Tim square in the shoulder. Tim braced himself, determined not to flinch. Dragon swung again, hitting him in the elbow, then the hips, knees, and shins. As Tim absorbed each blow, barely moving, Dragon got madder with each hit. Tim had no doubt he could survive this. He was resolved to be not just tough, but the toughest of all the crew, even if it put others in danger, even if it cost him his life. He had no doubt that if all things were equal, he could kick any of these guards' butt. He would have the same attitude he'd had as a teenager. He'd put a chip on his shoulder and dare anyone to knock it off. The guards would never be able to get anything from him. He would live to marry Valma and to show his father he was more of a man than he. Dragon turned and handed his club to another guard, then whirled around unloading a right cross to Tim's jaw. Still. Tim didn't flinch or go down, standing stoically, staring straight ahead. You think you're tough, yelled Dragon. You will break. After a few hours, Dragon came back. He told the crew that they were not prisoners of war, but captured enemy, and the only reason that they were still alive was because of the humane treatment they were receiving. We feed you now and let you rest. Dragon ordered them to sit down. Easing his body to the concrete floor, Tim felt a huge relief. This was the first time the crew had been allowed to sit in the four days since they had been brought to the convent on Light Street. His legs trembled. Another guard entered, carrying an armload of straw mats. He dumped them in the middle of the floor and motioned for the men to each take one and roll it out. To Tim and the other men, the two-foot-by-five-foot, half-inch-thick mat felt like a mattress. Maybe, Tim hoped, things would improve. There was still a guard with a rifle and bayonet stationed at the door full time, but the other guards in the room now carried wooden clubs instead of guns, and with the exception of Goldtooth Maisie and Dragon, they seemed less inclined to hit the prisoners. One of the guards even hinted that he'd try to find sulfur pills to help relieve Taylor's suffering. 
A couple of hours after the mats had been delivered, Dragon entered. You will eat now, he announced. Two soldiers entered, carrying two buckets, one filled with a watery porridge, the other with bowls. Tim joined the other man in a line and received a bowl and a ladle full of the gruel, but no spoon. Returning to his mat, he studied the contents of the bowl, uncertain of what it was. It was opaque, with some sort of grassy substance floating in it. He would later learn it was millet. Cautiously, he put the bowl to his mouth and began to sip. He finished everything in the bowl, but it did nothing to stop the gnawing in his stomach. Another soldier entered, carrying a bucket of water with a ladle, and set it near the door. Swatting away a mosquito, Tim waited his turn in line, then scooped out a ladleful and gulped it down. When everyone was finished, the soldier threw each prisoner a Japanese cigarette, lighting one man's smoke, having the rest light theirs off a lit cigarette. Tim inhaled deeply, savoring his smoke, smoking it down to his fingers. The guard walked down the line, collecting the butts. Tim returned to his mat, and when the guards gave no additional orders, he curled up and fell instantly asleep for the first time in five days. Fifteen minutes into his sleep, Tim and the others were awakened and ordered to do push-ups. A push-up contest was becoming part of the routine, the guards taking delight in kicking the fallen men. Tim's arms quivered. It was hard to concentrate, not just because he was so weak, but because he was distracted by Charles Taylor's moaning. The venereal infection had worsened and his testicles were even more swollen. Pleas by the men for medical attention for Taylor had gone unheeded. Tim finally fell. A guard stared down at him and kicked him in the side. Tim didn't flinch. The guard ordered the men to line up and stand at attention. At the end of the front line, Taylor tried to stand erect, but the pain was too much. He doubled over at the waist. The guard with the rifle and bayonet approached, prodding him with his blade to stand up. Taylor slowly, agonizingly straightened, the pressure in his testicles unbearable. The guard poked toward Taylor's midsection with his bayonet, the blade coming within inches of his testicles. Get away from him, warned Tim, lined up next to Taylor. The guard ignored Tim, pressing the blade even closer. With a flick of his wrists, the guard jabbed the tip of the steel blade into Taylor's testicles, releasing the pressure and the infection. Taylor gave a horrific scream. Blood and pus exploded, splattering the guard's uniform and face. Shocked, he stumbled backward, dropping his rifle. Taylor, writhing, fell to the floor. Impulsively, Tim charged out of the line. The guard didn't have time to pick up his rifle. Tim plowed into him like a linebacker knocking him straight over backwards. Before Tim could regain his balance, the guard scrambled to his feet and bolted out the door, leaving his rifle on the floor. As his crewmates moved to attend to Taylor, Tim picked up the rifle and flung it out the door into the courtyard. 20. Gordy Cox, POW Feeling a pounding on the bottom of his feet, Gordy Cox awakened to see Goldtooth Maisie hovering over him. He'd been asleep only twenty minutes. Goldtooth and the other guards were rousing everybody, ordering them to line up at attention. A Japanese corporal entered. Short, fat, and buck-toothed, he was dressed in leather high-top shoes, knee-high socks, matching beige knickers and shirt, brown belt, pith helmet, and riding crop. He looked like a caricature Gordy had seen on a victory poster after Pearl Harbor. In broken English, the officer ordered the men to form a single line and file out the door, warning that they'd be shot if they didn't stay in order. In the courtyard, the crew from the other room joined them, the first time since arriving at the convent on Light Street that the enlisted men had all been together. Gordy could see that the men from the other room were just as battered, bruised, and bedraggled as he and his companions. Three other Japanese officers, each with a machine gun, joined the corporal and flanked the men. The corporal announced that they'd be questioned soon, and if they lied and didn't tell the Christian truth, they'd be killed. The Christian truth? 
Gordy had not gone to church much as a kid, but he was thoroughly convinced that these people knew nothing about God and the Christian truth. The men were ordered back to their rooms and to stand at attention. The corporal entered Gordy's room and walked around it very slowly, stopping to glare at each man. He turned and pointed at an electrician's mate and motioned for him to follow him out the door. Gordy watched them exit, figuring this was the start of the questioning. But where were they going? How bad would it be? The crew had received no training on how to respond if captured and interrogated. All they knew was what the captain had told them when they were on the deck of the merchant ship, that they were from the USS Goldfish based in San Francisco and had been dispatched on a search and photographic mission of the area. Gordy's strategy for survival was simple. Keep a low profile. Don't try to overanalyze or overthink anything. Just put your head down and get it done. His philosophy would be, I'm alive today, and that's what matters. Ten minutes passed, then thirty, and an hour, and there was still no indication of what was happening to the electrician's mate. Gordy hadn't heard any gunshots, so at least his crewmate hadn't been shot. After an hour and a half, the corporal appeared again, alone. Once again, he walked around the room, staring at each man. He motioned to Bernie Witzke, one of the tallest men in the crew. Gordy wished he'd pick him. If he was going to die, might as well get it over with. The guards had taught the crew to count off in Japanese, each man given a number to shout out at roll call twice a day. Any man forgetting or mispronouncing his number got hit. They learned other words, too. Benjo? asked Gordy, motioning toward the toilet. Snake pulled him and Robert York from line and led them to the head, tapping his stick as they walked. Gordy glanced to his right, noticing an open gate across the courtyard. He looked at York, who'd also spotted the opening, and they both knew what the other was thinking. If they took off running, they could be out the gate in seconds. Snake didn't have a gun. It took only a second for them to abandon their escape plan. They didn't know what was on the other side of the gate. They were on an island controlled by the Japanese. They were exhausted, and they had been repeatedly warned that if anyone tried to escape, ten crewmates would be killed. Inside the darkened head, Gordy spotted something scrawled on the wall. He edged closer, straining to make out the words. York leaned over to look and read, Keep your peckers up, men. It had been written in blood by Captain Fitzgerald. Gordy had lost track of the days. How long had they been captives? A week? Ten days? Since the interrogation of the crew had started, the hours seemed to pass even more slowly. None of the men who'd already been questioned, including Tim McCoy, had been seen since they were led away. No one had seen Captain Fitzgerald since he'd been taken away after the last round of torture. What had they done with him? Was he still alive? One by one, the men left the room for questioning and didn't return. For the ones remaining, this was torture. Not rifle butt to the jaw cruelty, but a mind game even more brutal. Each time another shipmate didn't return, it seemed more and more likely that the guards had extracted whatever information they could and then killed them. Gordy wondered whether he really knew anything that would be of value to the Japanese. Surely they already knew about submarine engines and what the Americans were running. And as far as war strategies or naval planning or secret codes, he didn't know anything about that. He was just a first mate, an enlisted sailor, doing what he was told. Since the start of the questioning, the harsh nature of the torture to the men still in the classroom had lessened, but only slightly. They were given food daily, a hardtack biscuit in the morning and a bowl of watery rice soup for dinner. Sometimes the guards seemed bored, so to amuse themselves, they took delight in finding new forms of torment, such as making the men do push-ups with a guard's foot pressing down on their back. Goldtooth Maisie entered the room and ordered everyone to pair off in twos and stand face to face. Gordy stood with York, noticing how drawn his crewmate's face looked, welted from mosquito bites. 
Two weeks with almost no food was taking its toll, evidenced in the men's lack of energy, hollow eyes, and prominent rib cages. You slap other man, ordered Goldtooth Maisie. At first, the men didn't understand the order. Goldtooth Maisie stepped between Gordy and York and demonstrated, slapping Gordy hard across the cheek. Now you do it, Goldtooth Maisie screamed. Gordy slapped York on the cheek. That not right, yelled Goldtooth Maisie. Hit hard, like this. He slapped York, and the crack of hand against face echoed around the room. Now you do right. Gordy slapped his friend much harder this time. It wasn't hard enough for Goldtooth Maisie. He struck Gordy across his back with his club. This time Gordy swung hard, the blow knocking York off balance. As the guards watched and laughed, the sound of slapping filled the room, the guards stepping in to demonstrate when someone didn't slap his partner hard enough. When they tired of that game, they upped the ante, making the men hit each other with closed fists, only accepting blows that drew blood or dropped the other man to the floor. When York's first blow completely missed Gordy, Goldtooth Maisie stepped between them and sent Gordy crashing to the floor with a shot to the jaw. 21. Chuck Vervalen, P.O.W. Half the men had been taken away for questioning when the corporal entered and pointed at Chuck. He followed the corporal into the bright sunlight, then across the courtyard to a two-story building on the left. His legs wobbled. A door opened and the corporal shoved him inside. The dimly lit room was bare except for a long table at one end and a lone chair in the middle of the floor. Two officers sat rigidly behind the table, flanked on one side by two soldiers with guns and bayonets, and two soldiers on the other side with clubs. One of the officers studied a stack of papers in front of him. Next to him sat a man in civilian clothes, the interpreter. Chuck stood in front of the table, hands at his side. The corporal whirled around and slapped him hard on his cheek. You bow, commanded the interpreter. Chuck did as instructed, a slight nod of the head. The corporal slapped him again. Not right, said the interpreter. Full bow. This time Chuck bowed from the waist. He was ordered to sit down in the chair, eyes straight ahead. He glanced to the guard standing beside him. Another slap. Do as instructed. You want trouble? He shook his head. Unlike Tim, Chuck's brand of toughness was not going to include defiance. It was like when he was playing for the town baseball team growing up and tore off a piece of skin about the size of Delaware sliding into second on the rock-hard infield dirt. The blood from the raw wound kept sticking to the inside of his uniform pants. Every time he moved, it ripped off another little chunk of flesh, but he never let on, he never complained. In submarine school, he'd gotten through by learning to just focus on what was directly in front of him, rather than allowing himself to be intimidated by what difficulties lay ahead until he reached his goal, graduation. Now that he'd finally found a young woman he loved and wanted to spend the rest of his life with, he wasn't going to let these Jap bastards keep him from her. The guard slapped him again. Speak when spoken to. What is your name? He replied with his name, rank, and serial number. What name of your ship? Chuck hesitated. The goldfish. You lie. We know name of your ship. Tell one more lie. You suffer. Where submarine come from? San Francisco. I tell you not to lie. Now you suffer. The guard reached into his pocket and pulled out a bamboo sliver a little bigger than a toothpick. He stuck it up Chuck's nose and then flicked it, sending a sharp pain shooting through his nose and eyes. Lying gets you killed. The guard flicked the little bamboo stick again. Now you tell truth. You been on other sub? One of the guards with a rifle moved toward him and waved the bayonet in his face, then dragged it down his chest, pushing just hard enough that Chuck could feel the blade against his sternum. He remembered that one of the officers, Dick Sherry, had been with him on the gudgeon. 
maybe they already knew. Yes, he answered. What name of sub? USS Gudgeon. You sink any of our ships? Chuck felt the bayonet pressing against his chest. Yes, he answered. What name of that ship? I don't know. You pick up survivors? There wasn't anybody to pick up. Without warning, the corporal threw a vicious punch, knocking Chuck straight over backwards in the chair. Chuck felt blood streaming from his nose and lip. The corporal kicked him hard in the ribs. Get up! Chuck struggled to rise, but the corporal kicked him again. A soldier straddled him and poured a pitcher of cold water on his head. Up! Chuck got to his feet and slumped back onto the chair. The corporal slapped him. Where are you going in your submarine? I don't know, he replied. The corporal grabbed Chuck by the hair and pulled him toward the table where the officers sat. He slapped his hand down on the table and intertwined two pencils between Chuck's fingers. Then he placed a cloth around his hand, knotted it, stuck another pencil into the knot, and started to turn it, drawing the fingers together. With each turn, Chuck's fingers twisted and separated between the second joint and knuckle. It felt like they were breaking. He screamed. The corporal twisted another turn. Now tell me where submarine going. I swear I don't know. The corporal slugged him in the face again. When Chuck came to, he was being dragged back across the courtyard and into a large classroom. Through his fog, he saw the crewmates who'd been questioned before him. Like him, all the men in the room had been beaten and tortured. 22. Bob Palmer, POW The guards competed against one another to invent new ways to harass and humiliate the men. They made four men carry another man around the room on a tabletop, their arms raised above their heads until the men's arms wearied and they dropped the tabletop, sending the man crashing to the floor where the guards kicked him. They also enjoyed making the men imitate farm animals. Bob was forced down on all fours and told to moo like a cow. Gordy neighed like a horse, and pretty soon the whole room turned into a barnyard symphony of barking, mooing, clucking, and screeching. It would have been funny except Goldtooth Maisie wandered around the room, randomly kicking men in the ribs. The shot to Bob's side sent him tumbling to the concrete, gasping for air. Goldtooth Maisie ordered the men to sing and dance around the room. Reluctantly, they twirled and spun, some humming, some singing, all trying to remember the songs they'd last heard on leave in Perth. As time goes by, dancing in the dark, by the light of the silvery moon, it had to be you. I don't want to set the world on fire. Suddenly, one baritone voice rose above the rest. From where he danced, Bob couldn't tell who it was, but he recognized the song, The Old Rugged Cross. He hadn't gone to church much as a kid, but he started humming along, and so did everyone else, singing or humming, the sound echoing across the room. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. There'd always been a sentimental side to Bob. As he listened to the hymn, tears streamed down his face. Dragon entered and ordered them to stop singing, then had them line up and count off in Japanese. He walked down the lines, sneering at each man, telling them that their way of life was no good and that they were cowards. He stopped in front of Bob. Why you no die with ship? Not honorable to be captured. Real warrior never give up. That why you lose war. Japanese warrior braver, never surrender. In whole history we never lose war. Bob stood erect, saying nothing. You no prisoner of war. You criminal. Red Cross no come for you. Bob was no expert on international politics, but he knew that the Japanese had not signed the Geneva Conventions and believed that they were not obligated to abide by the agreement's rules for the humane treatment of captured enemy combatants. 
The only positive thing to have happened was with Charles Taylor. It had been a couple of weeks since the guard punctured his swollen testicles. Taylor was recovering, and the guards had even taken to bringing him what they claimed were sulfur pills. Bob believed it was just aspirin, figuring the guards felt guilty about what had happened. No extra punishment had been given to Tim for knocking over the guard. Despite Taylor's improved condition, health problems for the crew were mounting. Some of the men had contracted crabs when they were on leave in Fremantle, and now everyone had them, in their hair, beards, and eyebrows. Several men had fevers and flu-like illnesses. Tom Courtney had bone-shaking chills and a raging fever, and after a couple of days he became delirious and then unconscious. Pleas to the guards for medical attention went unanswered. The pharmacist's mate suspected dengue fever, spread by the bite of infected mosquitoes. There was no treatment other than rest and lots of liquids. The fever usually could last nine or ten days, sometimes, but not often, turning fatal. When Bob woke up in the middle of the night, shivering and shaking, he knew something was wrong. The chills quickly turned into a fever, and he was drenched in sweat. His head pounded. He moaned, calling out Barbara's name. 23. Tim Skeeter McCoy, POW A second round of questioning had started, and judging from the tortured screams heard from the interrogation room across the courtyard, the methods used to get information from the men this time were even more brutal. Tim waited to be called. Despite his cocky, I'm-not-backing-down bravado, Tim shared the same hardships as his buddies. Isolation, hunger, anger, despair. But fear was the most powerful emotion. Fear of death, pain, or humiliation. Fear of Japan winning the war and ruling the world. Fear of never seeing Valma again. Or his mother. It had been several weeks since anyone had seen Captain Fitzgerald. This really depressed Tim. To keep his morale up, he found comfort in the scriptures he'd learned in the Baptist church. Since joining the Navy and dabbling in the ways of alcohol and women, he'd strayed from the church, but he hadn't forgotten passages from the Bible, and he sometimes recited them to himself. He thought about his mom back in Dallas. He remembered his uncle and the times he'd caddied for him at the country club or rode with him in his big car out to the lake. He imagined himself being rich like that. But mostly he thought about Valma back in Australia and how lucky he was that she'd promised to wait for him. He imagined taking her home to Texas and how everyone would see how gorgeous she was and he'd be so proud. He wondered if she knew he'd been captured. But prayer and imagination were temporary escapes, always interrupted by the reality of his imprisonment. Sleep was the only real escape from their situation, and the guards knew it, rarely letting a night pass without waking the men. Just as Tim was drifting off to sleep, he heard hobnail boots clicking on the walkway outside. Tim had learned to recognize Goldtooth Maisie's walk, different from the other guards' footfalls, and the angry clattering of the wooden window louvers as Goldtooth ran his rifle butt across them. He did it every time, and every time it pissed off Tim. The door flew open, and Goldtooth Maisie marched in, grinning, his gold tooth shining. Tim braced himself. Maybe he'd spit on Goldtooth Maisie this time, or punch him. No, that wouldn't be a good idea. Not because he was afraid of what Goldtooth Maisie might do to him, but because the guards knew that the best way to deal with a hot-headed prisoner was to retaliate against one of his crewmates. Goldtooth Maisie pointed toward Bob Palmer, motioning him toward the interrogation room. Tim watched Bob, who had been ill for several days and was barely able to lift his head, shuffle out of the room, Goldtooth Maisie pushing him in the back. By Tim's calculations, it was now late July, and they'd been held here for three months. He figured he'd lost fifty pounds, and he hadn't had a bowel movement in twenty days. The worst time was when he, like so many others, including Bob and Chuck, had come down with dengue fever. Chills, fever, aching, sweating, drifting in and out of consciousness. It took all his energy just to lift his head. 
Some nights he'd shiver and shake and moan so badly that it seemed dying would be easier. But after ten days the fever broke, and he regained a measure of strength. And he was one of the lucky ones who hadn't been called for a second round of interrogation. He guessed it was because he was one of the lowest-ranking men on the ship, and the Japanese concluded he didn't have any information that would be useful to them. The crew was now housed in rooms down the corridor and around the corner from the larger rooms in which they had first been imprisoned. There were three or four men to a room. Except for the thin mats on the wooden plank floor, Tim's room was bare. About the size of a tool shed, the room was so small that when he lay down with his head at one end, his feet brushed the opposite wall. Before the Japanese takeover, the nuns had used this room and others like it for prayer and meditation. The only light the men had was what filtered through the shuttered small window in the door. Tim figured they'd been transferred, either because their captors were bringing in more prisoners and needed the bigger rooms, or because they were trying to further break the men's spirit by isolating them. It had been ten days since he'd seen anyone in the crew other than the two men in his room. At least when he'd been in the big classroom, he had had thirty-five other men sharing the pain and humiliation. Now he didn't even know if his crewmates were still alive. 24. Gordy Cox, P.O.W. On his trips to the Benjo, Gordy had eyed the breadfruit and coconuts that had fallen from the nearby trees, but with the guards always watching, they might as well have been a mile away. He'd eaten coconut when he was stationed in Manila and liked it, but he'd never tasted breadfruit, a lime-green oblong fruit that weighed up to ten pounds and grew on fifty-foot-tall trees. To feed the constant gnawing in his stomach, he'd even picked and eaten flowers growing next to the walkway leading to the head. Others in the crew had done the same thing, and now all the plants had been picked clean. On this night, Gordy hatched a plan particularly daring for someone so dedicated to being invisible. He was going to retrieve one of the fallen coconuts. With no guard in sight, he slowly opened the door of his small room, checking in both directions. The coconut lay on the ground a hundred feet away. The courtyard was dimly lit, with little moonlight on this night. The guard station was at the far end. The best way, he decided, was just to make a dash for it. Crouching low, Gordy shot across the walkway and onto the courtyard. Keeping his eyes on the coconut, he swooped low and gathered it up on the run like a defensive back picking up a fumble. Cradling it in his arm, he sprinted back across the courtyard, making it back inside the room undetected. He was able to pry up a plank from the floor and use it to crack open the coconut, sharing the unexpected feast with his roommates. The men hid the coconut meat under the floor, enjoying it over several days. Gordy heard noises outside his room and peeked through the shutters. Across the courtyard he saw two guards setting up a thirty caliber machine gun and aiming it toward the row of rooms housing the crew. Maybe this was how it was going to end, to be lined up outside the rooms and then just mowed down. But would that be worse than a slow death by starvation and beating? As the day wore on, he watched more and more movement by the guards. The next morning, August 5, 1943, 103 days after they had been captured, the door to his cell flew open, and two armed guards herded him and his two roommates out of the room onto the grassy courtyard. Soon the rest of the enlisted men joined them, forming two lines. Since being isolated, it was the first time he'd seen his crewmates including Bob Palmer, who'd survived his bout with dengue fever and the second interrogation. Goldtooth Maisie ordered the men to march toward the big wooden gate they'd passed through when they first arrived at the convent on Light Street. Shuffling in that direction, they were a pitiful lot, gaunt, dirty, dispirited. Outside the gate, convoy trucks waited. With bayonets pointed at them, the crew struggled to climb aboard and then the canvas flaps were closed. This time there were no blindfolds or tied hands. They were too weak to attempt an escape. The men sat silently as the trucks rumbled down Light Street, 
heading toward the pier. Nobody knew where they were headed. Gordy thought nothing could be as torturous as what they'd survived the last 103 days. Surely he could endure whatever came next. The ride was over quickly. The flaps opened, and Gordy saw that they were at the same dock where they'd landed. A small freighter, the Hir Maru, similar in size to the one on which they had arrived, was waiting. Hurriedly, the men formed two lines and marched up the gangway toward the forward hold. A guard ordered them to stand at attention. The ship's commanding officer approached the men, a long silver sword at his side. Part 6. From Bad to Worse 25. Chuck Vervalen, P.O.W. After being reminded by the ship's commander that they were cowards for surrendering and that the Japanese way of life would prevail, Chuck and the rest of the crew were placed in the hold of the ship. The men were crammed together with barely enough room to lie down. The air in the hold was stale and humid. The men sweated onto the wooden planks of the deck, making it slippery. Chuck and several others were bruised from a rifle beating they'd received upon boarding the ship, but Chuck would not let his captors see his pain. For five days the Hirmaru rolled and pitched on the open sea, destination unknown. The men had been given two five-gallon buckets to serve as toilets, but with the heavy sea and meals of bad rice, the buckets overflowed, the situation made even worse when the majority of the crew came down with diarrhea. In the cramped quarters there was no privacy and no way to escape the growing mess and the stench. Soon the entire deck of the hold was soaked in waste. There were no mops. Chuck used his shirt to try to clean some space on the floor, but it was futile. He was able to remain standing, but other men were too weak and dehydrated. Some passed out, and others simply lay down on the filthy deck. Chuck felt the engines reverse, then stop. The men were ordered out of the hold and up on deck, then led down a gangplank and loaded onto trucks. The flaps were quickly closed to block their view. They did not know it, but they had landed in Singapore. It was August 10, 1943, and all of the men were still together. Nobody knew the whereabouts or condition of Fitzgerald or two other officers who were missing. Singapore had been heralded as an impregnable fortress and considered the strongest of all British bastions. But in February 1942, it had fallen to the Japanese after only seven days of battle, the largest surrender in British history. Over 50,000 British and Australian troops were captured, as well as most of the European citizens living there. After a twenty-minute ride, the trucks stopped, and the crew climbed down and surveyed their new surroundings, a large fenced internment area encircled by barbed wire. Inside the fence stood thatched huts built on stilts. A short ladder allowed entry. The men were marched into the yard, then separated, seven or eight assigned to each hut. For the next forty-six days the camp would be their home. Each day they were loaded onto trucks and driven to an abandoned horse racing track. Chuck imagined it in better times, filled with elegantly dressed patrons, magnificent thoroughbreds, and jockeys in beautiful silk colors. The men picked weeds on their hands and knees for ten hours under the brutally hot sun with no water or food. Chuck's back ached relentlessly, and his knuckles were scraped raw. Some days the guards ordered the crew to go back to where they'd started picking and do a better job. Each day on the other side of the track he could see Japanese troops training, the sergeants screaming and slapping the trainees with the same ferocity that the guards at the convent at Light Street had treated the American prisoners. It was more proof, not that he needed any, that these people were savages. He took consolation in the fact that, compared with the treatment the crew had received in Penang, this camp was more humane. The rice portions at night were a little bigger, the harassment and beatings from the guards not as frequent, and they weren't constantly awakened in the middle of the night. They received cigarettes and were allowed to shave and bathe. For the first time in months Chuck felt clean. He could survive this, he believed. He even joined a discussion about an escape plan. The details of the plan were vague, but the idea was to tunnel under the fence 
then hollow out logs and use them as canoes to paddle to one of the many small islands bordering Singapore. The whole crew would have to be included. As they had in Penang, the guards made it clear that if anyone tried to escape, anyone left behind would be severely punished or killed. To Chuck it seemed impossible that such a plan could succeed. Still, if men he considered smarter and wiser than he thought it was worth risking, who was he not to go along? Besides, an escape plan gave him hope, and if there was one thing he and his crewmates needed, it was hope. In time, however, the plan was abandoned when it was concluded that even if they got away safely, they would have no place to go. What are we going to do, paddle to America, said Chuck. At night in their huts, the men shared stories of the different types of interrogation and torture they'd suffered in Penang. Everyone had a story. Bob Palmer told how a bamboo sliver had been jammed under his fingernail and set on fire, and his other fingernails had been pulled off with a pair of pliers. Chuck described how a guard had held his head while another burned off his eyebrows and lashes with the flame of a candle. The rumor spread that the crew was to be transferred to another prison camp, maybe to China or to Japan. On September 24, 1943, they were loaded back on trucks, taken to the dock, and marched at gunpoint onto the Asama Maru. It was much larger than the ship that had brought them to Singapore. Chuck had a bad feeling about what lay ahead. 26. Bob Palmer, POW In 1943, Americans back home knew nothing about Japanese hell ships. These unmarked vessels, usually freighters, were used to transport American POWs to Japan, China, Manchuria, or Korea to be used as slave labor. Because the ships were unmarked, the U.S. Navy had no way of knowing POWs were crammed into their holds. Thousands of captured American soldiers and sailors, men who had already endured months of torture, malnutrition, and disease in prison camps, had already been killed by American torpedoes and bombs. Built in 1925 as a passenger ship, the Asama Maru, part of a convoy of Japanese ships in the South China Sea sailing north from Singapore, was such a ship. It was hard for Bob Palmer to look at his crewmates, now so emaciated and dressed in rags. Along with other prisoners, Bob showed signs of beriberi. A disease caused by a deficiency of vitamin B1, it was rarely seen in America, but it was common in countries where white rice was a staple food. It could be easily cured by a change in diet or by vitamin supplements, neither of which would be forthcoming from their captors. Bob also had a tingling, burning pain in his legs, then a feeling of stiffness and heaviness, symptoms due to lack of exercise, as well as all the bending and squatting he'd been forced to do while pulling weeds on the track in Singapore. The ship had been on the seas for eight days when a loud explosion jarred Bob from his sleep in the middle of the night, he recognized the sound of an exploding torpedo. It sounded as if it had hit one of the nearby ships in the convoy. In response, there was a series of smaller explosions, depth charges being dropped on an American sub below. Bob knew the terror those submariners were feeling. He wondered if he'd ever been out drinking beers back in Perth with any of the guys on that sub. The attack lasted for about an hour, and when the guards returned, they were noticeably surlier. Bob figured that one of the ships in the convoy must have been sunk, and the grenadier crew was now going to pay the price. A sense of doom swept through the crew. Maybe they weren't going to get off the ship alive. Maybe they'd be beaten to death, or torpedoed, or taken up on the deck and pushed overboard. Who would ever know? Bob closed his eyes and thought about Barbara. He imagined the two of them holding hands and sitting on a big boulder next to the rushing waters of the Rogue River, a picnic lunch, including an apple pie, spread out next to them. After a couple of more days at sea, Bob felt the ship's engines reverse and its forward motion stop. The engines shut down. They had arrived at a port, but where? Bob heard a commotion and looked up to see a dozen screaming Japanese charging down the stairs, carrying rifles with bayonets fixed. They were drunk. Bob saw that they were Imperial Marines, much larger and more solidly built than the crew of the Asama Maru. The biggest marine, a broad-shouldered guy over six feet tall and two hundred pounds, 
walked over to the foot of the stairs and yanked out one of the oak handrails. It was eight feet long and five inches around. The crew was herded out of the compartment onto the landing hatch. A guard signaled Bob to step out of the line and stand on the hatch cover, hands over his head. He did as instructed. Holding the handrail like a baseball bat, the biggest marine stepped behind him and took a vicious swing, connecting to the lower part of Bob's back. The force of the blow lifted him off his feet and drove him across the hatch cover. He slammed head first into the bulkhead five feet away, slithering to the deck, all feeling in his lower limbs gone. Another marine kicked Bob in the side, then dragged him off to the side and deposited him in a heap. The next man was directed to the hatch cover, and the big marine took another swing, this one even more vicious. Then the next man was ordered forward, and the next, until every man had been clubbed. With each swing, the big marine tried to outdo himself. Some men lost consciousness, others urinated in their pants. When the men collapsed against the bulkhead, temporarily paralyzed, they were kicked and poked, then dragged off to the side. If the first blow didn't drive them into the bulkhead or knock them off their feet, the marine struck again. Bob watched as Tim stepped onto the hatch cover and looked defiantly at the big marine. Putting his hands over his head, Tim took the blow across his butt, but he didn't flinch. The marine swung again, even harder, this blow landing on his lower back. Tim stood firm. Infuriated, the big marine wound up again. The blow struck Tim in the small of the back, and again he didn't go down. Finally, the marine's fourth blow sent Tim staggering forward, his head banging against the bulkhead, his legs crumbling under him. He curled up into a ball. Standing over him, the marine kicked him in the back. After the last man was hit, the crew staggered to their compartment, many having to crawl. The men who had lost control of their bladders were not able to clean themselves. Bob didn't know how long he'd been drifting in and out of consciousness when he heard the guards screaming and yelling. He was jerked to his feet and pushed toward the hatch and then up the stairway toward the deck. The ship had landed in Japan. 27. Tim Skeeter McCoy, POW Tim was one of the last to climb out of the hold onto the ship's deck, greeted by the early morning sunlight and fifty Japanese Imperial Marines yelling and prodding him with bayonets and clubs. Wobbling down the gangplank to the pier, he staggered through the gauntlet of Marines, one connected with a rifle butt, another with a fist. He struggled to stay upright. If he fell, he'd be pummeled. His legs, bruised and stiff from ankle to hip, ached. Ahead of him, Gordy stumbled and was immediately jumped by three Marines. Tim could only watch as Gordy tried to crawl forward, unable to get back up. Of all his crewmates, Gordy was the one he wanted to help the most. He seemed so vulnerable. It was October 9, 1943. The Asama Maru had landed at Shimonoseki, population 105,000, a port city on the Sea of Japan. Located on the southwestern corner of Honshu, Japan's largest island, and narrowly separated from the smaller island of Kyushu, Shimonoseki was an important railroad and industrial center with shipyards and chemical plants, as well as a primary training location for the Imperial Marines. Tim and the other captured submariners shuffled away from the pier, heading into town. As they slowly moved through the streets, civilians poured out of their homes and shops to view the emaciated and footsore prisoners. For most, it was their first glimpse of an American. Some shouted and shook their fists. Others hurled rocks. A small woman stepped toward Tim and spit, hitting him in the neck. Of all the degradation he'd suffered so far, this was the most humiliating, because he was now on the enemy's soil. It took all of his self-control not to attack the woman. The crew was imprisoned in a single-story barracks at an old marine training base. Straw mats carpeted the concrete floor, and the windows were nailed shut. Each prisoner was issued a rough woolen blanket and a crude bar of soap. The camp commander entered, informing the crew that each morning and night they must bow toward the emperor. Tim wanted to laugh. Back in Penang he'd been slapped and punched for not bowing correctly. Since then he'd bowed every morning and evening as instructed, 
but he told himself that he was really bowing to FDR. He used the same inner strategy when bowing to or saluting a guard. In his head, he was saluting Captain Fitzgerald. Tim was having trouble shaking the image of Fitzgerald being dragged out of the courtyard unconscious, his whole body one continuous bruise. Back in Singapore, the men had discussed Fitzgerald's decision to pursue the ships in search of a kill. Had he been too aggressive and too concerned with building his own reputation? Would they have escaped if he'd given the order to dive more quickly instead of questioning the lookout's word that he'd spotted the dive bomber? And every submariner knew that a captain was not supposed to keep his sub on the surface in daylight, especially not so close to land and when the enemy knew you were in the vicinity. But not once did anyone blame the captain. The crew's respect and admiration for his toughness, courage, and strategy were unassailable. On the morning of October 12th, three days after their arrival, the crew was mustered together just outside the door of their barracks and ordered to stand at attention. Ten minutes passed, then twenty. For Tim, his body weakened and his legs in pain and swollen from beatings, standing at attention was one of the hardest forms of torture. To distract himself, he thought about Valma back in Perth and how positively beautiful she'd looked when he proposed to her. He wondered if his divorced parents knew that he'd been captured and was a POW. If they knew, were they talking to each other or dealing with it separately? Was his Uncle Ben, the successful insurance man, supporting Tim's mom? Tim had been sending part of his pay home each month. Certainly his mom would have noticed by now that the checks had stopped. Or maybe the Navy was still sending her money? He'd assumed his mom had turned to the church for support. She'd often said that it was her faith in God and the Baptist Church that helped her get through those long periods in the institution. Tim thought back to the days in Lubbock when he and his mom and dad had listened to Reverend Truett preach the gospel and expound about the wages against sin and the certainty of a God and his promise of eternity. He carried a Bible with him onto the grenadier, and it bothered him that he'd abandoned the ship without it. Since falling into the hands of the Japanese, he'd often tried to let the scriptures flow through him as one way to survive this crucible. In Matthew, Jesus taught that he should turn the other cheek, but the truth was that the injunction from Exodus about seeking justice in an eye for an eye was more to Tim's liking. According to Tim's interpretation of the Bible and Jesus' teachings, he believed that there was no true authority except God, and that it was a believer's responsibility to work and pray to change a wrong. He had no doubt that Japan was a godless and backward nation, and the guards who carried out its rules were godless too. So Tim would, as the Bible instructed him, give unto Caesar only that which was owed him. He could obey his captors with his words and actions in order to survive, but never with his heart, which would remain loyal only to his country and to God. Standing in front of the barracks, the men remained at attention. Finally, the camp commander stepped forward and started calling out names of crew members to step forward. Tim waited for his name to be called. It wasn't. Neither was Chuck's or Gordy's. But Bob Palmer's was. Tim watched as Palmer and twenty-eight other submariners stepped forward and then were marched away, around the corner, and out of sight. A few days later, Tim and the remaining members of the crew were marched to a nearby train yard and shoved aboard a small coach car. After a slow, uncomfortable two-day trip, the train finally stopped in front of a large steel mill. The men could see Japanese workers coming and going in the morning mist. Assembled next to the train, the men were marched away from the mill, through a residential district and past shacks of corrugated metal. People hurried out of their houses and lined the streets as they straggled by, and once again the men were yelled at, spit upon, and pelted with rocks. Finally, the prisoners reached the bottom of a steep hill. At the top, shrouded in the mist, sat a large concrete four-story building with metal-framed windows, ominous and cold. They trudged up the hill and into the building quickly dubbed the castle by the crew, and were escorted down a long corridor, passing several rooms with large metal doors. At the end of the corridor they were divided into two groups of twenty-two, half of the men going into one room, the other half into another. Tim, Chuck, and Gordy were in the same group. 
Each room had two rows of bunks with thin straw mats. Before the men had a chance to relax, they were ordered back out into the hall. There they were informed that they had joined the hundreds of other prisoners assigned to prisoner of war camp number three in the Fukuoka district. The new interpreter explained that they would all be working in a steel mill three miles away and be paid ten sen, the equivalent of less than two cents, a day. They could use the money to buy cigarettes or candy from a camp store. For meals, they would receive morning rice, a bento, box lunch, to take to work, and rice in the evening. Everyone would be required to work except those with a serious illness, as determined by the Japanese camp doctor. Each man would be issued a light, thin green burlap jacket and pants, and a wool overcoat, taken during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, when the Russians surrendered to the Japanese. They would also receive one pair of split-toe socks, a pair of flat-soled shoes with a V-shaped thong, and a G-string, a thin piece of cloth attached to string tied around the waist that would serve as underwear. This was fine with Tim. He was glad to be out of the Navy-issued T-shirt and dungarees that he'd been wearing since the Grenadier had been torpedoed. The POWs would also receive a razor with one blade, a toothbrush, and a bar of soap. They would be permitted to bathe after work each night, but because there was only one tub for hundreds of prisoners, those getting to bathe first would be rotated by room. The camp doctor had set aside one room for those seriously ill. Colds or the flu would not be considered an illness. And finally, if the camp commander eventually deemed they were worthy, they would be allowed to write their families and to receive mail and Red Cross packages, and they would not be beaten. Tim, now prisoner number 526, didn't believe it. Not for a second. 28. Gordy Cox, Fukuoka, number 3. Gordy Cox, prisoner number 528 at Fukuoka Camp number 3, closed his eyes, trying not to think about how hungry he was. Hey, 528, get back to work, ordered Dave Megason. The engineer had been taken prisoner when the Japanese invaded Wake Island. Gordy opened his eyes and ignored Megason. They were standing in the pipe shop at the Iwata Steel Mill, where Gordy and a dozen others from the Grenadier, including Tim McCoy and Chuck Vervalen, had been assigned to work. Gordy despised Megason. In 1901, the Japanese government had built a steel mill at Iwata, convenient to Japan's largest coal field and iron ore from China. By World War II, the Imperial Iron and Steel Works at Iwata had become the largest such complex in Japan. Iwata was known as the Pittsburgh of Japan. Gordy considered his assignment to the pipe shop in the steel mill a stroke of luck, even if he arrived at the job each day before sunrise and left after sunset. Others in the crew had been assigned outside jobs, and with winter fast approaching, the conditions were wet and miserable. Still other men had been assigned to the coal-hauling detail, where they had to breathe coal dust every day and deal with the soot and grime. The pipe shop was inside a large galvanized metal building, open on one end but sheltered from the rain and wind. Two small furnaces were usually going, which provided some heat, although keeping warm was often a struggle. Gordy's job was to help put in the ends of the pipes before they were bent. Although it hadn't been discussed, Gordy believed the pipes would be used on Japanese ships. POWs were not trusted to make the bend, except for Megason. Behind Megason stood two army guards, as well as a pusher. The pushers, or managers, were usually ex-soldiers who'd fought in China and had been discharged because either they'd gotten wounded or they were too old. Most had lost some of the fire of patriotism and were not as hard on the prisoners as the guards were. Normally there were always a couple of pushers on duty, with one guard patrolling the shop. Gordy glanced at Megason, resisting the urge to tell him to get screwed. He considered Megason a turncoat of sorts, a snitch. A large, broad-shouldered man from California, Megason had somehow wrangled his way into a favored position with the guards and pushers. A benefit of this elevated status was that he received extra food, which meant he hadn't lost a lot of weight. In fact, he probably outweighed Gordy by a hundred pounds. Gordy wasn't alone in his contempt for Megason. None of the prisoners liked him. 
On several occasions, Tim had told others in the crew that he wanted to give him an old-fashioned Texas whipping. But Gordy had no intention of fighting him or anyone else. Stay invisible, he reminded himself. At the castle, he never argued or showed disrespect to the guards, and at work he always did as he was told. He made a point of going to the bathroom with at least one other prisoner so that the guards would never catch him alone. Megason moved closer to Gordy. Are you just going to stand there? he asked. Gordy glanced up. Megason was hovering over him. Get away from me, he muttered. Megason took one step back and sucker punched him right between the eyes. Gordy crumpled to the floor, blood gushing from his nose. Dazed, he looked up and saw Megason straddling him, motioning for him to get up and fight. The two pushers stood right behind him, grinning. Gordy considered the situation. He didn't try to fight back. Back in Yakima, Nellie Cox, Gordy's mother, did not know yet that her son's ship had been sunk and the crew captured. She continued to write. March 11, 1943. Everybody is out in the garden now getting ready to plant. The government wants everyone to raise all their own food they can this year. We're starting food rationing now. You would find everything very much different at home now, Gordon. So many of the girls have gone soldier and sailor crazy and write to everyone they can get names of. Do you remember that redhead that lived in the little house up the street north of us? She's getting married to a sailor. She will be sixteen this month. Just to get the guy's money is all it is. It's terrible such goings on. I hope you don't change too much and pray God will bring you safely home to us. Slowly, painfully, Gordy trudged back up the hill in the rain to the castle. Several days had passed since Megason had knocked him down and broken his nose and blackened his eyes. The good news was Megason hadn't bothered him since. Gordy dreaded that walk every evening after work. It was steep, and it took most of what little stamina he had just to trudge up the incline. He hated the castle, with its concrete floors, long corridors, and cold rooms. He hated the guards. They seemed more vindictive than the previous guards they'd encountered, if that was possible. He guessed it was because they were bitter that they'd been assigned to guard POWs rather than to fight on the front line and earn glory for the Empire. In front of the castle he passed the guardhouse, a five-foot-by-five-foot five hut with small windows. He heard moaning and the sound of someone being beaten. It was the same sound he heard almost every night when he and the other men returned from work. He was convinced that these nightly beatings were a way to remind the prisoners of Japanese superiority, rather than for anything the prisoner might have done wrong. On this evening the guards had the prisoner kneeling, a stick between his knees as they beat him. It was Al Rupp, the youngest member of the crew. Rupp had gotten himself assigned to an easy work detail, carrying crates of buns to be served to the Japanese workers, after he'd purposely broken his own arm with a hammer and then faked falling off a ladder in order to get out of more strenuous work. Faking illness had become common, though the POWs in sickbay got less food than the men working. The strategy backfired on Rupp, however, when the guards caught him stealing buns. Gordy and the rest of the crew were finding it hard to be sympathetic to his plight. That night Gordy had to sit through yet another indoctrination lecture. Every commander and interpreter Gordy had heard had bragged about how Japan had never been defeated going all the way back to the 13th century when Kublai Khan first tried to invade Japan but was stopped by a giant typhoon that smashed Kublai's armada, a divine wind the Japanese called kamikaze, which gave proof that their gods had protected them and always would. Leaving for work the next morning, Gordy passed the guardhouse where Rupp remained on display, still moaning in pain. Meanwhile, Gordy's mother continued to write. May 6, 1943 Well, what are you doing most of the time to keep out of mischief? Or do you? Sunday is Mother's Day. There will be a lot of lonesome mothers this year. I think such days bring only more heartache to the mothers who aren't remembered. When Gordy looked at the other prisoners, it was hard not to feel despair. They were all weak and emaciated their ribs and hip bones protruding, their cheeks sunken and hollow. 
In the weeks since the crew had arrived at the castle, several of the prisoners from other countries had died. For Gordy, their deaths were hard to accept. He believed that with a little more food they might have lived. He also believed that it was possible to tell which of the prisoners was about to die. It was something intangible, a sense that they were no longer willing to fight for survival. It wasn't just the vacant look in their eyes and the blank expression on their faces. It was in their voices and in the slump of their shoulders. For the first time he'd seen the look of death in a couple of his crewmates. But Gordy refused to give in. Every night he told himself, I made it through another day. That's as good as I can hope for. It was hard to deal with the knowledge that the Japanese didn't care if the prisoners died. Repeated requests for more food were ignored. It didn't make sense to Gordy. If they fed the POWs more, they would be more productive. But the Japanese believed that Australia would be captured soon, and they'd have all the slave labor they needed. There was a rumor going around the camp that the Red Cross had sent parcels, enough so that all 1,200 prisoners being held in Fukuoka Camp No. 3 would get one. Gordy was skeptical. Like everyone else on the crew, he knew very little about the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Convention, signed on July 27, 1929, laid out guidelines for the treatment of prisoners of war as proposed by the International Committee of the Red Cross. It stated that POWs had a right to be treated with honor and respect and forbade the use of torture to extract information. Captives were required to provide only their true name and rank. Opposing countries, referred to as belligerents, were mutually bound to notify each other of the capture of prisoners within the shortest period of time possible, and the conditions in the POW camps were to be similar to those in the base camps used by country's own soldiers. Further, the POW camps could not be located near the war zone. Also, belligerents were to, so far as possible, avoid assembling in a single camp prisoners of different races or nationalities. By Gordy's count, there were at least a dozen nationalities at Fukuoka No. 3. Other mandates of the 1929 convention required food to be of a similar quality and quantity to that of a belligerent's own soldiers, and POWs could not be denied food as a punishment. Adequate clothing had to be provided, and the sanitary conditions had to be sufficient to prevent disease. Medical services had to be provided, and provisions had to be made for religious, intellectual, and recreational pursuits. The labor of prisoners of war was to be safe and not war-related. Prisoners were to be allowed to correspond with their family within a week of capture, and they were to be allowed to receive letters, parcels, books, food, and clothing. And if any escaped prisoners of war were retaken, they were to be liable only to disciplinary punishment. In the eight months since their capture, None of the treatment that Gordy and his shipmates had experienced conformed to the Geneva Convention of 1929. While he hoped the rumors of the Red Cross parcels were true, another week passed with still no sign of the packages. After two weeks, Gordy walked past the area where the guards in the pipe shop ate their lunches. Seated at a table, two guards were passing a white box between them. Gordy did a double take. On the outside of the box, clearly marked, was the Red Cross insignia. Food wrappers lay scattered across the table. A guard reached inside the box, pulled out a camel cigarette, and lit it, blowing the smoke in Gordy's direction. Back home, his mother wrote again. May 21st, 1943. How are you, and what have you been doing with yourself? I hope to hear from you soon. It is about time now again. 29. Chuck Vervalen, Fukuoka No. 3 It was late morning, December 15, 1943, and the snow was falling in Fukuoka. Lined up outside the castle, the crew of the Grenadier shivered, trying to figure out why they hadn't been marched off to work this morning. Chuck felt the cold penetrate to his bones. He'd seen his share of snow and cold as a boy growing up in upstate New York, but back then he could put on his long johns or huddle around the furnace with his brothers and sisters or be inside a warm schoolroom. Now he just had his thin prison uniform and wool coat, and in his deteriorating state it was hard to keep from shivering. What are they doing with us? 
he whispered to the man standing next to him. Nobody knew. Maybe the guards were going to blindfold them and take them to wherever it was that the twenty-nine other crewmen had been taken. Or maybe those guys had been executed. Getting shot was never far from a POW's mind. The cold air wasn't helping Chuck's toothache. His jaw was swollen and the pain shot all the way up to his ear. He'd heard horror stories about the camp hospital, men having legs amputated without anesthetic, or men being given injections and dying a few minutes later. In the three months since they'd arrived in Japan, many of the crew had been to the hospital, mostly for treatment of dysentery, but some as a way to get out of going to work. Not Chuck. He was one of the few who hadn't missed a day of work so far, although on many of those days he'd felt horrible. Part of it had to do with his natural stamina. He'd never missed work at any of his summer jobs or when he worked for the CCC at Watkins Glen. The other reason was that he didn't want to go anywhere near that hospital. He'd take his chances at work. Rubbing his jaw, trying to get relief from his toothache, he glanced down the hill that led up from the steel plant. A small unit of guards was marching toward them, bayonets fixed. The Japanese victories in the early stages of the war in the Pacific had created a problem for the Imperial Japanese Army. What to do with the unexpected large number of POWs? In early 1942, only one POW camp in Japan proper existed. Almost all of the 140,000 Allied troops captured in the first year of the war were held in the territories where they'd been taken prisoner. The Japanese Army Ministry in Tokyo established a POW Information Bureau to deal with the problem. Different solutions were discussed, including killing all the prisoners. But in April 1942, the government decided to begin transporting most of the Allied POWs to Japan to supplement the Japanese workforce, which was already running short on manpower. By February 1943, the Japanese had opened dozens of POW camps in Japan. To provide labor, most of the camps were located close to mines or industrial areas. Chuck surveyed his new surroundings. The guards had marched the crew, along with all of the hundreds of other prisoners being held at the castle, to a new prison site, but still called Fukuoka No. 3, ten miles to the east, located on the flat terrain just outside Tobata, about 300 yards from the bay and just west of the larger city of Kokura. The new camp had been specifically built to house POWs. The Japanese army wanted to relocate them away from the steel mill, which they worried might eventually come under aerial attack by American planes. It wasn't that they were concerned about the safety of the men. They wanted to protect their substantial labor force. Chuck noticed that 500 yards from the new camp was an enormous power plant, with six giant smokestacks each about a hundred feet high. He assumed that these smokestacks would become targets for American bombs, and with the camp so close, they wouldn't be any safer than they had been back at the castle. In fact, they might be less safe. Whereas the castle was concrete, the new camp structures were made mostly of wood. But he'd learned by now not to try to understand Japanese logic. A tall wooden fence topped with barbed concertina wire surrounded the camp. Inside the compound stood ten barracks of very light frame construction, each building with a capacity of 150 men. There were two rows of two-tier bunks running the length of the building, the lower bunk six inches off the ground, the top tier reached by ladder. Each bunk contained a thin mat, and at the head of each bay was a small shelf where the prisoners could place their meager belongings and the pack of ten Japanese cigarettes they received each week. The floor was concrete, the roof a type of Japanese tile, there was no source of heat except for a small, charcoal-burning stove set in the middle of the room. It was to be lit only from 5 to 8 p.m. Light came from a single overhead bulb. Small windows provided light during the day, with special blackout curtains for air raids. The Grenadier crew would be sharing their quarters mostly with Marines and civilians who had been captured by the Japanese on Wake Island in the fall of 1942. To the rear of the barracks, in a separate room, there was a cement urinal and four sinks with cold water. The latrines were in another small room. 
There were six wooden stalls, each enclosing a hole to squat over. The waste was gathered in a large tank underneath the room, which had to be cleaned by the prisoners. For bathing, there were two large cement tanks outside, each ten feet square and three feet deep. The galley was located in a wooden building containing large steam-operated pots for making rice and tea. The prisoners were in charge of cooking the meals under the supervision of a Japanese mess sergeant. Each barracks appointed men to bring food from the galley to the barracks in buckets. Compared with the castle, this new camp seemed like a resort on Seneca Lake to Chuck. On his lunch break at the pipe shop, Chuck could barely stand the throbbing pain of his toothache. The pressure from the infection swelled the side of his face. Still, the last thing he wanted to do was ask a guard if he could have medical attention. He was more concerned about his crewmate and friend Charles Doyle, who'd been sent to work despite having pneumonia. Since arriving at work in the morning, Doyle had just sat hunched in a corner. His eyes were sunken, his breathing labored, and his legs covered with infected boils. He stared off into space with the look all too familiar in the camp. Chuck eased his way next to Doyle in the corner and gave him a nudge. Doyle didn't respond. A death watch had become part of the camp routine. The question, how many died today, was asked every evening when the men returned to camp from work. Usually the answer was three or four, the numbers increasing with the onset of winter and the increase in cases of pneumonia. The guards and Japanese doctors were usually not sympathetic to the pneumonia cases, sending them to work anyway, although today the guards were not bothering Doyle. Doyle, who was from Weymouth, Massachusetts, was one of Chuck's best buddies on the crew. Chuck often teased him about his thick New England accent. In the evenings, they liked to talk, sometimes about baseball. Doyle was a big Red Sox fan and argued that the Sox's young phenom, Ted Williams, was a better hitter than the Yankees' Joe DiMaggio. They talked about going to a game together if they survived. Doyle slumped over. Chuck urged him to get up, but Doyle didn't respond. Chuck squeezed the arms of the dentist's chair. He'd finally caved in and asked a guard if he could see a dentist, and they'd taken him to a clinic in nearby Tabata. The tooth was abscessed and infected, and the dentist had just informed him that he was going to have to pull it without Novocaine or any painkiller. The guard had also let him know that as soon as the tooth was pulled, he had to go straight back to work. That was okay with Chuck. The routine of working in the pipe shop helped him keep his sanity. Since being transferred to the new camp, Chuck and the prisoners had continued working at the steel mill, their routine the same every day. Get up at 5.30 a.m., form lines and count off and eat a bowl of millet. Walk several hundred yards to a railroad switching station and climb onto an open flatbed car, then ride 30 minutes to the steel mill for their jobs as stevedores, mechanics, machinists, and pipe fitters. Chuck worked in the pipe shop alongside Gordy and Tim. Prisoners too sick to work either stayed in camp and were assigned jobs in the barracks or were in the hospital. Workers at the steel plant usually received larger rations than those who stayed back, and that was one of the reasons that there wasn't much protest over sick men such as Doyle being sent to work, not that protesting would have done any good. At the lunch break, which was usually thirty minutes, sometimes shorter, Prisoners received another bowl of millet. Dinner was usually another small bowl of millet, or daikon, a Japanese radish, soup. Originally the prisoners at Fukuoka No. 3 received approximately two cups of food per day, but it had recently been reduced to one cup. There was some debate among the prisoners why their rations had been cut. One camp argued that it was to have them suffer a slow death by starvation. Another argument was that all of Japan was suffering from a food shortage, and it wasn't just the prisoners who were getting less to eat. A third theory involved an incident that had happened a couple of months earlier. Several of the American Marines had boasted to the guards that they could beat them in a foot race. The guards accepted the challenge, and each side picked their three fastest men. The three Marines finished one, two, three. After the race, the guards concluded that the prisoners were too strong, so their rations were cut by a third. From his point of view, 
Chuck believed that the cut in rations was to starve them to death, yet keep them alive long enough that they could be productive laborers. Using what looked to Chuck like an ordinary pair of pliers, the dentist climbed into position and yanked out the infected tooth. Chuck let out a fierce scream, doing everything possible to fight back the tears. Twenty minutes later, his mouth filled with gauze, he was back on the job in the pipe shop. Exhausted and cold, Chuck sat on the edge of his lower bunk in the barracks, waiting for another day to end. He was also waiting for the nightly poker game to end, and his bunkmate, Johnny Johnson, the son of a coal miner from Cartonsville, Illinois, to come join him. To help protect themselves from the freezing cold, the two men had taken to sleeping in the same bunk together, using each other's body heat and an extra blanket for warmth. Raised in a world where words such as queer and faggot were an accepted insult, neither man had given a second thought to spooning through the night. Here, survival trumped social stigma. Besides, others in the crew were doing the same thing. The infection had finally subsided from Chuck's pulled tooth. He had not received any instructions from the dentist on post-removal care, and he had kept the gauze in his mouth for three days. He took it out only after Johnny had complained about how much it stank. Chuck was especially tired on this evening. He couldn't explain why some nights after work he still had energy, while on others it was all he could do to climb into bed. Usually, when he felt better, he passed the evening playing poker after dinner. Gambling and poker had become his favorite recreation since joining the Navy. Back in Australia he'd been to the horse races several times, and on the sub he'd been a regular in the five-card draw and seven-card stud poker games. On one patrol on the gudgeon he'd won a couple of hundred dollars which he sent home to his mother. In prison camp, he and the other gamblers had fashioned a deck of cards out of the discarded Japanese cigarette packs and used twigs gathered from the prison compound for chips. The men played for cigarettes or sen, or in some cases, food. Winners often bartered, maybe trading three cigarettes for half a bowl of millet. Or when somebody had been brazen enough to steal commodities such as beans or peanut oil from the galley, those items would be introduced into the economy. Chuck's advantage was that he had quit smoking since being captured, and the cigarettes he received every week were valuable barter. Stealing had become a way of life at Fukuoka No. 3, prisoners risking severe consequences to steal a handful of rice, a pack of cigarettes, or anything they thought might improve their situation, even if it was a stick found along the road leading to the camp. Most of the prisoners sent to the guardhouse who were severely beaten and put on display were there for stealing, or for being suspected of stealing. This thievery included stealing from fellow prisoners, an offense that ran the risk of incurring even harsher vigilante justice from the other prisoners than the guards might inflict. The marines were sometimes the target of the thieves because they seemed to have more valuable items. After they'd been captured on Wake Island, they were allowed to bring clothes and other personal belongings to prison camp with them. Also, they had been assigned to work in truck and auto repair and had access to better stuff there. On this night, Chuck was too exhausted for poker, content to let his mind drift to thoughts of Gwen and Leighton Beach. By his calculations, the patrol should have returned to Fremantle seven months ago. He assumed that by now she knew that something had happened. But did she know that the crew had been captured, or that they were now in a prison camp in Japan? Chuck thought back to when he was in school, regretting that he was such a troublemaker and that he hadn't tried harder in his studies. He wished he'd had the discipline and maturity he had in submarine school back in high school. Now, sitting on the edge of his bunk in Fukuoka No. 3, he wondered why he'd been so hard on his teachers. They didn't deserve all his pranks and backtalk. If this POW nightmare ever ended, he promised himself, he would go back to the old school and apologize to the teachers. Although he had been raised a Catholic, religion was not a big part of Chuck's life. More than once, when he'd heard other prisoners praying to God to watch over them, he questioned how a benevolent God with all powers of good and kindness would allow such a barbaric situation to happen in the first place. 
There were occasional services on Sunday evenings conducted in another barracks by a priest who'd been captured in the Philippines, but the only time Chuck went was on Christmas. To him, the St. Christopher's medal Gwen had given him had become his vessel of faith and hope. Still waiting for Johnny Johnson, Chuck heard a commotion near the front opening of the barracks. He looked up and saw three Marines push a battered and bloodied Thomas Trigg into the barracks. Trigg looked like he'd just gone ten rounds with Joe Lewis. Let that be a lesson to you, nigger, barked one of the Marines. Don't even think about stealing from us again. Trigg stumbled across the concrete floor, collapsing into his bunk. None of the grenadier crew moved to help him. Although Chuck, like the rest of the men, disliked Trigg, there was a part of him that felt sorry for him. He was the only black man on the crew, and surely he had to feel alone and discriminated against. But when Chuck tried to put himself in Trigg's shoes, he wondered why Trigg would ever have signed up for submarine service. But of course neither Chuck nor anyone else on the crew had ever sat down to talk to him about how he felt about the situation. Finally Johnny returned to the bunk, and he and Chuck lay down close together, holding on to each other, struggling to get warm. Chuck shot straight up in bed, awakened by a screaming guard pointing a bayonet at his face. Everybody in the barracks was ordered to get up and stand at attention at the foot of his bed, encouraged by a dozen guards prodding them with bayonets. Like most of the other prisoners, Chuck had worn his prison uniform to bed to keep warm. Being awakened in the middle of the night was nothing new to the crew, but this was the first time it had happened since they had been transferred to the new camp. It was late February 1944, and snow was still on the ground. In the previous three weeks, the crew had begun to face the reality that they might not all survive. On February 4th, the first of the Grenadier crew passed away. Justiniano Geico, a Filipino of Chinese ancestry who'd been raised by an aunt in Los Angeles, had been a mess cook and the only other minority on the ship besides Trigg. A good-natured guy, he'd been treated especially badly by the guards, many of whom either had fought against the Chinese or hated anyone they suspected of being Chinese. Two weeks later, Charles Linder, a quiet married man from Upper Michigan, died. Pneumonia was most likely the cause of death for both men, but Chuck believed they had just given up, losing the will or the strength to struggle. Their deaths had just strengthened his resolve to stay alive. Charles Doyle, despite his dire condition, was still alive, but just barely. The guards ordered everyone to strip naked. As most of the guards began furiously pillaging through everything in the barracks, obviously searching for something, the other guards marched the prisoners outside into the snow and ordered them to stand at attention. Chuck guessed the temperature was below freezing. While the search inside continued, the men struggled to keep at attention. Chuck shivered and shriveled, the biting cold numbing every part of him. He heard the guards rampaging through their stuff, turning over bunks and ripping apart clothes. It was anybody's guess what they were looking for. Maybe stolen food that someone had stashed somewhere in the barracks. An hour passed, and then another. Now a freezing rain was falling. Chuck wondered if the men who were the sickest, especially Doyle, would survive this ordeal. Of all the humiliation and degradation he'd suffered since his capture, this pissed him off more than anything else. When the prisoners were finally allowed back into the barracks, it was a complete shambles, but evidently the guards hadn't found what they were looking for. Chuck was furious, but not surprised by this action. He knew that the Japanese had no respect for anyone who surrendered rather than fought to the death. That was Bushido, the national code by which all Japanese warriors lived and fought. But to him this incident felt more personal, more invasive. The guards had violated his personal property and home, even if that home was a POW barracks. It wasn't just the guards who had him pissed. He was angry that the prisoner responsible for the stolen goods, whether it was a crewmate or one of the men from Wake Island, didn't have the balls to step forward, admit his guilt, and take his punishment so that everyone else didn't have to suffer. But that kind of cowardice didn't surprise him anymore. 
ten months as a POW had taught him that captivity and the constant threat of death had a way of making many men think more about their own self-preservation and survival than what was best for everyone. Of course, there was also the possibility that nothing had really been stolen, and the search was just another form of psychological torture. Later that day, Johnny Johnson told Chuck that Charles Doyle was dead. Chuck struggled to stay composed. First Geico, then Linder, and now his buddy Doyle, the Red Sox fan. He and Doyle would never have a chance to go to a game together. He volunteered to help dispose of the body. He lifted his friend onto a pushcart and, accompanied by a guard, wheeled Doyle out of the camp toward the town of Tobata, two miles away. The journey was slow, the road slippery and full of holes. Chuck had never been philosophical or spiritual, but pushing Doyle's body along the bumpy road gave him pause. Being a submariner had allowed him to maintain a distance from the violence. You fire a torpedo or a deck gun, and you don't see the eyes of the enemy. You don't have your buddy blown to bits next to you in a foxhole or while landing on a beach. And even though other prisoners had been dying every day since they'd arrived in Japan, he didn't know those men. This was different. Pushing the cart, he glanced down at his dead friend. Doyle did not look comfortable, even in death. His once sturdy body wasted away to skin and bones, his hollow eyes still wide open, his stare the same in death as it had been at the end of his life. In Tobata, a large outdoor furnace awaited. The disposal of all the dead POWs was the same. Chuck wheeled the cart to its opening, then pulled Doyle's stiff body off it, and with a mighty heave, threw him into the fire. Stepping back, he pulled Gwen's medal from his pocket and clutched it tight, tears flowing. Later, a small wooden box with Doyle's ashes would be returned to the barracks wrapped in a purple handkerchief to be placed on a shelf with a row of other small purple-wrapped boxes. 30. Bob Palmer, Ofuna. Bob took a deep breath, inhaling the fresh air. It was October 19, 1943, seven days after he and the other 28 men, including the officers, had been blindfolded and separated from the rest of the crew. They'd been taken on a two-day train ride that ended at Ofuna, a railroad junction town on the eastern side of central Honshu, 15 miles southwest of Yokohama and three and a half miles inland from Tokyo Bay. This was only the third time they'd been let out of solitary confinement. Bob eased next to a crewmate and whispered a greeting. A guard standing nearby rifle-butted him in the back, knocking the wind out of him and sending him to his knees. The prison camp at Ofuna was created as a transit camp, with a Kempeitai, the Japanese counterpart of the German Gestapo, interrogated prisoners, usually with the use of torture. Located on the site of a former school about a mile south through a tunnel from the railway station, the camp was on the opposite side of the road from a large temple and surrounded by hills. It had opened on April 7, 1942. Unlike all the other prison camps in Japan, which were controlled by the Japanese Army and POW Information Bureau, the Ofuna camp was under the control of the Japanese Navy. All the prisoners were captured Allied seamen or pilots, including many officers. Japanese officials had chosen the 29 Grenadier crew members to come to Ofuna based on their rank or job on the ship as determined during the earlier interrogations. They believed each had special information and needed more thorough and forceful interrogation. As the ship's yeoman and record keeper, Bob had made the list. The prison compound contained barracks of unpainted wood with a tar paper roof and wood planked floors built around a large open area surrounded by an eight-foot wooden fence with barbed wire on top. The prison barracks were connected, and each one was divided into small cells six feet wide and nine feet long. There were ninety cells, each one housing one prisoner. Each cell had a thin bamboo mat for sleeping and a blanket that had to be kept folded during the day. There were no mattresses or pillows. The walls were thin, and the floorboards were so widely spaced that the ground below could be seen. Spiders and flies were regular visitors. The door into the cell had a peephole, 
and a small window facing out to the parade ground was at the top of one wall. The window in Bob's cell was too high to see anything out of other than sky. Bob was struck by the utter stillness of the camp. He'd been a chatty sort of guy growing up in Oregon, and the hardest part of Oafuna so far was being locked in solitary confinement. He and the other prisoners were supposed to be let out once a day in the morning for a brief period of forced exercise, usually about half an hour of running around the inside perimeter of the compound. Sometimes they weren't let out at all. During this exercise time, guards closely monitored the prisoners, and anyone caught talking or passing a note was beaten. Whether it was being in solitary confinement 23 hours a day or the enforced silence, Bob felt more threatened by the guards. They'd all been given nicknames, Swivel Neck, the Termite, Smiling Jack, the Butcher, Liver Lips, and Big Stoop, names whispered during the exercise period. As he and the other prisoners started running around the perimeter of the camp, he glanced to his left and spotted a familiar face. He could barely contain himself. It was Captain Fitzgerald. The last time he'd seen him was at the convent on Light Street when Fitzgerald was being dragged away unconscious after being waterboarded. Bob turned his back to the door of his cell, shielding his hands from view in case a guard was watching him through the peephole. It was Captain Fitzgerald's birthday, and Bob was preparing a present for him, a ball of rice that he was crafting out of portions he'd set aside from his own servings over the last few days. If he was caught, surely he'd get another beating. Still black and blue from the last beating, administered for talking during an exercise period, Bob gently squeezed the rice ball, molding it into shape. To Bob's surprise, the gummy rice was holding together well. He knew his biggest problem would be smuggling it out of his cell, past the guards, and sneaking it to Captain Fitzgerald during exercise, but it was worth the risk. Bob would do anything for his captain. Bob Palmer's hero wasn't Joe DiMaggio or FDR or his father. It was Captain James Fitzgerald. He admired everything about the man, the fact that he'd been a boxing champ at the Naval Academy, the aggressive way he pursued the enemy, the considerate way he'd peek his head into the yeoman's office and ask Bob how he was doing, the remarkable courage he'd demonstrated under torture. For Bob, who had been convinced that the Japanese had killed Fitzgerald, arriving at Ofuna and discovering that his revered captain was still alive lifted his spirits like nothing had since being captured. By the rules of the Geneva Convention of 1929, officers were not supposed to be beaten or made to perform labor. But, of course, the Japanese had not agreed to these rules and had been even harsher in their treatment of Fitzgerald. In Penang, he and Lieutenant Whiting and Lieutenant Hardy were the only men who'd received the water torture, and Fitzgerald had been subjected to far worse. After one episode of his water torture, he'd been beaten so badly that he couldn't even move when he woke up. On the morning he was taken out of camp, he was told to take a bath, but his right arm was paralyzed and his body was so sore that Whiting had to bathe him. Bob slowly paced his small cell, contemplating the best way to smuggle out the rice ball. Maybe he could hide it in his armpit. If he hid it in his crotch, it might make him limp, though that wouldn't necessarily raise suspicion. Bob's physical condition had deteriorated since his arrival at Ofuna. He hadn't had a bowel movement in over two months. There were boils on his legs, and he weighed less than 120 pounds. He had bruises all over his body. On his first night in camp, four guards entered his cell and beat and stomped him over and over while he curled into the fetal position, covering his head with his arms, just hoping to survive. The routine at Ofuna, Bob quickly learned, was tightly regimented. Each morning at five minutes before Reveille, a guard marched down the corridors yelling at the prisoners to get up. After folding their blankets and placing them in a corner of their cells, they were marched outside and forced to run around the compound, usually for a distance of three or four miles or until a prisoner fell. Guards armed with baseball bat-sized clubs were positioned at four different places round the perimeter. Anyone lagging behind was beaten across the back and legs. Almost all of the prisoners were either malnourished or suffering from beriberi, so few made the run without being beaten or collapsing, 
including Bob. Twice in his first month he was caught trying to whisper to other prisoners, and the guards made everyone stand at attention for ten straight hours. But their favorite trick to punish Bob was something he called the Ofuna Crouch, bent at the knees, back straight, arms overhead, and up on the balls of his feet. As soon as he wavered or fell, which he always did, a guard beat him with a club and forced him to resume the position. Each day, after exercise period was over, he and the other prisoners were marched back to their rooms and fed one teacup of rice and a cup of thin soup, precisely measured. Fitzgerald had been taken to the interrogation center and questioned almost daily by officers he'd named the QKs, or Quiz Kids. One focus of their questioning was where the Grenadier and other American submarines were based. Someone on the crew, and nobody knew for sure who it was, had coughed up the real name of the sub. Fitzgerald was determined to provide them with no useful information, no matter the consequences. From their questions, he determined that they believed American subs were stationed in Sydney on the east coast of Australia, so he played along, telling them the Grenadier had arrived there directly from Pearl Harbor by traveling east of the Marshalls and past the Fiji Islands. They also wanted to know how many American subs had been sunk or damaged. Again, he lied, telling them fifty subs had failed to return and over forty were seriously damaged. On questions about the design and specifics of the Grenadier, he provided them only with information that was readily available in Jane's Fighting Ships, a book he knew they had in their possession. When they intercepted a radio broadcast from Australia that mentioned American subs refueling at Exmouth on the northwestern Australian coast, he maintained he knew nothing about that, even though the Grenadier had taken on fuel there on its fateful last patrol. To make sure that Lieutenant Hardy and the other crew members told the same story, he left short cryptic messages in the Benjo after each interrogation or whispered to them as they exercised. Bob had been questioned several times, and he had repeated the same story. Still holding the rice ball, Bob paced the four steps across his cell and then back the other way. By his calculations, he still had a couple of minutes before the guard opened his door. Pacing his cell was what he did every day, pacing and thinking. Usually his thoughts went to Barbara. He relived their wedding night, the late-night ceremony at the church on Dolores Street in San Francisco, dinner at Vanessi's, making love in the apartment on Pine Street. He pictured what it would be like if he survived all this. She would greet him as he got off the ship and walked down the gangplank. She would be wearing the new charcoal-colored dress and pillbox hat she'd bought for their wedding. She'd be so beautiful, so happy to see him. It would be the happiest day of his life. He'd been unfaithful on leave in Australia, but in his mind that had nothing to do with how much he loved Barbara. Getting home to her was what mattered. Maybe he'd stay in the Navy. Before he left, he'd talked to Barbara about maybe trying to become an officer. That had impressed her or maybe they'd move back to Oregon. In his head, he designed the house they'd live in on the Rogue River. He would be able to fish right from the porch. Barbara would cook the trout and serve it with sweet potatoes and huckleberry ice cream. And then they'd make love. And there would be kids, maybe three, maybe four. In his darkest hours, he worried that Barbara had given him up for dead and had already met someone else. Hearing the guard's footsteps approach his cell, he stuffed the rice ball under his arm and waited. The door opened. It was Big Stoop. Walking toward the door, Bob felt the rice ball start to slip and pressed his elbow closer to his side, pinning it more firmly in place. He wasn't worried about being beaten. He didn't want the rice ball to be taken away before he could give it to Captain Fitzgerald. Moving briskly down the long corridor, he made it outside and stashed the rice ball under a bench, then turned to look for Fitzgerald. There was no sign of him. Speedo! Speedo! Big Stoop gave the command to start running. Forty-five minutes later, exhausted and sore from being clubbed several times, Bob finally wobbled to a stop. There was still no sign of Fitzgerald. Shoved along by Big Stoop, he headed back toward his cell, the rice ball still hidden under the bench. Sitting at the bar in the Sir Francis Drake Hotel, 
Barbara Palmer eyed her watch. It was January 1944, nine months after Bob had been captured. She'd come to the hotel with friends, a married couple who had arranged to have a male friend come and join them for a drink. The guy was already ten minutes late. In May 1943, a month after the ship had gone down, she had been at home early one evening when there was a knock at the door. It was Western Union with a telegram from the Department of the Navy, informing her that the Grenadier had been lost on patrol and the whereabouts of the crew were unknown. She cried herself to sleep that night. For a week she stayed home from her filing job with Southern Pacific on Montgomery Street, alternately crying and checking with the Red Cross and the Navy to see if there was any news on the crew. She heard nothing. She took a bus home to Medford to spend a few days with her parents and Martin and Cora, Bob's father and stepmother. Her father was surprisingly supportive. He and Bob had gotten along better on Bob's last trip home, Bob winning points by talking with her father about the workings of the submarine. Barbara's mom, although sympathetic, was quick to remind her what she'd said about the hardships Barbara would encounter raising a baby if anything happened to Bob. For his part, Bob's father refused to accept the possibility that his son was dead, diverting the conversation to talk about what a lousy job FDR was doing and how his policies were responsible for Bob's being missing. Barbara was not political, but she wondered why Martin disliked FDR so much, considering that it was a WPA project building the roads and lodge at Crater Lake that had employed him during the Depression. But questioning her elders wasn't part of her personality. Still seated at the bar, Barbara checked her watch again. Her date was now twenty minutes late. Coming to the Sir Francis Drake had become one of her favorite things to do in the last couple of months. She loved the hotel's elegance and high style, with its classic crystal chandeliers, gilded ceilings, curved marble staircase, and a lounge that overlooked Union Square and the Powell Street cable cars. Plus, it was a favorite spot of naval officers, and she took every opportunity to ask them if they'd heard anything about the Grenadier. None had, of course, but they usually bought her a drink. She appreciated their company. Since returning from visiting her parents in Oregon, Barbara had done her best to keep busy. With friends, she went to several USO events. It made her feel better to dance with the servicemen and feel like she was helping the war effort. She went to Grace Cathedral, where volunteers gathered to help sort supplies to be sent to servicemen. And not a week went by that she didn't check with the Red Cross and Navy for any possible news about the Grenadier. In November 1943, on a trip to the Red Cross, seven months after the sinking, she saw a new listing. USS Grenadier, SS-210, Prisoners of War. The following men reported missing on the USS Grenadier are carried as prisoners of war on the records of the Casualties and Allotments Section, Bureau of Naval Personnel, Navy Department, Washington, D.C. The names were listed in alphabetical order, from Ralph Adkins to Peter Zuko. Her eyes went straight to the P's, Piaka, Pierce, Poss, Price, but no Palmer. She read it again, over and over, and could not find Bob's name. She counted the names, 41. She didn't know the exact number of men on the ship, but thought it to be around 60. She looked for Captain Fitzgerald's name. It was not there either. Did some of the men survive and not others? Had Bob drowned? Was he shot trying to escape? She went to the Navy offices on Treasure Island, and she called back to the Red Cross almost daily, and always got the same answer. I'm sorry we have no further information at this time. She cried every night, every morning. In early December 1943, a small package arrived at her apartment on Pine Street with an Australian postmark. She hesitated to open it. She didn't think she could take any more bad news. Finally she unwrapped it, and her knees nearly buckled. It contained Bob's Navy dog tags and wallet, and a short note from a woman named Leslie Phillips, informing her that Bob had left these at her house before his last patrol, and she figured Barbara would want them back. There was no explanation of why Bob had been at her house. Barbara assumed the worst. 
The more she thought about it, the angrier and more hurt she got. Instead of continuing to cry herself to sleep every night, she resolved to start going out again. I guess if he could go out, so can I, she told her cousin Margie. A naval officer in his dress whites sat down next to her at the Sir Francis Drake bar. He signaled the bartender for a cocktail. She noticed he wore the dolphin insignia, the symbol of the submarine service. As she usually did when she met Navy men, she told him that her husband had been on the Grenadier and was reported lost at sea. The officer expressed his regrets, then introduced himself. His name was Robert Kunhart, and his submarine, the Sawfish, had just returned to San Francisco for a major overhaul after suffering damage from depth charges on its last patrol. He would be in town for three weeks. The bartender brought his drink. He was, by Barbara's initial estimate, well-mannered and nice-looking, five feet seven inches with broad shoulders and blue eyes. Three hours and several drinks later, they said goodbye, making a date for the next night. Her original date never showed. Returning to her apartment, Barbara shared her excitement with her roommate. He's a graduate of Annapolis and an officer, she enthused. I can't wait to see him again. Through the thin walls of his cell, Bob heard a guard's footsteps coming down the corridor. He quickly finished urinating and moved the floor plank back into position. Normally prisoners were supposed to summon a guard when they had to go to the toilet, but sometimes the guards didn't respond, and prisoners had learned to remove one of their floor planks and relieve themselves on the ground below, a practice that ran the risk of a beating if detected. Bob spotted a fly and quickly took off his T-shirt and swatted it out of the air. He picked it up and put it into a pencil box he'd been given to store his dead flies. Flies were everywhere in 